Uh, actually, one of the questions I asked him was, I was a little curious with video on Facebook and YouTube. Is it, is it a Pepsi and Coke thing? Um, he mentioned to me, you know, no, Chris, it's really more apples and oranges. Uh, and I, I was quite intrigued on the insightful perspective that Jonathan and the team is taking not only on video, but also uh, how he's looking at mobile for marketers and for consumers. So I thought it was very appropriate to have him set up, step up here today and take us through that journey. So with that, to set the pace for 2015 A-List Summit, please welcome Jonathan Murtaugh, U.S. Head of Industry of Film and Television, Facebook and uh, Instagram to take the stage. Jonathan. First of all, I'll do a sound check. This wow. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I have no shame. So first, is the sound working? Can everyone hear me on the mic okay? Yes? Great. Okay. I'm a little bit of a wanderer, so this long stage might actually work for me because I saw everyone kind of standing over here. Uh, and I didn't know that video was going to be on at the beginning. I'm like so about those, <laughs> those videos. I pictured myself kind of doing the rotation with the the faces on there, so that was really awesome. Um, thank you for having me, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you spending time with me this morning and special thanks to Chris and to Jay for having me and uh, giving me the privilege of kicking this off. I looked at the um, speaker list and the topics for today and it, it's really an amazing day of content and, and learning, so I feel very honored to be here, so thanks to both of you. I think I see both of you through the lights. So um, I'm gonna see if my clicker works from a distance. My Presentation is not on screen. Whoops, there we are, good, good, okay. So my personal journey at Facebook started about five years ago. I started in November of 2010, which makes me kind of a relic within the company. And um, I was actually a late adopter of Facebook. I wasn't one of those people that could say I had it when I was in college. I started in probably 2008, maybe two years before I started Facebook, and it was because I went to a high school reunion and I was one of those people that was the only way you could connect with people after you left. Does anyone, anyone else have that experience? You have to be like over a certain age to know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> I saw a few people raising their hand, but that was me. Um, and before that, for myself personally, I like to refer to that as my personal uh, dark age. It was a shameful period and that was the time when I had a screen name. And I was SoCalGuy22. That was, that was me, I'm not proud. Um, looking back on it, it seems really kind of creepy, like I was in a perpetual state of online dating, but that's what it was. Um, but you all remember that time, right, before we were using our real names online? <coughs> and this seems especially appropriate to talk about with the Ashley Madison stuff that's breaking the news today. Um, but you remember what it was like? You thought if you put your real name online that someone was going to clear out your bank account or people were going to show up at your front door. It just seemed really scary to put your real name online. And uh, fortunately, Mark had this idea that if everyone just used their authentic identity online, it would make online experiences and other experiences better. So if you look me up today on Facebook, this is what you'll find. This is my real identity, Jonathan Murtaugh. That's my photo. And this is actually really current because what you're seeing there is a photo of me getting married one month ago. I was, uh, uh, thank you very much. Today's, <laughs> we made it four weeks, so I'm really excited. Um, but what you're seeing here, this photo, that's my back uh, with my arms out and you see my wife on the right and we had this very special moment uh, that someone captured when they were coming by and it was the day when it dumped raining, remember that? Like part of the tent washed out. But someone snapped this moment where uh, my wife and I gathered our four kids around, we're a blended family and we just took a moment to thank them and tell them how much we love them. And they posted it on Facebook and they tagged me and of course I took that photo and I made it my own. And I'm getting a little misty out as I say it. But the reason I share that really personal story is that it really is the DNA of Facebook. Our mission is to help people connect and share and give people that, the power to do that. It's in the DNA of our company to be focused on people. And if you were to walk around our campus five years ago when I started and we were having hackathons, you would see scenes like this. In the movie, it looked a lot better than it did in real life. In the background there, you'll see some of the David Cho famous $200 million graffiti that was all around the walls. But this is what you would see in our hackathons or when very small groups of engineers come together to work on something for two or three days that they don't normally work on. And back then, there were a couple of young guys. I, think, I literally think one of them was 19 and one was 21. They had this idea about photos. And the idea was from an inside. If, you, if, if anyone here had an account way, way, way back, you might remember 
when the only thing you could do with a photo on Facebook was your profile photo. Because early on, we thought Facebook was just going to kind of be a directory of people. And you would have your photo so people would know that it was you and you would kind of manage this listing for yourself. But they noticed every Monday when they came to work that everyone was changing their profile photos to something that they had done that weekend. A lot of it was keg stands and parties and things like that. But they're like, oh, hang on a second. So people are actually using photos to share moments. It's more of a live thing than it was what we thought it was going to be. So focusing on people, and I have to pause here and say, when they were doing this, when they were thinking about this problem, this was at a time when there were probably six or seven really good photo services online. There was Snapfish, Yahoo had something, Kodak, HP, I can't remember all of them. And they all had great services. You could do the red eye reduction and the color correction. They had tons of storage and a lot of it was free. So we had these two young guys that were going to take on photos in that environment. But focusing on people, they came up with an idea. And it was strip all the technology away, remove all the capabilities, and add one thing, which is the ability to tag a friend in a photo. And the idea was, the insight was, that the most important thing, what makes a photo special, is the connection that it gives you to a memory, to a person that's important to you. And within six months, after launching that feature, there were more photos being uploaded to Facebook than all the other services combined. And we didn't have, now, you know, we've, since with Instagram and other things that you can do on Facebook, we've obviously added a lot of cool features back in. But back then, that was it. All you could do was tag a photo. You couldn't even crop it. You couldn't change the size. Nothing. Underneath this is a belief that we have that the most important thing to focus on is on people and not technology, and that it's really good business to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We think it's good business for two reasons. The first one is that people don't change very quickly. They're wired to certain things over time. And we think we're going to add value in something meaningful to people's lives if we focus on them. The second one is it's a more sustainable business model because they're not changing. Things that were invented a year ago or things, technology that, was, that came online a year ago is going to be obsolete in a couple of months. But the way people are wired is not going to change. So this is a really fun quote. I'm going to read it off my monitor here. This is a quote from someone who is being a curmudgeon about a new technology. This will produce forgetfulness. So he's, this person is referring to this technology. This will produce forgetfulness of those who learn to use it because they will not practice their memory. So I could think of a lot of things this could apply to in the last 20 or 30 years. It could be the new, now I have teenagers, and I, I think they're always cheating when they use those scientific calculators. And it has like cosine and, and tan, everything is on there. So it could be someone referring to those. It could be someone referring to having iPads in a classroom or, or different learning devices. This is actually Plato talking about the alphabet. The reason is that Plato was in an oral transmission society. Everything that they did was by memory. They memorized all their great works and they transmitted them orally. So he thought the introduction of the alphabet was going to actually hurt people in their intellect because they wouldn't have to memorize things anymore. They'd be able to write them down. So being able to write something down was actually seen as a negative. If you look at the timeline of human communication uh, over the grand scheme of things, things like the alphabet and the printing press, those are actually relatively recent. Television, telephone, radio, and internet were basically invented yesterday. And what's really interesting, because people move so slowly, is that whenever a new media form is introduced, there tends to be a lag time. They tend to use the new thing like they were using the last thing, because they don't really understand what's possible with the new thing yet. So if you look again at this timeline, spoken documents, so when, when the alphabet was introduced, if you look back at really early legal documents, they're really funny because there was no formal language yet around the writing. So they would, you, you read these things, it says, hey there, it's John, I'm going to sue you now, get ready. And it was just, it was like they were speaking, but they, they, didn't, they hadn't figured out well, that you could do different things with written language to formalize what you were writing. When the printing press was invited, in, uh, invented, the first thing they did was print giant tomes that were really meant for clergy, uh, for monks. They didn't figure out until a little bit later that the printing press, the real magic of it was that you could distribute literature to the masses. Television, early versions, was just filmed plays. Um, websites were uh, the early websites, and everyone remembers, or maybe not everyone remembers, I'm dating myself, were basically putting brochures online. My favorite Thai restaurant still kind of does that, does that, but <laughs> that's okay with me. I just need the menu. 
But all of these things, what, the reason I'm talking about them is that it, the focus on people and not on technology fuels the way that we think about mobile video. And it's really at the base of the three things I'm going to share with you today, insights to share with you. The first one is that we believe that the future of mobile video is immersive. And when I say immersive, I'm not just talking about virtual reality. I'm talking about technology that disappears, where the edges leave and you don't really realize that you're experiencing technology. It's the most human experience possible. There's a really great documentary out now on the history of film by Mark Cousins. I think it's actually on Netflix. Has anyone seen this? No, okay. So I highly recommend everyone watches it. It goes all the way back to the origins of film in France, to Thomas Edison in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Fast forward to today to uh, Mad Max in 3D. And this here is a little snippet of a French film that I'm gonna play for you, one of the original films. And film as a technology really had three phases. In the first phase, nobody thought it was gonna work. It made people motion sick. They weren't used to watching moving pictures on a screen. Some people thought it was sucking their souls out of their bodies. This is true. They didn't think this technology was going to last. The second phase was kind of the teenage years, like, okay, this thing is working, but how do we do sets and we can go on location and we have to have catering and really important things like that. And that's really where we're at, I would say, Facebook is at and all of us are at with, with online video today and with mobile video. But the third phase is where all of this gets figured out and the edges, like I said, go away and you don't realize that you're experiencing technology, you're just there, it's what you're used to. Just like in this next presidential election, you're not gonna be able to imagine voting for a candidate that you didn't hear speak live because all of our lives, that's what we've been used to. So you may have heard the story that uh, we had engineers that were inspired by the moving pictures in Harry Potter. I'm kind of curious, I, would, I take a lot of polls when I talk. How many people have heard this or read this? Okay, a good number of you. So there are stories out there that we had engineers that were inspired by the moving pictures in the Harry Potter newspapers in creating our autoplay video. And I can tell you it's actually true. It's absolutely true. They looked at this and they said, man, this is a thing. We have to create this. We have to do this. But for autoplay video, it was a technological problem. We had to figure out how to load video in the background of newsfeed while you were doing other things. So it was really a bandwidth problem. But we figured it out. We have autoplay video. And autoplay video basically took away two friction points in the software for the human experience. The first one is you didn't have to wait anymore for something to load before you could hit play and watch it. The second is that once it was loaded and you hit play, you didn't have to hunt around on the screen for a little X to get through an ad so you could actually watch your content. So it comes onto your screen, the frames start to roll, and you're watching. It's a much, much more pleasant experience, and it's really changed the way that people are willing to engage with video on our platform. So in the short 10 or 11 year history of Facebook, we've had a few phases. The first one was when it was all text. Then of course, we went through photos. Video was kind of the zone that we're in now. We're still trying to figure a lot of things out. But the next phase is really special. And that's that immersive stuff that I was talking about. Here we go. This is something we call, we're calling spherical video. But this is really about being able to go to a Cirque du Soleil um, experience or a sporting event, or maybe it's a class in a country far away, because sitting in that space is a little pole with a bunch of cameras on top, and you're able to experience it like you were there in a very immersive way, where the walls and the edges go away. But the coolest thing will be when it's really just your friend who's traveling, and you're able to have this in the palm of your hand. It's going to be a personal experience, and it's going to be something mobile that you take away with you. I can already imagine great advertisers and their agencies creating content that's gonna take advantage of this. I can picture myself on a beach. I don't know where I am. Am I in Mexico or am I in Maui? And I turn around and it just delivers. And it's a Corona ad. And I see the bottles and I know exactly what it is. And I know that's coming. There's gonna be some great stuff coming out when people figure out this, this platform. So as Chris mentioned when he introduced me, I'm in the TV and film side of our business, so we work with broadcast, cable, and the film studios, and they're marketing and advertising on our platform and on Instagram. We get asked the question a lot about video, which is very simple. Hey, you know, how is it possible that my 15 or 30 second spot would have as much impact on a tiny little screen, on a mobile screen, as it would on a big screen TV in someone's living room? That's a really fair question. So we've done a lot of thinking about it. We've been talking to a lot of companies and partners doing research on it. And one of them 
and I recommend you look them up. It's a company called SalesBrain. They're a neuromarketing agency, and you can actually look this up. Uh, this, everything I'm telling you now, we've released publicly, and you can look this up yourself. You can Google it. How's that? <coughs> um, but what they did is they evaluated the response of people, cognitive, emotional, memory, I think there were four, three or four different factors, watching the same exact stimuli, stimuli on a mobile screen versus a big screen television. And what they found was really interesting. The first thing they found was that the emotional intensity and engagement with the content was exactly the same. Not only did they find that those things were the same, but they found that on mobile, the attention level and the positive emotion association was actually higher than on television, and that people that watched the same content on television had a harder time actually remembering everything. They had a cognitive overload. They were distracted in their environment watching it on a television. And there's some early theories about why this is, and they're, they're kind of intuitive if you think about it. The first one is that when you're holding your phone to watch something, your eyes, your brain automatically tell your hand where to hold it. So it's solving the aspect ratio automatically. Your brain's an amazing computer. It solves it. In a lot of cases, the aspect ratio is actually better the way people watch their mobile phone screens. The other reason is that your experience with your mobile phone is so much different than a TV. Your mobile phone is personal. It's about your connections with people. It's your lifeline to your family and friends. So the overall positive experience is just different. It's just better on a mobile phone. The second thing that we think about a lot, because our, like I said, our mission is to connect the world, is that the future of mobile video is a billion people who don't live here. And this room is full of brilliant business people that are building your model on the future of mobile video, and it's just really important to think about what's coming next in terms of your addressable audience. We think about things like this because of charts like this one. And this one is showing that in early, around late 2015, early 2016 will finally be the point where the smartphone installed base in the world will cross, will tip over the internet population. We also look at a lot of, at charts like this one that show that phones are improving fast. So the ability of people around the world who are all wired the same way, who don't always even need to hear words or language to get the point of your content, the ability of those people to receive your content is going to explode over the next couple of years. So if you're in a business that is related to online video, and online video is mobile, you have to talk to these people. If you ever make it to Facebook headquarters, if you have a friend who can walk you around, ask them to take you to our empathy lab. I was up there yesterday, I actually took this picture yesterday and slid it into my deck at the last second. This is the kind of walk around version anyone could walk up to, and then there's kind of a more labby lab that's like behind doors that you can maybe also see. But it's basically a place where we simulate the experiences of people on all kinds of different phones around the world, including network conditions. There's a lot of places where 2G is not going to go away anytime soon. And you'll see all the different feature phones that we have here, and you can see this is the more visitor-facing version of our, of our empathy lab. But it's really important to think about that in your business models, and you're taking into account the actual experience on the other end, because not everyone is holding an iPhone or a Samsung or on a great LTE network that you're on. The third thing is that the future of mobile belongs to the best storytellers. And this is going all the way back to the beginning when I was talking about people not changing, technology changes fast, and you have to focus on the wiring of people. Oops, I have to point that way. Okay. So what mobile video technology has done, and I'm, I'm using the word mobile instead of online, so we're off of desktops. That's already going away. What mobile video technology has done is it's put a little creative studio in everyone's pocket. Anyone can film a video, have basic editing functions right on their phone. So this has created a very crowded marketplace of content, an explosion of content and options. And another industry that is dealing with that, it's really in the throes of it, and I'm sure everyone here knows this, is the television industry. I recently attended, I think it was about two months ago, the uh, Variety TV Tune-In Summit. And it was fascinating, because this is the industry especially that my team serves. It was fascinating to watch two different perspectives on what's going on with the explosion of content. The first group of people were the TV network executives that were getting on stage, and you could practically see their hair falling out while they were talking. <laughs> it's a nightmare for them. There's too many channels, there's too many shows, how do you monetize, the advertising rates are dropping. It's really difficult for them. Then you had showrunners 
and creatives get on stage. And they said, this is the best time of my life. I can get shows on television now that I never could have dreamt of 15 or even 10 years or five years ago. There's so many places for content to appear, and so many options. So the people that are winning, I mean, think about the shows that are on television now, or on Netflix, or on Hulu, or anywhere else, or Amazon Prime. All, the net, the, all these places now are creating content. It's an amazing bevy of stuff for us to watch. So just like there, the people that are going to win in this race on mobile video are the ones that focus on human insights, and the ones that double down on great storytelling. Also relevant here is that with this explosion, it's like this, this super, sorry, it's like this super power where everyone is going to be able. Do I? Yeah, that's my superpower. Sounds like sparrows. Am I good? Okay. I'm going to, nope. Okay, you know, talk. Am I okay to talk? I could kill the mic and just talk loud. How's that? OK. Can everybody hear me? I turned my mic off and it stayed on. It's defying my power. OK, I'm just going to talk. Anyways, the point here is that everyone has a superpower where you can ball up an experience in your hand, and you can throw it anywhere in the world, anytime, anywhere. Right? We all have the superpower. But our brains can't keep up with that. The ability for brains to keep up with this information, it's just not going to happen. This is why stories are so important. Whether it was yesterday or 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, what people remember are really great stories. And that's the stuff that's going to cut through the clutter. When we start at Facebook, we're given this sticker. And this is, uh, I have one of these on my computer. And it says it's 1% finished. It's basically to remind us that we're at the very beginning of a journey. We don't really even know what we're going to be building. I can tell you in that conversation that Chris referenced when he asked about our strategy with video, when I started, we were not talking about video. I mean, we just, we've just been kind of following where people have been taking us, but we didn't have some grandiose strategy to get into video. It just didn't happen that way. I wish I could say that. All of our mistakes have been very public, so you know that we didn't really know the future. But we have these stickers. The duct work in our offices is open and unfinished, and it's deliberate to remind us that we're a work in progress. So I guess what I'll close with is in saying is that we're, we're in this with you. And we're excited to partner with people like you in creating this new immersive experience, this new world, uh, and the ability for people to share. And we're thankful to be on the journey with you. So thank you very much. So you should basically hold us accountable for the impact of your video. Any marketer, I'm, I'm going to talk as if everyone here was spending money with us on, on, on video views. That's how I'm going to talk. You should hold us accountable for the, uh, the money that you invest with us as a platform the same way you hold any other dollar that you invest in media. So if you're investing money in, in television commercials, you have certain metrics that you need to hit, whether it's awareness or or recall are those traditional business metrics, you should hold us accountable the same way. We don't really, uh, when we're having business conversations with our partners, we're not actually even focusing as much, if, it's, if you can believe it, it's in the press, but when we're having a meeting with a marketer, and talking about meeting business objectives, we're actually talking about measuring the things that are gonna actually move their, the needle on their business. And we partner with Nielsen and Millward Brown and a lot of third party companies. We often work with whoever our clients are working with, whoever their measurement partners are, to apply pretty traditional measurement methods to the campaigns they run with us so that we're in line and hold accountable the same way. So it's kind of moving from digital KPIs to business metrics and business results, I guess, would be the answer.
And I think I saw a hand, hand here. I'll take these two because I saw these two shoot up. Go ahead. Casters, cable networks, studios about how to market on your platform. How much are you talking to them about them bringing their content to the platform? Um, the one big issue with Facebook is you don't pay me for my post, but they're usually used to getting paid for it. So how much is that conversation starting with them? Yeah. So, so we're, we're always talking about different ways of bringing content on the platform. Our guiding principle is we... So I'm going to draw a line to something that Chris said. When, when I started, every time we had 100 million more people, uh, we would have a big hoo-ha about it. So when I started, I think we had 400 million people. And when we hit 500 million, we had a big announcement. And 600 million, we had a big announcement. And we shifted the internal metric to engagement and time spent. Because we knew it wasn't really going to matter if we had all these numbers, but people didn't really stick with us. So that's when we started thinking about the types of things that people were seeing in their newsfeed, whether it was photos or check-ins from a friend at a restaurant or content from partners. So um, because we kind of came about it that way, you know, we didn't come into it as, with a monet monetization model like other companies did. So that's something that we're always evaluating to be fair and talk to partners. So we had one more. Uh, could, could everyone hear that? Uh, you'd compared, you'd said the comparison to YouTube is <coughs> apples and oranges. I just wonder if you could expand on that and, and how Facebook's differentiating itself. And then maybe the second part is just in the ad side, it does feel like the very early days where just people are plopping commercials on. You know, I think Vessel's doing interesting things with their five second ads. Just have you guys been thinking about that and how, you know, you touched on it with the, the, the AR and the VR stuff. But mm -hmm. it'd be great to kind of see what you, you feel the future of advertising is on Facebook yeah. as well. Yeah, so the reference to apples and oranges, I think, is really tied to the mind state of people when they go on a platform like YouTube versus Facebook. It's, uh, when you go on uh, most or many other platforms, you go on with intent because you heard something was there, right? So I heard that a trailer dropped and I want to go see it, or I followed a link that I wanted to see. And uh, it may be funny sounding, but this is really important. Nobody goes onto Facebook looking for anything, right? You come onto Facebook kind of like an open receiver and you're just kind of thumbing through. You're doing that. We talk about content having thumb stopping power. So it's the difference between intent. Um, I think they do an amazing job as an intent platform. People want to see something and they know they can go there and look it up. It's very consistent with Google's mission to organize information. They do an amazing job at it. Whereas in the marketing funnel, in the traditional marketing funnel, I would say that we're more in the awareness band simply because people don't come looking for anything. It's a lot more like television, really. The, the mind state of people when they're consuming an ad on Facebook is a lot more like when they're on television. Because they're, they're consuming other content. They weren't looking for that trailer or that ad for a P&G product. Does that make sense? Yeah. And what was the second half of the question? Yeah, I think we don't know. I mean, that's, and that's honest. That's an honest answer. Um, I'll tell you that um, the way that we, so, so it's funny uh, to listen to Zuck talk internally. Uh, he, he used to say this a lot more than he does today, but because, you know, let's be honest, basically ads suck, right? Like it's, it's interrupting what we're doing, right? So his goal has always been to get to a point where they were, an inline experience and not intrusive, and where the content in the ads was actually so good that you didn't mind that it was there, right? Um, we, have a, uh, we have lots of little test groups, and there's probably people in here that are in them. I don't know if, if you ever had the experience when you have your Facebook app, and you know you've updated it, and you know your friend updated their app, but something on yours is different. That means you're in a test group, <laughs> right? So your like button's maybe a little bit bigger, or your photo did something different. So we're always trying things out. We want to see how people like stuff. We have the benefit of mass numbers that we can do that. So we have a holdout group of several hundred thousand people that have never seen an ad on Facebook. And, and you know, they read, they're like, what's the big deal? This is great. This is free. I don't see ads. 
you know, they, have no, they never got a letter telling them that they don't see ads, you know. That's just their experience. So they don't understand why everyone else is making up such a big deal. But we have that holdout group because we survey them on their experience using Facebook. And so we have four or five questions that we use to measure their sentiment, their experience about how they feel using the platform. And we use that as the bar for everyone else. So we ask the same four or five questions to people who do see a certain number of ads a day. And we basically use that to like, it's like the anger index, right? Like you don't, you don't want people who see ads to be much more pissed off or have a different experience than people who don't. You want them to be happy, just like the people who didn't see ads, right? We're always trying to optimize to that. So we make our decisions based on that. To what you're saying, I think we know so little right now about what the impact is going to be, and there's so little way of testing that that we just don't know yet. But those are the kinds of things, that's the filter that we're going to look through to make those choices. So, all right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jonathan. Nice job. Nice job. Uh, first of all, you are all our friends now, like the first day of high school, so we're going to hit you up for visiting Facebook campus. Um, as well as uh, put my wife in that test group so she doesn't buy anymore on Facebook. So I just learned about that, too. Um, some key takeaways. I always kind of like to wrap some of these sessions with some takeaways for myself. Uh, obviously, the focus on, on people. I think that journey between text, picture, video, and AR kind of brought some clarity to me as well in terms of the journey I think Facebook's going with AR. Uh, the difference between TV and mobile viewing, that uh, intent versus discovery, I found that quite interesting. And as well, everything lined within the storyteller uh, within TV. But that's actually apropos to our next session here because clearly he didn't mention Smosh the movie, which is part of Defy Media here. So let's start the next transition. I'm not sure if I know some Defy guys are being interviewed prior to arrival. So is uh, Andrew here from Variety? Sweet. Hello, sir. Hold on one second. I want to make sure your colleagues are here. Nicole and uh, Zach. Oh, all right. All right. Let me get Hold on. Let me get you. Let me get you queued up. Hold on. Whoop. All right. So next up, I'd like to welcome Defy Media and Variety. All right, beyond creating entertainment properties for the 13 to 34-year-old audience, including the recent smash hit, Smosh the Movie. Anyone here, by the way, see that fine feature film? We do. Great. Boom, 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 right? Cool stuff. Uh, they also produced the Acumen Report. Uh, focus on a transformative consumers they believe are driving the future of media consumption, really that 13 to 24-year-old audience. I'm actually uh, glad to have uh, Nicole and Zach up here from Defy Media, as well as Andrew from Variety, co-editor-in-chief, overseeing operations with a focus on digital media. Uh, please take the stage. Come on down. I think we've got a fancy animation for you as well. Let's roll that. Wow. All right. Let's do it. Come on down, John. You guys all mic'd up or got your mics or whatever you need? Mic'd up. We're going to just sit here, right? Please, please. Uh, maybe for, put, take the first cue there or third cue. I'll sit here. Take the first okay. three, yeah. All right. Great. While we wait for Nicole to get here, I have to offer a rebuttal to Mr. Murtaugh's allegation that at a variety conference, TV executives were losing hair. <laughs> In fact, you will grow hair if you attend variety conferences, and that is a guarantee. So don't let, don't let that Facebook guy tell you any different. Um, but no, the truth is that he was getting to, and I'll just talk a bit as we wait for Nicole to get up here, is there is a lot of aggravation in the industry right now as the TV business is clearly under a lot of pressure, and I think one of the reasons for that is something that we're going to get into right here. Uh, companies like Defy are doing some pretty amazing things in terms of programming to a younger demographic. And uh, sure. Uh, and some of the data they're about to share, I think, are going to talk about uh, just what this sort of millennial driven trend is like because there is certainly evidence that it's going to impact the TV audience. So from there, why don't we uh, take it away and take a look at some slides, or perhaps you guys want to set up sort of what you were looking to do with this survey, and we'll go sure. from there. Uh, I need a clicker. <laughs> no, Nicole, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So uh, 
Define Media conducts an annual study uh, and looking at what's going on with the youth of today and particularly how it relates to video content because that is such a deep part of our advertising these days, or it should be. And so just to, uh, to set things off and, and to get you in that teenage and youth mind set, I'm just going to run a short video and, and uh, you'll see our, these are 13 to 24 year olds and they're just talking a little bit about what is happening in their life in terms of video and, and online. Like, I'm not going to find something interesting that a 40 year old finds interesting. If I get back from work, I just, I don't want to watch a one hour episode of TV. I just want to watch a five minute clip of someone playing a video game. Online, whatever you want to watch, you can look that up and it'll be there. TV, you have to deal with what's there. I don't really watch a lot of the TV because we kind of have a limited cable box. When I'm going to watch TV, I'm done with most things, and I can like relax. When I go to watch YouTube, I want to find something out, I want to laugh, or something like that. We were like, yo, yeah, we should try doing YouTube, that might be fun. 9% of this generation wants a YouTube channel, like, <laughs> to be famous mm -hmm. on YouTube. Like, YouTube is, like, one of the biggest things. That's, like, a personal thing that I want people to know about me. I have a friend who refused to join um, Facebook, and I haven't talked to her in five years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what you're up against. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real sea change. And I think, why don't we just start, take a look at some of the numbers that support this kind of uh, anecdotal evidence. I may have to crane my neck a little to remember oh, some of this stuff. Yeah. But let, let's, sorry, let's get into this notion of offline. I don't think it's going to surprise anyone in this room right. the extent to which uh, younger demos are sort of plugged in around the day. But I mean, is this something that actually we could be underestimating their level of connectivity? Absolutely. I, you, know, you see some of the numbers here from our study, just looking at you know, number of hours that they're spending from various sources of media. But something that really came out strongly in this particular study was this notion of, of offline. Uh, you know, when we tried to talk to youth about, uh, you know, well, what do you do when you're not online, when you're not on the computer or your phone, and they gave us this blank look, <laughs> huh? And you know, that's the moment when, you know, first of all, I realize how old I am, and uh, that there is, they, they have no concept of offline. You know, the world has been online, even the 24-year-old, you know, the internet has been there since they were born. And they've all been using computers since, you know, they could use a mouse or a keyboard. And so, you know, their whole, their whole day is online. Uh, their whole night is online. And, you know, they are never alone. You know, they tell us what I, I, I can always text my friend. I can go on Facebook. I can see what she's doing. The, you know, and they talk about sharing videos or watching videos together, which is like not necessarily sitting in the same room. You know, it's like, oh, hey, we watch this. Oh, and then they start texting about it. You know, it, it's really a completely different mindset. And, and even the notion of a video um, is different. I, you know, we um, were conducting an, a second study, or uh, excuse me, our study for this year. And one of our very first learnings was that, like, the notion of a moving image or a video is very different definition for them. I mean, we asked them specifically, and they're keeping journals, you know, write down every video you see, you know, including vines and da 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 da. And when we go back and, and, and we're like, well, you haven't written down any vines. I thought you were a vine user. And they're like, oh, you wanted me to add vines? Oh, okay. I didn't know those were videos. <laughs> so. Wow. Things are, yes, so integrated for them that they are defining things completely differently than, you know, even a 25-year-old is. And so uh, did you get much of a sense of when, if they're watching, you know, on one end of the spectrum, long-form conventional TV content, and on the other end, six-second vines, what does that mix look like? Are they just kind of bouncing back and forth? Or are they kind of tilting to one side of the spectrum much more so than the other? I, that's actually, I can't answer that right now. Uh, mm -hmm. We are, you know, we could not de get a sense of that from last year's study. So this year, we're looking very intensely at that to see exactly how much of their day is short form, uh, you know, five minutes versus two minutes versus a vine versus getting on Netflix and, and you know, binge watching Breaking Bad. And uh, so, 
Uh, that's something we hope to answer uh, Andrew, in a I few months. And I think what is evident, though, from the study is that you know, there's just a massive amount of consumption that's happening across platforms because you know, we're used to you know, traditional media living in a world where content was programmed to us, content was delivered to us on one screen um, and at, you know, at home, and we were limited in terms of our video consumption based just on that alone. So it's not, this, this particular audience doesn't care what screen they're necessarily watching on. They're going to grab the closest, closest screen that's accessible to them for them to watch the content that they want to consume. Um, but I think the, the, what's, what's really revealing here is like who knows what the real limits are in terms of how much content they're, they're willing and able to consume within, within a day. Um, you know, the, the, the stats do show that you know, original digital video content um, far outranks any other forms of content for this particular demographic. 12, plus, 12 hours a week are being spent um, consuming original digital content and on social media. Um, and again, hopefully next year we'll be able to speak better to um, what that breakdown looks like across Vine, Snapchat, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, et cetera. Well, but let's address sort of the right hand of the, of the slide here that you've got on in terms of there's a lot of different kinds of TV scheduled, free. I mean, what are some of the interesting patterns we're seeing? I, one, we're seeing that, uh, you know, the, first of all, the interesting thing, the notion of a show is um, also, again, very different. I, you know, we were asking uh, the people, what, well, what is your favorite, you know, show that you'd like to watch? We deliberately leave the word TV out. And, you know, several of the girls are like, oh, Orange is the New Black. Um, and, I. Uh, the, uh, you know, the notion of a show, it does not necessarily mean it's on TV, although for them, they told us, oh, well, yeah, we are watching it on TV. But, you know, one of the patterns is with uh, shows that may have originated with some type of TV station is they're telling us they're not watching it live or even DVRing it. They're going to Netflix and they're getting the whole season and they're binge watching it. So, uh, you know, that is certainly uh, very different than, you know, watching it live. Uh, a lot of them have said, you know, I don't, I don't have time or I don't want to be there at 8 o'clock to watch my particular show. So that's the other thing. Convenience is really, really a big deal. So that's, you know, you're getting the time shifted TV or they're telling us, oh, well, no, I am going and I can see it free online, you know, the next day or, or whatnot. Okay. Why don't we take a look at the next slide? Okay. So interesting here to get a sense of the sentiment uh, that uh, your young viewers are feeling when it comes to what they see on TV versus digital, and it seems like there's a very clear trend here. Mm -hmm. uh, were you surprised by that? I was surprised by some things. Uh, this was a comparison, and we strictly asked them about scheduled TV, uh, you know, whether they'd apply certain attributes to it, and to the free online video, what, you know, what they see in, in social media and on YouTube and so forth. And you know, it wasn't surprising to me that with the you know, online video, they're saying, oh, well, I can watch it anytime I want, or that, oh, you know, more of them are saying, oh, it, it has what I want to watch, you know, simply because they can go and search, who knows, millions of hours and find something that they want to watch. For me, what was surprising was that you know, they're saying it's much easier to relate to and that it makes them feel good. And that was really surprising to me because I, I we will talk later about YouTubers and, and how they're the new influence, influencers. And you know, one of the things that they say about YouTubers is, I can relate to them. And when we talk about the videos that they watch, the free videos online, they tell us things like, um, you know, one kid said, oh, you know, we'll see a couple guys doing like some dumb stunt. And, you know, and they'll fail and we'll laugh. And, and you know, and we can totally see ourselves doing that. Ah, oh, but we don't have to do it now because they failed and we know what the end result is. It's almost like they experienced it themselves by watching it and, and by sharing the, the video together. So, so that was really, you know, for me, the really, really uh, uh, big finding to hear that. I was actually surprised by the finding about social media. My, my old man bias <laughs> is that it takes, you know, <laughs> scripted narrative to really get conversation going, but apparently I'm wrong. No, absolutely not. Uh, you know, again, the, the example that I just gave yeah. with, with, with the two boys, you know, even if they hadn't watched it together, you know, one guy would talk about how he found something that he really loved, and he's like, oh, I gotta send it to so-and-so because I know he'll love it. You know, and it's not, again, it's not a scripted show. 
and he just knows that you know the guy's going to love it because he can relate to it or it's something they would have done together. So. And I think that's probably a good segue to our next slide, They're talking about what really gets people to stop and use the yeah, thumb stoppers. Uh, talk about some of the themes here in terms of what, what gets those thumbs stopping. Mm -hmm. I, we felt that uh, we wanted to investigate. You know, it's one thing to get someone to sit and watch your content, but you know, first of all, you've got to like, actually get them to open it. I mean, that's uh, you know, one of the challenges of online. So you know, we talked to, we asked, you know, what does make you even stop? I mean, one thing we saw was uh, we observed them and we asked them to go find a piece of content in our, when we interviewed them. You see this scroll, 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 you know, and you see the, the scrolling going really fast. They're on their social media, you know, and then all of a sudden, it's like they stop, you know, at the thumb stopper. And, you know, we're like, okay, what made you stop? And, you know, through discussion, that there were a few things, and some of which, you know, we can manipulate as, as advertisers and some that we can't, uh, you know, liked or reviewed by a lot of people. You know, certainly the, the, uh, crowdfunding, I'll just use that as a word, you know, type of model where, uh, you know, the content democracy, you know, people vote basically on, on what is, uh, what they like. And so people can go and see, oh, a lot of people like that. It might be good. So they'll open it. Uh, second is it's sent by someone I respect. And that had a couple different facets. You know, one was uh, that it was sent by, you know, a friend someone who they know, oh, this, I always open so-and-so stuff because she always sends me good stuff. But the other aspect of someone I respect was a lot of it was these online personalities who they had great respect for and who, again, I'll show you later, uh, you know, they really they don't view these people as necessarily separate from them or outside of their own crowd. Uh, they view them as one of them and they respect their opinions and they will open anything that that person sends them. I, polished and professional looking is interesting. It does not mean produced in a studio and all that. What it meant to them was, you know, it wasn't someone held up their phone and it was all jiggly, you know, and then that was a video. It was that someone thought about it, that they actually took the time maybe to set up some lights uh, so that you could see their face. I mean, it really, you know, it wasn't like real deep, but, you know, they did say, well, you know, if I see, say, a thumbnail and it's really clear and it looks really nice, I'm going to open it because, you know, it might, again, it's, you know, kind of, the, it might be good because uh, it looks like someone cared. It's a little counterintuitive, though, yeah. when you think about the nature of viral video is sort of happenstance in mm -hmm. the moment. I would almost, I could almost see the opposite of that finding right. popping, but. Right. I think if you dig in on the particular platform, if you look at Periscope, if you look at right. Meerkat, you probably would find the opposite. But I think um, because the, we just focused on digital, you didn't get that, those sorts of nuances coming out in the study. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and then, you know, the uh, other things are, uh, again, had to do with what I just talked about, which were them seeing things that could have happened to them or someone they knew or somehow reflected their life, which was another really, really strong theme we heard. Uh, I mean, we, we can all remember being teens and what an uncomfortable time that was. And, you know, when you're a young adult and first being on your own, that's uncomfortable in different ways. And being able to see others going through the same things you are or expressing feelings that you have was really important. Uh, and so that's why uh, some of those viral videos actually, you know, regardless of the quality, were really important to them and that they, you know, they looked at and they shared. I think that's a good segue to the next slide in terms of this notion that you kind of keep coming back to, relatability. Yeah. Uh, you know, we ourselves at Variety did some data a little similar to yours, did a, a survey that showed to our astonishment, and I remain astonished at how impactful <laughs> the survey was, that there is a new breed of celebrities coming up through YouTube and other digital platforms, and it is very much cannibalizing the existing sphere of celebrity. And it looks like your data kind of went in the same direction. Yeah, absolutely. I, we we asked, uh, you know, we had a survey portion uh, to our study in addition to, you know, ethnographics portion. And, you know, in the survey we asked questions about which attributes you would uh, put to a, a YouTube celebrity versus those you'd put to a, a TV or a movie star. And that was very deliberate. We did exclude sports and music because they have a very unique relationship with people generally. 
But what we found was that you know, while there were characteristics that both the, the traditional celebrities and the YouTubers shared, which were those aspirational, those you know, things you want to reach for, the, the one area that the YouTubers just won out, you know, hands above, were these I, you know, notions of relatability, that this person is just like me, that they're genuine, that you know, I trust them. Uh, and you know, this is really important when you know, I pulled out the one number, you know, we asked them about you know, whether you'd try a product that was you know, suggested by uh, a person. And you know, the, the number for the YouTubers is so much higher. And this was consistent regardless of the age. And so that really speaks, I think, to you know, the influence that they have over uh, people and that you know, it's uh, not to be underestimated. But I mean, and those kind of two big words up there <laughs> up top kind of set the stage here, relatability and aspirational. The conventional wisdom I think has been for so long that it was about aspiration, that it was about looking up to people not like you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I sometimes think looking not at your, just at your data, at, at what Variety has done in this space and say, well, maybe this is just a sign of immaturity in the category and that we will still see this sort of new breed of more aspirational, conventional stars. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about that? Or do you think, nope, this is a new medium, new sensibility, that's it? I also want you to comment. I, it's definitely <laughs> a, a new medium and new sensibility mm -hmm. because uh, the access to the YouTube and, and Vine celebrities is so much greater, you know, than that. Mm -hmm. I, it, one of the fellows in the study, he said, you know what, these people, you know, it's like they're putting out videos 365 days a year, you know, they don't take a break, you get to see that, you see how hard they're working. I mean, mm. that is inspirational, you know, or aspirational, inspirational and aspirational for them. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's not that they aren't already aspirational. Mm. It's just in a very different way mm -hmm. than a traditional celebrity. Uh, you know, it's not about the lifestyle of, you know, you know, the, the money in the cars or, or the fame necessarily. It is more about the, the, that they are doing something that these kids aspire to. You know, the kids earlier said, oh, everyone wants to have a YouTube channel. But what, they did, what you didn't hear them say was, oh, but that's a lot of work. <laughs> so. Right. Um, no, I agree with what you're saying. I think that like no one's saying that YouTubers aren't aspirational. They're certainly they are. But um, I think the key point is that um, today, uh, you know, audiences are craving relatability. Audiences are craving that authenticity that comes along with those YouTubers. Um, it's not about production value. It's not about how much money they put into their content. It's about being honest and open with your audience. And, and by doing that, they've made themselves into individuals who are accessible and willing to sort of put themselves into a position where they're dealing with the same everyday challenges that their audiences are. And so celebrities might be dealing with those same things, but aren't as open necessarily about sharing them. And I think traditionally, when it comes to advertising, you know, celebrities were t traditionally paid and compensated for, that, for being a spokesperson. And so um, I think audiences know that. And, and I think it's really hard for a celebrity not to, a traditional celebrity, to, to be looked at in the same way as a YouTuber. They're, they're just um, two different breeds of, of celebrity. Um, one's not better than the other. I just think our, our study really points to the fact that if you want to reach this audience, you have to be um, you know, willing to uh, work with influencers who are um, on YouTube and where the audiences are. So it's not just being authentic and relatable um, in, your, in your content, but it's also that happens to be where you know, audiences want, want, to, want to be. And so you, you need to sort of follow that. So when you bring up the advertiser space, you guys at Defy have done some interesting experiments of taking this new breed of talent and you know, having them help sell <laughs> products from advertisers. Can we take a look at, at some of uh, what we've done here? Sure. Do you want to set, set it up or just to run Yeah, I mean, I think that we're going to look at two examples um, today of, of, of two branded content programs that we, we did. One is with Xbox, the other is with um, Nestle and, and Sweet Tarts brand. Um, I selected these two examples because I th when I looked at the introductory paragraph to today, um, it, it looked like you know, we're, I think, in a room of people who are hopefully now convinced more than ever of the value of digital. And now the conversation is shifting from not should I invest in digital, but there's so many options available in front of us. And you know, is, you know, the truth is YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Periscope all have a place within that um, environment and, and, and two examples that we're gonna talk about today, we actually leveraged 
um, all of those platforms for a successful campaign. So typically advertisers are interested in, um, in views on YouTube and that's how success is really determined. But, um, but we're gonna talk about sort of campaigns that leverage social media and, and influence across all of these platforms um, to, uh, to really create uh, really great campaigns for uh, the advertiser. Great, let's have a look at the first one. Yeah. This isn't just a vacation for me. I'm here, you and me, we have a competition that we need to win. Now how this works is, Xbox has sent me out here with Forza Horizon 2, where you and me, we're competing all week for Forza Fuel. Guys, we can do this. We're competing against other YouTubers, but guess what? Those YouTubers, they're cool and all, they're great people, but, but they don't have a fan base as awesome as you, so I need your help here. So follow the Instagram page, follow us on Twitter, and get those hashtags out there. Hashtag Forza Fuel, hashtag Team Smosh Games. Let's go. He needs less caffeine. <laughs> Um, in, in his defense, he was not going on, he was like, we were, we were driving and shooting content, um, every day. It was a four day road trip. Every day was 10 to 11 hours in the car. Um, and we were editing overnight. So, I mean, this program was a huge undertaking, but, um, when we talk in the study about the consumption habits of this audience, the voracious appetite they have for content, uh, we needed to sort of be real time. We needed to respond, um, accordingly and, and, and just allowing for social uh, interactions along his road trip just wasn't enough. We knew that wouldn't help Xbox and it wouldn't be enough to satisfy our audience. Okay. Uh, how about we just go right into the next one and then sure. we'll ask some questions on the end yeah. of it. <laughs> I got the bigger piece. Oh, you win. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that is it for our Truth or Dare. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this. And I have some very exciting news. I actually did a dating show with Sweethearts, Get Roped In. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't wait for you guys to see it, so stay subscribed because it's going to be here on my channel very soon. And Shay Mitchell is the host, so. Uh, what? What was my name? I don't know. Sorry, next time, Joey. I will also link Sweet Tart's Twitter down below if you guys want to follow them for more information on the episode coming up. So, uh, so that was a project we did with Nestle. Um, they were reintroducing Sweet Tart's ropes um, right in time for Valentine's Day. And, um, you know, we worked with them to really conceive of a, a program that was leveraging influencers um, to not only promote a, a dating show that would be filmed downtown, um, but also, uh, you know, really uh, develop a, what the, you know, a content program that would involve um, you know, multiple videos distributed on those influencers' channels in their own voice. Um, you know, the, it's interesting, they used this traditional celebrity in the form of Shay Mitchell as the host of this, but when it came to de determining like, you know, what's going to drive engagement around this series, nothing against Shay, but like, they really wanted to make sure they were leveraging influencers to not only bring their fans to the actual theater for the taping, all of these fans showed up for the chance to go on a fun group date with their favorite influencer or one of the other influencers participating. But, but all of the social media around it um, really helped drive that participation. So Instagram and Twitter uh, were both used um, to help uh, drive awareness of the actual date um, of the dating show. Um, there was live Instagramming and, and tweeting and Facebook posting going on from the date itself. Um, the, the video you just saw from Catarific was an example of one video she distributed on Valentine's Day to notify her YouTube audience that she, was, she took part in this in her own voice and was, again, very authentic. The integration of Sweet Tars Robes was a part of a Truth and Dare challenge that she and, and Joey have done before. And so, again, it's relatable. It's something that her audience was familiar with, and the integration was done in a way that I think um, made a lot of sense for her, um, which is really important when you're integrating a brand and a product to make sure it comes out in, that, in, their, in their own voice. And so um, the program was really successful, over 2.5 million views across the series, um, as well as a lot of, uh, in, you know, engagement uh, on, on YouTube in the form of comments uh, as well. We just have a few more minutes left. I've got more questions, but I want to give time to the audience. If any of you have anything you want to ask, I see in the far right corner under the giant lighted A.
just so everyone hears, he was asking about how multitasking impacts the results of the survey. We did not uh, look into multitasking specifically. I have, there are other studies out there that, uh, recent studies actually that have looked at that and what they have, uh, most of them have said is yes, they are largely uh, watching TV and on a smartphone or, or a tablet or a computer. Uh, and that, uh, you know, they are sort of half and half uh, TV attention, half, you know, whatever other device, but on the commercials, they're totally on their device. Uh, and so, and uh, it was a little different, you know, they, the question was also, well, are they, uh, when they're on their device, is, are they talking or texting, you know, with friends or something about the show? And largely, they were not. I mean, I know that, you know, there's studies also that show there's a large Twitter component to watching TV, but at least the, the studies that I've seen, you know, said that, well, there are some people doing, talking about the show that they largely are not when they're multitasking. Hmm. Got time for another right over there. translate into sales? Like, I know millennials are driving a lot of the content, but who's actually making the purchasing decisions? I, and, and, when you, and you're referring to the products advertised. I, that's an area we have not studied. I'm looking at um, the futures company, they do something called the True Youth Monitor. And they do look at the purchasing power of uh, you know the various age groups. So uh, particularly uh, you know with regards to teens and how much influence they have, and uh, it's largely dependent on the category. And with foodstuffs, uh, the having huge influence uh, over what is purchased, uh, electronics huge influence, uh, and uh, clothing. So I, th I think the answer would be it would depend on the category, uh, but uh, there's other studies uh, showing that there was one called the power of pestering uh, and looking at you know, how uh, kids uh, pestered their parents to buy things that they wanted or they'd seen advertised. So uh, I think that uh, you know, maybe the kids aren't themselves, but they are certainly having a huge influence. establish brand loyalty with the end game being once they uh, are in their late 20s and 30s, that's, what they'll, that's when they'll actually start purchasing and that's when all this will actually start to bear fruit. Am I wrong in assuming that? Or taking that uh, from the presentation? I, I would say that depends on the goals of the advertiser. Because we, when, uh, when we work with uh, clients, e each one has a different goal. So for some, it is strictly just awareness. Uh, you can speak to it with your specific campaign, those two campaigns. Sometimes it is more branding and building that brand awareness, or the, excuse me, that brand loyalty for the future. Right, I, I think it really depends on the advertiser. I mean, a lot of the campaigns are not looking that far out. I mean, they're really trying to drive awareness, um, purchase consideration, um, you know, in the, in the short term, um, you know, for, for an upcoming new product or a release of a movie or a game. So. Uh, it's not looking that far out. I think we're really trying to drive awareness as, and, and loyalty is, is, is fleeting at this point, right? So I think we just need, need to sort of be aware of that. And the only way that you can continue to earn the trust and respect of the, of the audience and the consumer is to continue to um, surprise them and continue to provide them with great experiences and, and products and services. Well, that's all the time we have. About a hand for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, Andrew, Zach, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, when I, I know when we're working with influencers, we look at them definitely from an awareness and discovery play, then we are a cost per acquisition. So when working with influencers, you probably think of them in that, that, that essence. Uh, I found the Acumen Report very interesting. I'd love to follow up, Nicole, with you a little bit later. One of the areas that I thought was interesting in terms of online versus scheduled viewing, um, one thing is how Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon are put in that consideration set as well as I'd love to learn a little bit more about how the under 13 year old audience uh, deals with consumption of influencer content. I know we've got folks like Disney and Mattel here dealing with the younger audience, so Nicole, I think I wanna chase you down a little bit later on some of that. Uh, also, I traveled six hours north from Chicago 
because of FOBO, right? Fear of being offline, but I, I was determined to have an analog family getaway. So six hours later, I got there, but it was good stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm surprised that only 9% of kids want to have a YouTube channel. I, I think that would be a little bit higher. Um, cool, let's get going and let's keep moving here. Next up actually is Style Hall. Any, any, who, everyone, some folks here, who's here not familiar with Style Hall, right? Everybody is then, no one raised a hand. All right, let's do some style hall and have them join us up here. So a little quick intro here for who we have coming down uh, up here on the stage. So top fashion and beauty. Oh, let's roll that first then. Let's do it. Nice fireside chat. Love it. Love it, guys. All right. So all right. Top. <laughs> I'll get the pacing right by the time we're done. Uh, top fashion and beauty YouTube channel, Style Hall, sold over, uh, sold for over 100 million and currently valued over 200 million. Stephanie, uh, the Style Hall and Style Hall, the journey has been well documented and recognized for her creativity and entrepreneurial leadership, including Fast Company's top 100 creative people in business. Obviously, the story behind Style Hall is compelling, and I think prepping for this session in terms of understanding the evolution of brands, how they should think by operating this space the business of content and strategy, kind of what success looks like. I'm actually really honored to have Stephanie and Mia on the stage today, along with moderator Shira, from uh, founder of What's Trending, as well a Fast Company alumni, and the most influential woman in technology. So we've got a lot of influence and power here on stage. Please come on down to join us here for our next session. And join us here on stage, gals. Let's get some music going, guys. You got a little background. <laughs> Shira Lazar, Stephanie Olitsky, Mia Goldwyn, come on up. All right, let's sit down. Oh, there the mics go. How's it going? How's everyone doing? Good morning. Feeling it? A lot of great people here. Uh, well, it's an honor to be here with Stephanie and Mia, and we're going to hear, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to hear more uh, a bit about the story of, you know, your personal experiences and how it's converged with the brand, the acquisition, where the brand is headed. Um, and the whole, uh, a look at where the landscape is right now from an original content perspective and an MCN perspective. And we talked a bit about that. And then we're going to open it up for uh, questions. So first, though, you have something to show us. Yeah, I think for those of you who don't know who we are, um, this, this is us. I have something really exciting to share with you today. In my heartbeat. New form tracks some of us down. And Starting Style Hall in 2011 to recently the acquisition from RTL, like, is this what you imagined uh, the brand to be? And now looking back, like, how much has it evolved? Yeah, I mean, I so for those of you who haven't heard my overtold story, I, I read an article in Fast Company in 2009. Uh, Ashton Kutcher had just started his business, and he was talking about um, using short-form online video for craft as part of the business he was running, and. He said something in the article and it changed my life. He said, brands are gonna need to build social networks. And I still have the magazine on my dresser. I still have the big red circle around the quote. I still have all my notes in the margin. And I was like, this is gonna be the future of everything. And I got on a plane and went out to Los Angeles and hunted down Alan Debevoise, who had just bought Machinima and was starting. And I was like, you're the pioneer. 
listen to me. And a mere eight months later, I had a meeting with him, um, and we decided to start Style Hall. So it really came from kind of seeing that this was going to be a movement in the space. And then as soon as I got into it, it, it was going, I mean, we, you and I were talking about, like, could we imagine when we started that this is where we'd be? The answer is absolutely not. Um, in fact, I was negotiating with someone the other day, and I said, well, it, I know you think that I'm, I'm being difficult, but two years ago, this wasn't an issue. And I know two years from now, it, there's going to be a number of things that I didn't mm. think were an issue. And I think it's because this space is moving faster than any of you or any of us can. Um, so the question is really just identifying what you really want to accomplish and holding on tight to that, because the reality is it's going to it's going to whirl by you on other things, and there's just nothing you can do about it. And what are the biggest misconceptions? Like we were, we were talking about this also backstage, like of how people look at MCNs versus uh, what it, the platform model, and like what Style Hall really is. Like, what do you want to tell everyone here today that might have different ideas of who you are and what you guys are going to become in the near future? Yeah, I mean, I would say first and foremost, we're we're a style network. <clears throat> um, we're extremely focused. That, that's all we do. Uh, we're fashion and beauty. We're a community of people who are passionate about fashion and beauty, passionate about shopping, um, and, that's, and that's it. Uh, so, for example, if, if you want to work at scale, you, you, three of the five channels are with us. To work with the other two, you'd have to work with four other MCNs that work in the fashion and beauty space. So, you know, this is all we do. We obsess about fashion and beauty. We obsess about this community. Um, and I think the other thing is I'm a marketer, so I came from retail. Um, I care very much about trans translating what we're all doing into purchase, uh, translating into brand loyalty. Um, so I came from Saks. Our CMO standing over there came from J. Crew. Um, I can tell you that it's it's very important at our business about how how we translate for brands. That what that ROI and the KPIs are is extremely important. So you know, Style Hall is really a, a multi-platform marketing solution. Um, I think you're going to hear a lot about, and, and I'm sitting next to our chief content officer, who's, who's going to talk about the importance of really premium and rich content and, and really investing in that and being a, a part of it as a brand. Uh, I think you can't discount uh, what, what we affectionately dub in this space the long tail. Um, so that's all the commercially untapped voices that we're talking about that, that take that content you're making and talk about it, or your brand, and talk about it. Um, so I've spent three years working on how do we activate that long tail? How do you use them as effectively? Because their voices actually can connect more with their fans at times than a superstar in the ecosystem who's, who's rather unattainable at this point. I mean, they're really a celebrity status person. And so it's a great way to make one piece of content and reach a lot of people. But you really actually need all those voices around it to continue that conversation and create more content about your brand and continue that message. Because that's really who's buying the product. How do you continue to make brands understand the importance where, and we've talked about this all also, where you have the Joey Graceffa, and I'm sure you use him as a, a central figure within a campaign. But how do you make them understand how important these other voices are, and like the balance of like why pay for a Joey versus all these other people? Yeah, I think you can't look at it as an either either or. I, I think the way me and I look at it is, is it's a pyramid structure, right? You, you know, you always have an aspirational person. So you have a celebrity that you that you use as a, um, an identity to your brand, or somebody aspirational that you want them to look up at. It's no different in the digital ecosystem. There are celebrities. You still probably want them to kind of anchor your campaign and be the face of it. Um, you've got to continue that conversation down, though, or it, it can die with that one piece of content. So you know, for us this year, we talked about at New Fronts that, that our campaigns have now about 8x in size. So if you were getting 60 pieces of content last year, um, we've developed our, our first product was rolled out this year, which is called Style Hall Society. And it extends to all of the social platforms and allows you to make now 500 pieces of content with each campaign. So we're reinforcing your message and your brand and the content you've, you've invested in over and over and over and over again with the voices that care about it and that are commercially untapped and therefore resonating with an extension of viewers far beyond what that one premium piece of content would do. And, yeah, and obviously in the past you were selling against these voices and their channels and social, but now uh, going into original content, um, how, I guess, how are you selling that to brands and the value of that versus maybe buying against you know all these other individuals? Yeah. And wh wh why is that important to, in terms of the future of Style Hall? Um, I mean, we've been doing branded content pretty much from the very, very beginning. And as Steph mentioned, we look at it almost as an ensemble cast where we work with the brands from the very initial stages. Our campaigns aren't just a media buy. Our campaigns are sitting down working with the brands from the very initial stages, building it out, producing it with them, and integrating both social and content. So Original sort of took that strategy and built it out. So the first series that announced at our new fronts that we launched in June 
um, Vanity, we, Maybelline came on board and became our partner. They were a part of the conversation from the very beginning. They were integrated as part of the conversations with the script. We wrote in Maybelline as part of the storytelling where the main talent, actually, Lily, dared to uh, kind of develop her story. And that was synced up with Maybelline's Dare to Go Nude campaign. So the entire, not only did, the, did Lily have fantastic makeup, which is sort of the usual integration that you see, but we actually wrote in the Dare to Go Nude campaign as part of the storytelling experience. In addition to that, we obviously built in additional traditional branded native content videos, which uh, delivered organic scale, and we had a very robust social activation. That's interesting. So do you see this as the future of like how you're going to be looking at a lot of your campaigns, like scripted specifically, or? Yeah, I well, think it, it started, we, I, one of our channels came, flew out to LA and did help the hairstylist on The Hunger Games create six of the hairstyles that are in The Hunger Games. And I said to Mia, oh my god, like hair is part of The Hunger Games story. Right. Like it's actually mm -hmm. like, it, it's, it's actually a part of the story. If the brand had partnered with this amazing digital creator that was doing this. They created tutorials about how you replicate them and they were in the extension to the movie. Like, imagine what a powerful campaign that would have been for the brand instead of just, say, making a nail polish line after the fact inspired by the movie, right? Something of that nature. And so we looked at each other and we're like, well then, how do we do the same thing? How do we take, can, can makeup be part of like the way Sex and the City and Gossip Girl style and fashion were part of the story? Can we do that same thing here? And we kind of looked at each other and said, yeah, we yeah. can. So we took some amazing projects and we literally unpacked them at the table with Maybelline and said, okay, let's repack them. Where, how do you want your brand? And they wanted to be identified with the, the bold and um, sort of amazing nerve of this young girl kind of taking on um, her first job. And so that's where they were integrated into the story. And I think it was, it, you know, it was a very powerful result. So, and I, yeah. Sorry, and I think, to, I mean, th the key thing, which is sort of a, a general evolution that we're seeing in the space is that these content experiences, whether they're shorter form and they're the native YouTube videos or it's more premium originals, you want to build an emotional connection. That is the thing that brands want to do. That is what converts to purchase. That is where you get the most success. I think most people in the room have seen the Like a Girl campaign that PNG did with, that was really generally celebrated. And it was celebrated because it was innovative, it was unique, and it built that emotional connection. And that's, in a way, what we We've achieved with vanity is that you like this character, you like her story, you want to be like her, you want to look like her. You you through the native videos are seeing how you're getting the, the looks in the tutorials, but it's a much longer tale and it's a much deeper connection that you create with the characters. So that's going to be kind of our ongoing strategy, whether it's through the shorter form videos that we do that are kind of the native tutorials or through the longer form premium content. Yeah, the lead up to the to the scripted series was um, a series of six creators that created a, a each a different look uh, with the Maybelline palette. Uh, so, so you mix it an original with also what you do native. Correct. It was the, the extent creators. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, we have like ten minutes, nine minutes. So I'm going to open it up because um, to any questions specifics. I mean, I can continue asking questions, but I just thought we only have a little time. Uh, anyone specifics? All right. Well, I'll continue <laughs> um, in terms of like how you're working with brands. How many people here are brands? Agencies, okay, brands, agencies, creators. Okay, so we have some more brands and agencies. So if you could say anything to a brand or an agency right now, like um, no censorship in terms, you know, you don't know who these people are, maybe you know some of them, you might work with them, you might not. But like, what are people doing right? What are people doing wrong? And how can we overcome that hump right now? I would say, I I, it, I'm, not, I'm, I'm staying away from criticizing because I think when I started this business, there was so much education that needed to go on. Um, first, I needed to explain to people what we were doing and why it was valuable. I think we've kind of passed that hurdle. Then it became a question of how do you buy it? So even the brands that really wanted to buy it, it was like, well, with what dollars and, and how do we measure value? And then the agencies were looking at it saying, well, okay, can you translate it into the way that we sell media? Because that's the easiest way for us to tell our clients. Yeah. I think... I think you're all doing an excellent job of that evolution. It, I don't think it's anybody's fault in particular. I think it's a brand new space. But you know, being innovative about how you know how we're funding and where you're kind of classifying what you're doing is is difficult. Um, we get a lot of you know, it's a lot of RFP work, and then you're kind of responding, but that's difficult with content. And so I'd say I think we find that that kind of coming in with sort of an objective and and then your KPIs has been the most successful result for the brand. Um, so being a little bit flexible as both an agency and a brand, I think, is, is key here because it's very difficult to try to jam something brand new into a model that is totally different. Uh, running a media, traditional media unit inside an existing placement is, is a much more simple thing than creating scaled conversation that you're looking at every day. 
Um, I was saying to her right before, I said, you know, I really believe this content is, re is, is going to replace media and, and eventually even part of search because uh, your discovery is happening on social platforms. And, and really the content you're consuming isn't the additional media units, it's social content. So, you know, to loosening the reins to let other people talk about your voice but actually having some control over it so that you can get your message out there. Uh, like, there's going to be, everybody's got to be a little patient with each other as that evolution happens. And, it's not, that isn't, a, it's just sort of a reminder that I think if you're frustrated, it's, it's, you're not alone. Um, I think it's just going to take a little bit of flexibility on everybody's parts. I mean, I'm, I'm a big partner on this because I think the ecosystem's not going to move forward if we all don't, don't, don't give a little bit. But I think that if you're feeling that frustration, I would say don't not use the space because that's a mistake. What um, do you say to brands who are like, oh, we need to rationalize this with media, but you're like, but this is a creative idea, so we still need the money for the, you know, creative around it and the social around it. I would say that millennials are 20% more likely to buy something if it's recommended by somebody online and one of their peers. So if you want your brand to be here in five years and be relevant and be by, being bought by the people you we were talking about earlier, um, you kind of have to you have to get in the game, right? So I would say it's it you got you got to get that flexibility someplace. What's I would it? Say, yeah. Sorry, the only other thing I would add is it, it, look at it as a partnership. I mean, obviously the space is moving and changing so incredibly quickly, and in the same way that brands buy traditional media, which is a year-long buy, and if something goes wrong, you sort of have time to make it up. Approach us in the same way. Look at us as your partners. Let us help you. We have data. We have research. We have metrics that are you know, a lot more in real time than anything that you've seen in the traditional world because we have data literally both across social and YouTube at our fingertips. We know who are going to be the next stars. We know what are going to be the next trends. Look at us as a partner and let us build these programs with you because we get it. The space is challenging. It's evolving. And it's moving very, very, very quickly. And I think when we look at this as a partnership, usually that's when you get the most success. Yeah, we have a question. That's what I'm talking uh, about. So Mia, actually a follow-up to that. So you mentioned New Front. It's kind yeah. of an interesting term I don't think everyone maybe is familiar with here. But also, the way you're articulating and speaking, brands are looking at potentially, let me make sure I get this right, introducing their product, launching their brand or identity, or potentially starting the journey with driving consumer awareness through a vehicle like Vanity. Mm -hmm. or on style hall and whether it's food or automotive or fashion the way you're looking at the space and the way brands potentially could be engaged in this space is using this as that tip of the sword that front end of the strategy and then follow behind it based on the performance with amplification or other areas is that how can brands be thinking about this in a holistic way it's not just a tactic right it's a full strategy yeah. it sounds like you're bringing to the table. I, would, I would just adjust that statement a little bit the, Please. the analogy i give is think about it like a stone you're you're etching your brand on a stone so to the core is you and then you're dropping it in a puddle as those rings create around it it used to be that you dropped it in a puddle and you could control it with media or you could control it with your press right now you're dropping it in a puddle and the voices are taking it so if you're not getting in the game of sort of deciding how that first ring is being created, how the second ring is being created, how the third ring is being created, then, then let, let it be as it will. But if, I think it's not, I don't want to say that we're taking over launching a brand's product or their identity. I, I, don't, think, I don't think that's accurate. Um, I think we're meeting with agencies and meeting with brands, finding out what we want, finding out what's etched on that stone, and saying to you, okay, if you're going to drop it, here's how you create what you want in those concentric rings that are coming out of it. I would think about it more that way just to adjust what you're saying. But yes, I agree with you. Think about the size of that puddle. I, I think if you're not in the puddle, you, you're going to miss a lot of opportunity in, in that conversation and, and what people are learning about your product or your brand. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's not one or the other, because we all know every single person in this room does not consume media on just a single screen. The days of that are completely over. So similar to what you said with Vanity in particular, is Maybelline had a strategy on print, which is what they usually do, that a strategy on TV. But we were also, Vanity was an integral part of their strategy and their product launch of the palette is we aligned the launch date to align with the launch of the palette. We built our social activation. We built in the message. We aligned with the campaign. Maybelline also amplified it through social. So again, we become a part, of, a critical part of the ecosystem because females 18 to effectively 34 are consuming that content online. We had a question right here. If there's a mic or, oh, there, there we go, Jay's. Hi, this question is for Mia. 
Um, what are your best practices on monetization for a new YouTube star or YouTube influencer from their point of view? And how do you monetize as a company with ad shares? I think Steph could probably take that question. Yeah, that's that I, given, that question. She's build, given that she's built stuff. <laughs> um, I, when I came into the ecosystem, I, I sat down and I looked at it and I said, well, there's, there's already two hands in this pie, right? There's YouTube and there's the creator. So now you're trying to sliver another piece. And I was like, I'm not interested in affiliate dollars. I don't think that's, that's a real business. I come from retail. That's not, it's not interesting to me. Um, so I kind of took media and shifted it to the left a little bit. I was like, okay, you know, YouTube does a really good job um, on their own platform, to be totally honest. And I was like, so let's think about it this way. So just to give you a sense, um, at Style Hall, our revenue is half and half. Half is, comes from a media unit and half comes from content. Um, so that's very different than a lot of other businesses in the ecosystem. We, we really are split down the middle. So how do you monetize? I would say, you know, for creators, there's, um, Famously got myself into it by, by saying on one of these panels that there are seven ways alone on YouTube to monetize, and that's, that's accurate. Um, between the various media units, uh, the different types of integration and content you can use, affiliate links, et cetera, and that's just YouTube alone. Um, so that's not the extensions to books, movies, TV, et cetera, product lines, uh, appearances, additional social content on seven other platforms. I can keep going, right? Um, so I think, how do you monetize? I would say, you know, look at media the way I did. Like, it's a great base, it's a great foundation, and it's, it's churning along, right? But, you know, YouTube is gonna launch subscription, there's gonna be additional ways, there's tons of other platforms out there, like Vessel and Vimeo, and places to put other content. So I think, you know, it, you, you gotta, I would say, widen your net. And you guys are becoming a central, fig like, um, I guess, figure in that within your brand, talent will come to you, and it's not just for YouTube. Obviously, with RTL, like that, a big strategy of that was broadening it out. Yeah, we haven't sold a purely YouTube campaign in over two years. Um, it's, not, it's not even our strategy. So uh, we say we're a multi-platform marketing solution to brands. So we storytell. Um, I do say the story starts on YouTube. Uh, that's, that's really the primary place for storytelling. It, it's, where they, it's where they connect with their audience. It, it's, it's the most valuable to you as a brand or an advertiser. 20% of women make video, 80% watch it. So you really have a chance to have kind of a larger share of voice there. But the storytelling experience, as you know, continues. Uh, it continues on Twitter, it continues on Instagram, it continues on Snapchat, at Pinterest, et cetera. Um, so now I think Facebook video. Facebook video, um, fa Facebook period, actually. Um, you know, there's different ways to use all these platforms, but yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's definitely, we do not put any content in exactly the same format on different platforms. So. Uh, you know, we, we announced at New Friends, we have a large partnership with Amazon. We create content for the Amazon viewer for that platform. That is a resource platform, that is a commerce platform. You're not there to be entertained and hear about their date with their boyfriend. You're there to find out what they bought for that date or what they bought for that house that month. Uh, the Amazon platform has a very specific need for our creators and their viewers. Right. Yeah, this was like a speed date, but yeah. we got a <laughs> lot in there. So thank you so much to Stephanie and Mia right now. Thank you. And so Bravo, bravo, thank you. Thank you so much. If there's any questions, you guys can catch up with me and Stephanie and Sure Outside. Uh, if you want to follow us more questions, I liked actually their journey around storytelling, and I think there's something to be learned with them. So hopefully you guys can find some one-on-one -on -time, one -on -one time with them. Hey, I want to take a moment actually real quick before we break to introduce Mr. Bill Buckley, who's uh, really my right-hand man and the engine behind uh, the shenanigans that are going on here today, and maybe acknowledge some of our sponsors and, and share this little information. Please, Bill, come on up. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, and riffing off Jonathan and Facebook, a superpowers, mine. Be Buckley at Eisenberg.com. I can email you. Uh, so I appreciate your patience with all my emails. And as much as you want to thank you, we also want to thank our sponsors, right? Uh, Tubular, thank you so much. They are our primary sponsor. Curse this evening. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes. And to our wonderful graphics team, uh, Curse this, this evening will be hosting our reception. Our breakfast was Beachfront Media. Uh, we also have partners with Twitch, Epoxy, Pixability, on the media side, Variety, VentureBeat, O'Reilly, Nappy, uh, What's Trending, Video Link, and Stream. So thank you all. Um, we are going to take it to be about a 25 minute break, and please make your phone calls, come on back, because after the break, we have an amazing keynote interview, uh, changing the way 
you see the world. It's going to be with Matt Bretz from our team, but really we're so thrilled to have with us Morgan Neville, who's an Academy Award-winning documentary filmmaker. So Morgan will be right after the break, so please. So it is now. Time check, people. I am seeing 20 minutes till 11. Can we all please be back in the room at 11 o'clock? Beverages right outside the door. Refreshments, please, please go. Networking, come back at 11. Thank you.
You're not gonna wanna miss this next panel. So we're gonna start rounding people up here. Two minute warning. People from the outside there, Keith. Come on, tell them let's do it. Mr. Dave Daniels, let's go. I see you out there. Come on down, guys. We're just getting started. So much goodness. So much goodness happening. How are we doing so far? Everyone all right? Yeah? Huh? Little okay, keep going. Stop. All right. Uh, let's get fired up. Uh, matter of fact, let's fire up one of them fancy animations. Hit it. Yes. Three months of work right there. Yeah. All right, let me set you guys up, all right? Listen. I thought a lot about this session, and uh, here's what I have to say about it. And hopefully uh, everyone's stream's going. Please make sure you tweet. If any questions or engagement for the sessions, we will actually support those during the uh, panels and serve up those questions. So let's not forget those folks. Okay, the power of storytelling from those that are uh, living this story every day is often untold or crafted as a supplement to your brand, product, or service. You know, who here has done a dev diary on the back end, right? After all, your job doesn't require you to act, which is in fact what makes it so real. And why documentary and filmmakers like Academy Award winner Morgan Neville are changing the landscape on crafting the brand's personality from people that are responsible to bringing it to life. Who really needs Morgan Freeman to be a pitch man when you can't have access to you and bringing you to life? That's a skill for sure. So please. Welcome, Morgan Neville and Matt Brett, Creative Director of Eisenberg Group, to the stage to get us talking about changing the way we see the world. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. 
So I have to say first, because I thought I was going to have to do the introduction part, that uh, it's a great honor. Uh, sure. Morgan is a, uh, a frequent collaborator for us, but he's also uh, won the Academy Award for Best Documentary in 2014 for 20 Feet from Stardom. And he's now uh, directed Best of Enemies, which is in theaters now. Right now. Uh, Go see it. And uh, it's just yeah. a great pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. So uh, today, well, I thought we'd start by talking about it, and we're going to make sure that we leave uh, ample question and answer period for the end, because you guys might just want to find out what it's like to hold an Oscar, right? Uh, heavy. But it's very heavy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought what we'd do, what, the, yeah. the general spine of what we'll talk yeah. about is um, the nature of documentary filmmaking, yeah. and then how that wraps around to applying your skills uh, in that area to marketing video, mm -hmm. to uh, so what some people call... Uh, uh, marketing Vidocs, or I've heard them called uh, Documercials. But before we launch into that, why don't we give everybody a little uh, look at uh, some of the work that you've done before so that we can have a sense of your techniques as sure. it were. Seeing background remains, a, I suppose, a somewhat unheralded position. You know. There's a power to these women that stand on stage with these guys. It's a bit of a walk. A walk to the front is... This is complicated. How would you logically not have a diva have a music on? I, I don't get that. The rock and roll people like Bruce and Elton John and Steve want to know who that girl singer was. My life has been all about trying to make a success of the gift that I have. She was like a really hot one of our kids. She was very hot. <laughs> I don't set out to be the sex symbol, but he posed in Playboy. Poor <laughs> <laughs> told me he hired a researcher. He wanted to paint National Review as being uh, racist, if he could, anti Semitic. I don't think he was really interested conducting a debate about the issues, or about the parties, or about the policies, or about the platforms of the two parties. What he wanted to do was to expose the Obama. Their confrontation is not lifestyle. What kind of people should we be? Their real argument in front of the public is who is the better person. So I should have set that up a little better, um, but that's the Best of Enemies, the last film, is the one that's in theaters now, which is about the uh, the rivalry and the televised debates between William F. Buckley, a famous conservative, and Gore Vidal, a famous liberal radical thinker. And um, anyway, so two very different projects. Both films about divas, though, in their own way. So, <laughs> Well, let's cut to the quick. Yeah. What makes a great documentary? You've been doing um, it a long time. Same thing that makes a great film, story and character. You know, okay. it's, uh, people think of documentaries as being some other creature, but it obeys the same rules as all filmmaking which is you have to have a great story or a great character or ideally both. You know, but essentially that's what it comes down to. It's a completely different process though because when you are making a Hollywood movie, you write a script and then you shoot a movie. When you make a documentary, you shoot a movie and then you write a script. And I know just from having worked with you on this and with other agencies, this makes uh, agencies very uncomfortable when, when, <laughs> when you enter this realm. Um, and what you learn doing this uh, for 20 years is that that leap off the cliff, um, you're going to land. You know, that you know enough about what you're doing that you know you have the right pieces. And you may not know how it's going to fall together, but you know you're going to get there. And there's something that happens when you let the story speak for itself that's unscripted, that is the magic that is documentary. And the more you try and make people say what you want them to say, and everybody's probably had this experience, the worse it comes out. You know, it's like uh, interviewing a hostile witness or, uh, you know, <laughs> on, on the stand, you know. And I'm much more in interested in 
the things you don't expect. You know, that I, I prefer, as an interviewer, to not ask questions I know the answer to. And I think people being interviewed like to feel like the interviewer is actually trying to learn something. And being willing to follow the tangents. You know, I can't tell you how many times I thought a film was about one thing or an interview was about one thing, and you end up on this totally random tangent. And I've even had the experience of somebody telling me some incredible tangent when I'm making a film, and then I find myself telling people about it at dinner, and then I realize, well, if it's interesting enough for me to be telling somebody about it at dinner, maybe it's not a tangent. Maybe it is the story. And I think being willing to, you know, you go in with a plan and a map and a treatment for a film, but at the end of the day, when you get to the edit bay, it's making the best film with the footage you have. So you have to be free enough to throw away that map and start anew, in a way. And, um, and the other thing, I mean, there was a, a famous Alfred Hitchcock quote where he said, uh, in Hollywood films, God is the director but in documentary films, the director is God. No, I get that backwards. Uh, no, Hollywood films, yeah, the director is, uh, is God in Hollywood films, and yeah. God is the director in documentaries, yeah. because you have no real control over it. Um, and you have, so it's kind of that giving up um, of control that makes people nervous, but it's mm -hmm. where the best stuff comes from. Yeah, and I think we'll talk a little bit about finding ways yeah. around that, you know, yeah. technically, because like, yeah. I know we've worked really hard on that yeah. with some of the stuff we worked on together. Um, in the vein of asking questions that you don't know the yeah. answer to yeah. uh, and putting people on the spot. So uh, we also live kind of in the age of uh, DSLR cameras and the specs are mm -hmm. getting better on every phone mm -hmm. and device that we get. So, and in a way, ironically, a lot of the shorter format media that we're talking about today, you know, if you think about what uh, Periscope is or Instagram, it's kind of a documentary format. I mm -hmm. mean, they're all making documentaries. Mm -hmm. So after, but you've been doing this for a couple of decades now, more. What is the difference between sending out your smartest intern and sending out somebody like Werner Herzog or you or Doug Prey? Uh, a number of things, I should hope. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, certainly the, uh, the ease of technology has made a huge difference. And there are films that are happening. I see documentaries all the time that only have happened because of the technology. That somebody happened to have a camera there at the right moment, or the ease of being able to shoot now cheaply um, has made that that much easier. I mean, even starting back with films like um, Startup.com. Citizen Four. Uh, Citizen Four, though, you know, she could afford a camera. But just the idea that people now are starting to shoot stuff not knowing if it's a catfish is another one where they, whether or not, I don't know how scripted all that, that is, but, um, Docu but the- Docu-kinda-y. Docu yeah, but that the, there are seeds of things that people can now start shooting and, and they may become documentaries, they may not. Um, and there are interesting films that way. I think the thing that lets people make interesting films over and over is understanding how to put a film together, but also a big part of it, which people don't talk that much about, is the rapport with the subject, yeah. you know, and I think that's a huge part of it. Um, you know, most of these, most documentaries are not verite documentaries, you know, the kind of Frederick Weissman style, fly on the wall, just hanging back and letting stuff happen. You know, you're dealing with your subjects, you're trying to get them to open up, you're building trust, um, and you're interviewing them, and these relationships can take years and years and years to, to develop. And that is kind of the key part of it, um, yeah. You know, I, in almost every film I've done, you kind of get, it could happen early, it can happen late, but there's a moment where your subject just kind of relaxes yeah. and says, okay, I know I've been telling you what you want to hear, or I've been giving you the usual line of BS I'm used to giving, but yeah. like, okay, I'm just going to be myself. And, yeah. you, and you just strive for that moment. And that, I mean, I think that's actually true in any, that's really true with acting, with uh, directing actors, directing real people for commercial content, or directing people uh, for documentaries. Yeah. And I've literally heard people that, uh, you know, we've worked with call you a story whisperer. Yeah. You know, for, like for uh, like well, bringing, out, bringing out stuff that they didn't know was in them. Yeah. And uh, I can tell you, uh, it also, uh, I'll tell you a secret for all the people that are sitting on this side of the room, mm -hmm. which is that as, uh, as marketing teams, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have the guy who won the Academy Award uh, on the roster for sure, <laughs> telling your story, sure. telling your brand story. But to me, the the key to being a good interviewer or to being a good documentarian or dealing with a real subject is just being genuinely curious. Mm -hmm. You know, that if you actually want to hear what a person has to say and you're less worried about where it's going and more like you're having a really good dinner party conversation with somebody and you're willing to kind of follow these tangents and ask dumb questions and get them to explain things and get them to kind of, particularly, I mean, I've done a lot of um, interviewing with people who have been interviewed many, many times too. Um, and trying to get somebody to say, okay, well, this is not the interview I've done a hundred times before. This is totally different. You know, how do yeah. I get beyond that? And part of that is just being really engaged. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think being curious is the number one attribute you need to have to be a documentary filmmaker. Um, but it's how you come up with the interesting stuff. I mean, it's all about trying to find out what interests you as a storyteller and then just sharing that in the film. Right. So you brought a little treat for us, right? Yeah, so um, I've been uh, mixing two films this week at Skywalker Ranch. So I flew down late last night, and I'm flying back in two hours. Uh, so I'm on two stages right now. I've been doing a Yo-Yo Ma film um, for four years. That's premiering at the Toronto Film Festival next month that we're mixing there, um, which is not the clip I'm going to show. But the other film uh, is a Keith Richards film I've been making um, that is also premiering at the Toronto Film Festival next month, which is why I'm not slept in a long time. Um, and it's very interesting going back between two stages, between Yo-Yo Ma and Keith Richards. Um, <laughs> but I'm just going to show you a clip of the Keith, the Keith film. Uh, it's called Under the Influence. It premieres, uh, it's going to be on Netflix starting next month, September 18th. It's going to go live on Netflix, so you can check it out. I've not shown a frame of this to anybody publicly, so you are the first. So don't film it with your iPhones, but uh, there's a little taste of Keith Richards under the influence. Okay, so, though, so I'm left thinking, like, when, I mean, Keith Richards, yeah, fascinating, sexy, weird, like, who wouldn't want to make or watch a documentary about him? Yeah. But when, uh, you know, uh, Clorox calls, mm -hmm. and Gary and I call you up and go, hey, you know, Clorox really um, wants to make something that makes them feel like they're part of the family. Um, would you like to do a documentary on bleach? <laughs> Like, how do you get excited about that? <laughs> or do you? I think you can get excited about anything. I mean, I'm one of those believers that if you, every day when I open the paper, and I've kind of done this as an exercise with people, and I've taught classes on this too, I'll go through the paper and we'll talk about how to make a documentary out of every story on the front page of the New York Times. You know, I'm really a believer that 
you know, everybody has a story. There are stories everywhere. It's just figuring out the angle into them. And, you know, what, again, what's the thing that's interesting about them? I, I'm actually, I'm interested in bleach, you know? So, <laughs> uh, there are all kinds of things about, you know, the world that company comes from, the world those individuals come from, yeah. you know, who are the characters there, um, what does it say about our country, and what does the need for bleach say about how we like to look in our society versus other countries, or, you know, there are all kinds yeah. of different ways of starting to think about a topic and thinking, you know, what's, what's interesting about this? Um, you know, I'm one of those people who believes there's, you know, when people say, oh, I need to think of an idea for my next documentary, I mean, I'm the opposite. I've like I've got a thousand ideas. You know, I just don't have enough years to make them all. But I I feel like there's never a shortage of interesting ideas. And so um, I mean, part of what's so great about doing um, branded content or commercials is, as a documentary filmmaker, you get a really awesome sandbox to play in. Mm. So um, and really, some of the things you know, the Keith Richards project. Um, was one of those that I don't think I would have done it had I not done some commercial work first. So we shot it on anamorphic prime lenses. Uh, Igor Martinovich, who shoots House of Cards, was the DP. Um, you know, shooting a documentary on anamorphic primes and all, you know, this is something that would have intimidated me before I got to really spend a lot of time playing with them on commercial work and then bring that back into my documentary work. So uh, I think it's, just a great way of yeah. flexing different muscles that you don't get to otherwise. And you know, I, I want to make sure that we leave some time for questions and answers. At the end, I just glimpsed at my phone and was like, okay, this is really fun, and now yeah. I've killed all our time. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's take a look at both of the next two clips in a row. I want to show the piece, that, uh, piece of work that you did for Bose. Yeah, I've done a few different pieces for Bose. I did a long form piece and a 50th anniversary piece, and I think this is just like a short um, Bose history yeah. spot. And then we'll roll right into yeah. the second piece, which is one of the ones that we've worked on together for Microsoft HoloLens. Yeah. Great. You will never make any more progress than what you can imagine. Albert Schweitzer who said, what is bad is not that man lives and dies, but what dies within man while he lives. The most important thing that dies within man while he lives is his imagination. The thing that keeps you creative is to never lose your imagination, always dream of things that are better and think about ways to reach those things. When you think about how you experience technology today, it's like behind this glass screen. We've unlocked the screen. Really what we're trying to do is break down the walls between you know, technology and people. This is the next generation of computing. This, this is the next PC. A hologram is made out of light, which ultimately allowed us to pour digital assets over the real world so that humans can essentially be entertained and be empowered to do things in, in brand new ways. That was science fiction, and now we're bringing it into science fiction. This is by far, far, far the hardest and most intriguing thing I've ever done in my life. When the other perspectives come to it and all the creatives out there, it's going to blow our minds. This is a new media we've just never had before. This is truly about seeing the world in a whole different way. So... <laughs> Thanks. You know, Microsoft is obviously being very careful um, about how they roll this product out to the world, but I don't think I will be, or either one of us will be disappeared if I share that this is kind of the tip of the spear, mm -hmm. that uh, Morgan is working on a number of different pieces of this project. And um, I'd like to hear what's unique about it yeah. and about the workflow that we've evolved together. Maybe coming back to that question you mentioned about the, um, the discomfort of some marketers about mm -hmm. the possibility that when they let you into the hen house, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to uh, actually find a story that is not a story that they want to tell. Uh, yeah. You know, these guys know very clearly the yeah. story that they want to tell. They do. I mean, it's been such an interesting experience. We came on to the Microsoft HoloLens project about nine months ago, 
and it was three months before announce. Nobody within the company really knew about it. It was top secret within Microsoft. And uh, you know, we we signed on to the project not even really knowing what it was. Yeah. We had a taste, but the the first moment we sat down with Alex Kitman, who's the, the really the inventor of Hololens, and he was so smart and brilliant, charming, philosophical, talking about art history, talking about philosophy. At the end of that one hour meeting, I said, I could make a whole film about this guy. I remember I said, we, he walked out of the room and I said, that was like talking to Steve Jobs. And you said, yeah. I think it was like talking to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he kind of looks like Jesus too, which helps. Um, so we've done a bunch of short videos. We're in the process of doing that. I know, um, you know, again, it's all part of trust. I know the marketing people might get a little nervous about things, but I think they've been incredibly happy with how things have turned out. And I, I guess it's not telling uh, stories out of school to talk about the other project we're doing them that kind of grew out of the short videos we're doing, which is um, Microsoft said, well, if you're doing all these short pieces, why don't you do a documentary about the five-year journey to create HoloLens? And so they commissioned us to do a long form documentary, which has been interesting. And on top of that, they said, and we want you to do exactly the film you want. Um, marketing's not gonna weigh in on this. So yeah. it's just for you. We'll see about that. Yeah, but at least right now, they said up front, give us exactly what your take is on this. Yeah. Uh, and so we've been working on that on top of everything else, which has been really interesting. Um, and really, when you get down to like, the Hololens story, is a story of brilliant people. I mean, these guys who were in the gaming department of Xbox who came up with this crazy idea and did it kind of under the radar. And, um, and it's, it's interesting to kind of tell an underdog story about Microsoft, but yeah. it is, you know. Um, and you get excited about it. I mean, I found it really interesting and just I mean, the first thing that struck me, you know, the first day when we went back to start production, the first thing we did was just sit down with people and we did audio interviews. We did that long, long day. Mm -hmm. We interviewed maybe 15 people. And the thing that blew me away was that they were incredibly smart, they were incredibly articulate, and they were incredibly passionate. They believed in this like Alex was Jesus and they were apostles. And, um, and just that passion to me was completely transfixing. As a filmmaker, you look for passionate subjects. Yeah. And in addition to being brilliant and articulate and everything else. So right there, I knew there was all the, all the dough we needed to make something really interesting. Yeah. So, and I would contend that yeah. I haven't uh, seen you work on anything yet, that you haven't actually found that passion somehow. I think you can sort of on virtually thing, everything. Maybe you can stump me someday, but. Yeah. So, I mean, I want to leave uh, time for a couple of questions if anybody has them for Morgan. I'll, I'll leave you with one, and you can just ask, you know, hey, um, does Keith Richards smoke two packs a day? Whatever you want. But uh, yes. the, um, the, the last the thing I want to point out that I think is really interesting to me that, um, is that uh, as marketers, often documentary comes, we often recommend it much further into the funnel when the consumer is engaged and you're talking to people that really want to know uh, for you know some aspect of the real story of the product um, with HoloLens what's really interesting mm -hmm. is we are at the front edge the very opening of the funnel because they needed to make the product real to even get people to be willing to engage in thinking about it and so it's been a fascinating journey to be like usually I'm way down the pipe from Chris Younger and Eric and Rebecca mm -hmm. doing you know all of their social media mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> You know, now we're... Well, and I think with a company like Microsoft, um, you know, they have a certain reputation and they seem like they're just that giant company in Redmond. And when you actually start doing these videos and realizing, no, these are passionate, smart, individual people who you can relate to and you completely understand. It's not like this product just shows up in a box and um, you don't understand everything that went into it. And when you realize the amount of sacrifice and work and mm -hmm. just sweat that went into making this, um, you, it's suddenly, it's not Microsoft, it's this team of people you identify with. I mean, I think it's, I, it's one of the things that completely changed my understanding of the company was just seeing, and I think the company has been changing too, and I think we're trying to reflect that, but showing that it's not, these companies aren't just a big black box, but yeah. that there are real 
smart, creative individuals inside them. So can we take a couple of questions? Yeah, does anybody have any? Um, actually, I got a two-parter. The first is, um, if you have any tips when you're working with a subject who's been media trained, getting them off message. <laughs> um, the other is, uh, how do you balance authenticity and wanting to go off on tangents with meeting a brand's needs? Uh, well, the first is, I mean, it's part, it's related to that idea of just being curious, but oftentimes I'll ask a lot of questions that I know they've never been asked, and they can be mundane questions, you know, that, you know, if they're talking about a certain subject, just start drilling down on, well, how did that happen, and what was your first day at work like, and tell me, you know, what do you tell your wife when you come home, and just get, dig, dig deeper and deeper until they start to break break from what they're trained. But the other thing is, you know, doing an interview is also a bit of doing a dance. And the subject reflects some of you back at them. So if you go in and you're telling funny stories, they'll tend to give you funny stories back. And if you give really personal stories, they'll tend to give you personal stories back. So there's, and that's just a basic human trait too. So I feel like the more, depending on what you're going for, the more kind of you set the tone of what you're wanting, the more you can get that back. Um, and occasionally, you know, you come across people who um, can't get away from that media training, but generally those are the worst interviews. I mean, I tend to find the people who are the highest up, the people who are run companies, the people that are stars, the people who uh, are the real originators, they've maybe had that media training, but they don't care about it anymore. They're beyond it. You know, they're, they're free to be who they who they want to be. It tends to be the people lower down in the food chain who are a little afraid and who hang on to that media training. Um, and sorry, the second part of the question was? Uh, it was um, about um, balancing the desire oh, to go off on tangents. With tangents. The brand well, and part of it is just time, too. So, um, you know, rather than trying to get somebody to say something, you know, we had, I've had these discussions many times on times on commercial jobs, and people want people to use very specific language. And I'll try as many times as I can to get them to say it as they want to say it. And at the end of the day, if we can't get that, then you know I can go back and try and get them to say specific language. But I'd much rather um, have people speak from the heart, speak genuinely. And, and part of that is just um, spending time with them. You know, like I don't like to do short interviews. Um, you know, that can eat up a lot of time. But if I do a one or two hour interview, that's that's good. Even if I only end up with thirty seconds worth of material at that interview, I mean, I do that all the time. And in fact, I also throw away a lot of interviews. Um, a film like Best of Enemies, you know, we shot thirty five interviews and we threw out twenty. Um, and great people. I interviewed Noam Chomsky and Gore Vidal and all these people, and I didn't use those interviews. Um, I think you have to be really disciplined about that. Um, but that's part of the kind of casting process people don't talk about in documentary, too, but just figuring out who the best voices are um, and sticking with those voices. I was going to point out, yeah. too, we also evolved that process of the pre-interview, mm -hmm. which gives you more time with the subject. And I've noticed that you will sometimes seed terminology that you want them to use in a way yeah. because you can when you're talking to them beforehand. Yeah. And then we also um, typically will have a creative director or you know uh, wh whomever um, watching a mock script that we've written beforehand. And Morgan has been very gracious about coming back and he, after he gets what he um, all of the stuff that yeah. he's magical about getting, he'll come back to the green room to the video village and go, okay, what else? And then we can go, yeah, you really yeah. didn't get the story of the bleach, so. But sometimes, even looking at the Bruce Springsteen interview from 20 Feet, that was the last interview we shot for that film. And I knew I needed certain things. And that's one of those things where beforehand, you're just kind of chatting. And I laid out a lot of those ideas in the mm -hmm. pre-interview yeah. with him. And then he spat them back with his beautiful, eloquent, <laughs> in his beautiful, eloquent, poetic way. And it was great. And certain people are good at that and do that. Um, so part of that is keeping it casual. Even if you have an agenda, never show the agenda to the person. Another thing is um, I never look at questions. You know, I write questions. I have pages of questions. We sometimes show questions to the interview subject beforehand, depending. 
But when I'm in an interview, I never look at questions because to me, it's not an interrogation, it's a conversation. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Matt, Morgan, thank you, guys. Thank you. I think one of the great uh, one of the great quotes you had, Morgan, in the pieces you captured, right? You'll never make more progress than what you can imagine. And right now, I can imagine coming and seeing you later to do a one-hour documentary on me. Dude, you're a brilliant storyteller and maker, and I'm sure everybody else here feels the same. So thank you for spending your time with us, and good luck with that travel back up north, my friend. And good reference to catfishing, dude. Jeez, that's a, I don't know who your sales out show, but that's, that's a great show. Uh, all right, let's keep rolling. Next up, technology. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Pixability or Rob. He's actually got a really interesting background. Um, I actually asked Rob today to talk about layer three switching and building out operational network stacks. So stick around for, oh, actually Rob's gonna talk about something else, but you have a deep background there. Uh, actually, we have a little, little uh, animation to intro Rob before I go any further. Yes. Nice cut to that, nice fade away. Uh, Rob is the CMO of Pixability, which is a leading platform for managing YouTube campaigns, yet today is putting real context to tack, tack in the data behind the scenes to actually bring action. And he's gonna kind of deliver this in a case study format. So thank you, Rob, for making it uh, easy for us layman's here to digest exactly how tech and data influencers operate. So is Rob here to come on up on stage right now? Yes, he is. Come on down, Rob. Thank you. Okay, I want to get a sense of who's in the room. Okay, so how many brands do we have here? Excellent, I'll be talking to you as well. Agencies, creators, okay, and other, and other interesting people. Okay, cool, so we'll cover, we'll cover all that. So let's, let's dive in. Did you guys get me the clicker too? Clicker? There it is. you perfect all right so uh, I don't want to bore you guys with a bunch of presentations so we're we're in the YouTube advertising business we're a tech firm in the advertising business and I can bore you with a lot of product slides I'm, I'm gonna do some of that uh, but I'll talk around it but you know our whole game is really using data we've been at this game of YouTube for over five years We've seen everything, we've seen every trend, we've seen everything else, but you know, as we build into this, what, you're gonna, what we're gonna talk about is really the importance of technology and advertising. And who asked the question earlier about advertising? Somebody was complaining about advertising. I don't wanna see ads. No, you don't wanna see ads that suck, okay? You wanna see ads that are relevant to you. And one of the things that we see quite a bit are ads that, you know, frankly, just don't, that just don't work. So I'm not gonna bore you with the stuff we serve a lot of the big brands and a lot of the agencies. The YouTube world and the video marketing world is changing quite a bit. So when you look at media, you can't just go online anymore and just buy some media. There's a whole science behind it. We're gonna talk, talk about that today. So we have two sides of the equation. We have the creators, and they get a lot of the attention. They're doing some amazing stuff. As we heard earlier, the creators have a lot of credibility. And then we have the advertisers, the brands and the agencies trying to sync up with the creators. And that is not an easy task. What happens is, well, let me go after XYZ because he or she has all the views, and that might not be the best thing for you. So how many channels are active on YouTube? Give me, give me a guess. 500,000. Anybody want to top that? 10 million is too high. 2.6 million are active, regular uploads of content. 
lots of videos. Do the math. So which ones matter to your brand and which ones play? So what we're going to talk about for the next 10 or so minutes is really about connecting them all. So the challenge, as you see with advertising, is time. It can be quite difficult. Risk, and there's always risk with advertising. That's why a lot of people stick with TV, because they feel, still feel there's risk in digital and on YouTube. And that's, that couldn't be more wrong. We're going to talk about some great, great campaigns. I will have some video, too. All right, let's talk about Puma. Anybody a Puma customer? Some great stuff. They're doing some wonderful things. So Puma had an active worldwide audience, especially when it comes to soccer and European football. So what they were looking at is they wanted to look at three things. They had a launch, they had a campaign with Arsenal, and they had, a, they had basically a rebranding campaign going on. And when they spoke with their agency, the whole thing was they were going to bet on YouTube. And they needed to know where to begin. So let's talk a little bit about their first, their first ad. And we're going to talk about advertising on YouTube to start off with. Phil, let's queue up. Let's do about you know, 15 seconds of this vid. Call all troublemakers for danger, risk, and potential fugitive Note status. Note the elements of the video. Obedience will be discouraged. Impatience rewarded. Let's stop there for a minute. So, over the years, one of the things that we're often faced with is somebody comes to Pixabilly and they say, hey, here's an ad that worked great on TV. Can you put it on YouTube and do amazing things? No. <laughs> okay, so well, what about Super Bowl ads? They do great. Th those aren't ads, that's entertainment. Okay, so those of you with a TV mentality, you bring it to your digital world, don't expect great things to happen. So with this particular ad and everything else, you know, what you're doing is with the journey, guide your audience on the journey. I oftentimes ask audiences, I asked this last year, I'll ask it again, what do you do after you watch a YouTube video? You watch another one. Marketers, are you listening? We're talking mind share here. This is a big deal. Guide them on their journey. So as you lay out your video ad, help them do something. And I'm going to show some amazing stats in just a moment. So when you look at the, at the video world, I'm not going to go through the technical details, but the reality is there are lots of options out there. Now, for advertisers, you may think, well, if I'm in a specific business, we were dealing with a consumer packaged goods company. And they said, hey, our audience is watching sports. No, their audience of 18 to 34 year old males were watching gaming videos. So everything you know about, you have to know where your audience is. Don't assume just because you have a product, you're looking for the product. Go where your audience is hanging out and deliver the value proposition there. So when we look at campaigns, determine where your audience is hanging out. And then take a look specifically, what are they reacting to? And again, this is, I'm showing some of the technology here. We're crunching a lot of data. We're crunching terabytes of data to place one ad. So analyzing everything. Again, all your assumptions, all your assumptions from linear, all your assumptions from print, and all your assumptions from 12 different people in surveys aren't just going to cut it anymore. It is a lot of data to analyze. What's the competitive environment? So on the left, we look at share of voice. We analyzed the beauty industry last year, and we just, you know, we did it again this year. But last year, we found that the brands themselves had 3% share of voice. The creators had 97% share. They were much more believable. And when you analyze, you have to determine what's my share of voice, what's my competitive share of voice, and tie that all together and look at real-time trending. The tools that are out there aren't necessarily sophisticated. Okay, so running and doing enterprise grade workflow, if you're gonna do a YouTube campaign, it might not be one campaign, it may be hundreds of sub campaigns. So there's a good deal of sophistication. So I wanna get through the tech here and then get to the meat. So with every campaign, it's in real time. Things, especially in the YouTube world, and we're also starting to see in the Facebook world, is things are changing dynamically. What's well, hot today might not be hot tomorrow. So you can't, when you start looking at advertising, you have to take a look at it in such a way that it's going to change daily so you can't just walk away from it. So let's talk about the cycle. 
you're going to create content that's good. And what we're talking about is advertising and what we say paid amplification. Okay, this is really important because in order to get great organic, it's all going to tie together. Organic amplification, you know, the usual stuff, we're not going to go into it here, you know, things like SEO. But ultimately, you're doing them right, you're getting engagement. We still see a lot of organizations treat YouTube as, let me dump some stuff there. Your YouTube audience engages. They're going to interact with you, interact back. Okay, those comments that we hear about that are terrible, you've got to respond. Your result is going to be better targeting once you look at your engagement statistics and you're going to get the SEO benefits. So you're paid, owned, and earned feed off each other. And if there's a takeaway here, when you look at YouTube, the effect of a YouTube paid strategy on organic ultimately is dramatic. So with Puma, so Puma's challenge, product launches, rebranding, and then new packages with a lot of their European football. Let's, let's roll what happened with Puma. In July 2014, global sports brand Puma and the renowned Arsenal Football Club launched the biggest brand partnership deal in the history of either organization. Three brand new Puma football kits worn by Arsenal players. To spread the news and promote sales of the new football kits worldwide, Puma turned to YouTube's passionate football community. Through an analysis of YouTube's social data, the brand was able to identify 4 million YouTube videos popular with its target audience of international male football fans ages 7 to 34. Software focused that list to 120,000 specific video placements selected by the highest number of football fan comments, shares, likes and views. With data driving its placements, Puma launched its Arsenal pre-roll campaign on YouTube in 25 countries and 9 key languages. After just six weeks, Puma's historic YouTube ad campaign delivered over 3.5 million views from a highly engaged 89% male audience. 53% of viewers went on to watch additional content on Puma's this channel after seeing an Arsenal ad. Puma's campaign accounted for 4.5 million minutes of video watch time and 393 million impressions. Thousands of YouTube community members liked and shared Puma's Arsenal videos and subscribed to the brand's YouTube channel. The rise in audience engagement attributable to the campaign was impressive, with 271% increased likes, 2,315% increased comments, 3,293% increased shares, 596% increased views, and 396% more minutes watched on Puma's channel. Puma leveraged YouTube's social data to attract and engage a specific community on YouTube and the Arsenal campaign emerged as Puma's top performing campaign of all time. So for those of you who are on the fence, I can't share the product numbers that came out of this. For those of you on the fence, these new YouTube campaigns perform amazingly well. The statistic that you saw, so those of you who were skeptical about ads, on this campaign, we had a 53% follow-on watch rate. They went and watched organic content. On another campaign, 63%. So it goes back to targeting. It goes back to relevant content. So for those of you looking at, hey, is this going to work for me? It absolutely does, and we see this all the time. So again, you know, going through this, and I'm, as I wrap up here, I'm going to take some questions. Targeting, dynamic campaigns, YouTube, and guide, guide them on their journey. When you bring them back to your page or your YouTube channel, give them relevant content. They're going to stick around. We've seen instances, and by the way, when they come back to you, you may have paid for the ad, but when they come back to your channel, you may get you know, 10 free views for all the other videos. So it really makes, it really makes a big difference. 61%. The views themselves, what we found from paid, unlike other campaigns where you do paid, and the campaign ends and you're back to where you started. On YouTube, you run a campaign, you've actually increased your number of subscribers. And it tends to build upon, it tends to build upon itself. So again, what we've been able to prove, not just with Puma, but with other brands, again, effective advertising using technology performs you know, incredibly well. 
and all the data is here. So if you want more information, I'm going to take some questions. We oftentimes analyze how brands perform. Uh, we just released this in conjunction with YouTube about two weeks ago to say, hey, what's the trending right now? And what we're starting to see is, is for the first time, especially over the past 18 months, we're starting to see brands take and their agencies take the advertising a lot more seriously and pour a lot more, a lot more juice on it. Okay, so that's a quick run through. I'm going to be around all day if there's more questions. Again, we didn't want to bore you too much, but you know, the takeaway, obviously, is that the YouTube advertising game works. It works effectively well. Needs a little bit of technology juice, but the results can be absolutely stunning. And I would argue nothing better these days than this. Okay, question. How many... All right, thank you. All righty. The, um, you know, it's funny, actually, Rob, hearing you speak. Uh, there's that saying, right, if uh, a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a noise? And when I think about brands and continuity on YouTube with influencers, if there isn't continuity, is your brand actually awareness being generated and built? So having that connection and continuity that Pixel is talking about, I think is a lot of common sense, but practice very little. So something you guys should definitely look into deeper and checking those uh, connector points through that. All right, let's keep moving. Uh, we got a fancy little animation, I think. I'm not gonna, let's do it. A little sound. Great. Wow, bravo. All right, so guys, on the, uh, it's not just Phantom. So we wanted to actually do one panel session to talk a little bit about the business. We're reading about some of these acquisitions that are taking place. Uh, you know, 200 million was just taken down by Vox and by BuzzFeed this last week in terms of funding in this space with influencers. We're constantly hearing about things going in with other partners are dealing with. I wanted to bring some people up here that looked at it from a couple of different lenses just to keep us knowledge of what's going on in the business space. What's our brand represent in this business space? What exactly is going on with consumers and how they're interacting in that market stack? So let's take a pause. Let's look at the business modeling influencers, media and acquisition and hoping this next model can actually match the substance with all the excitement in the influencer space. So please welcome up here, first and foremost, Jim Lauterbach. Is Jim here? Ready to go? Excellent. My biggest fan, uh, Jim, I'm a huge fan of yours. He's uh, industry track curator at VidCon. So if anyone, who, by the way, who's gone to VidCon? Anyone go to VidCon this year? A great, great event too. Jim is actually the brain trust behind the business tracks there. He's also a brand strategist for WooChat. Uh, is that right? Watch it. Watch it. Thank you. Uh, Vincent, <laughs> principal of Eisenberg Group of Media, is also part of the ION team, as well as John Roth, who's an executive director, uh, long career in funding and acquisitions, and moderated by our very own Jay Beige, who's part of the A-List Daily. So guys, take it away. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so you gave a show of hands, right? Um, and, and it seems like a lot of people here has been to... Uh, to VidCon, but it's really the manifestation of the fandom uh, that's going on in this space. And uh, we actually did shoot some some stuff from there uh, last year. So if you, for those of you who haven't attended, hopefully this captures uh, a little bit of that uh, excitement. <laughs> are really the new rock stars. Uh, totally. It's really exciting to be there, but I think you've been there uh, before you joined on last year to curate the industry track almost every year since it started, right? Yeah, I've been to everyone. I, I did an online video company called Revision 3, which we sold to Discovery, and uh, 
we went to the first one. We sponsored every subsequent one. I think I spoke at every one except the first one. So, yeah, I've been, and it's, that was the sixth VidCon that just happened a couple weeks ago. So what are your main takeaways from this year, except for it you know, almost doubling every year or something like that, right? Yeah, well, for those of you who haven't been to VidCon, what was new at VidCon this year is they've always, it's always been a fan. It's been designed to get communities and creators together. 15,000 fans, you saw a lot of them there, went to go meet their favorite YouTubers and, get, and sign, but also to hang out with each other. So it's very much of a community thing across the board. Um, there's been an industry component to it, uh, very much around the uh, online video industry, and that grew to 3,000 people this year from 2000 last year. That's the part that I ran. And there was a new track for creators, for people who weren't necessarily full-time uh, video creators, but wanted to learn how to make videos, how to work with brands, how to think about it, how to get better. 3,000 people there, too. So I thought, first of all, it was really interesting that we had a lot of great, a lot of people show up that want to be in this space, or that are already doing it and want to be better, which I think is awesome. But you know, one of the main takeaways for me at this year's VidCon was, first of all, there, it's not just YouTube world anymore. There are all these different platforms that, and ways for people to reach audiences that you need to be concerned about. And I started thinking about each of these new platforms, or even some older platforms, as video formats, right? So YouTube owns some really good video formats. They own music videos, they own vloggers, and a couple of other things. But think about Facebook. Facebook is starting to own this video format that maybe doesn't have a, a VO track. Maybe it's just visual that you watch mobile, that you kind of serendipitously roll across. You don't go out and search for, but it just shows up and you start looking at it. Snapchat, very different format. There's like little nine second chunks or less that people build into stories. Instagram is its own format. We saw Periscope, Meerkat. Um, you now is another live streaming company that I think is doing really interesting things. It's its own video format. So in many ways, these platforms are the way we used to think about formats in the past, like comedies and dramas and westerns and, and things like that. So that I think was really fascinating that and that the people who are really good at one format or one platform aren't necessarily the ones who are good at others. Some people cross over, some people don't. But for a brand, I think it's really important that you understand and work with all these different formats, uh, these different platforms, because your audience is across all of them. Right. Now, I think, I mean, it's an amazing space, and I want to bring you guys into the, to the conversation, too. Uh, Vincent, I mean, if you look at it, uh, from you know, wearing your hat as the head of media at Eisenberg too. I mean, uh, we saw 3,000 people, or is it 2,500, 3,000 3,000 creators, 3,000 industry, 15,000 fans. Yeah. So 21,000 total. Yeah, so I mean, it's grown a lot. Uh, why, why this industry inter uh, interest in, in, in this space too? Well, it's really all about understanding how to reach consumers in new ways. Now, some of the core objectives of of uh, brands connecting with consumers haven't changed, but it's about understanding this, this broadcast agnostic style or, or environment in which um, we now live in. It's understanding how to better connect and, and understanding that the age old techniques of engaging in a monologue type of approach with consumers just don't work anymore. It's really about understanding how to connect with them in new ways and, and using social natives to communicate and connect in a social native way to their social native audience. Right. And that's so what that's becoming a really sense. important media vehicle you're seeing, you know, with clients and stuff too. That Absolutely. Is it's, it's in our eyes, a mandatory part of the new media ecosystem. It, it's a combination. I, I'm not saying that you throw out old conventional media altogether, but it's now about in, encouraging or engaging clients and, and, and letting them know that there's a new form of media that needs to be a mandatory part of the media mix. Right. And, and John, uh, taking your, the investor angle on this, uh, you know, the corporate development uh, angle, you know, why, we've seen a lot of money shifting into this space. So why are investors so interested in, in investing in this? Because they do invest in future growth, right? And some of these right. platforms and companies and stuff like that might not really be that profitable yet. Um, they're investing in a, a number of different things, including sort of the seismic shift in what type of content consumers want, particularly on the youth audience side. I think when we look back at the MCN space, and you take a look at the Maker Studios deal, and everybody's asking questions, you know, why would Bob Iger pay all that money, or why would he do that? <clears throat> you know, to, to some extent, the history of M&A and the history of investment in the online world has always been the old guard you know, buying the new DNA right. and making buy decisions versus build decisions or investment decisions. So I think we've seen an incredible amount of media money 
flowing uh, from older groups, Warner Brothers, RTL, you name it, mm -hmm. um, definitely the Disney folks, you know, into these newer forms of content. And to Jim's point, you know, they're, they come from a DNA where <clears throat> they understand these very narrow vertical channels. And we heard it earlier in the day today that, you know, the TV guys are pulling their hair out or whatever based on the fact that they, they don't understand this, you know, gazillion channel cross-platform world. And, you know, generally, if you look at the history of mergers and acquisition and investment, particularly strategic investment, uh, people will buy over build when they don't have the DNA and they'll inject the DNA. And I think, you know, getting back to the maker deal, that's what Disney was doing. You know, they said, we get this form of media, we've dominated this form of media, we don't have that DNA here. It's a small amount of money for us to pay to get an audience. You know, we all recall that, you know, the WhatsApp deal that went into Facebook, um, if people didn't know the numbers, WhatsApp had 10 million in revenue and something like 138 million in losses, right. but 450 million users. And Mark Zuckerberg's quote on that deal was, anybody who's built that much of an engaged audience that fast is incredibly valuable to us when asked, right. how do we make money off of it? So circling back around to you, what's the rationale? It's engaged audiences. Yeah. I want to open it up to questions, but uh, one, one more thing that I'm interested in to hear uh, from you is, you know, you curated the industry track, but did you learn something new that you weren't expecting uh, from listening to all the speakers and, and, and everyone that you, you put there on stage? Yeah, look, I think um, in part it was the platform stuff that I think was really interesting. But also, I, you know, I, and when I thought about crafting the industry track, I wanted to bring more folks from brands and from agencies and more investors as well. And as I started pulling those threads together, you know, I, I started realizing that there were brands that were way far ahead of where I thought they would be. Right. Uh, and like Rob was just was talking about what he's seeing from Pixability and what people are doing. And the ways that people are engaging with audiences using the new tools on YouTube and other ways and driving real results for brands, I was very, very encouraged by. So we had a um, secret deodorant in 11th Gore just did a case study. It was fascinating what they've been able to do with these like wonderful, uh, two wonderful creators from Alabama. And um, I'd had uh, um, Mountain Dew came up and showed what they did with the launch of their, their new energy drink. And what they were able to do with Snapchat around the Super Bowl was really interesting. And then um, the way a lot of brands are starting to embrace it as well. So David Beebe from Marriott is recreating that brand, building a content company inside of Marriott. I was fascinated by uh, and Purina as well. I know what Purina has been doing because I worked with Rick there a little bit when I was at Revision 3 slash Discovery. But just, I think, I think many brands and agencies are a lot further along than I even thought they were right. and doing really creative things. So good job, everybody's doing that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> good to reach out to the audience there. Okay, so let's, uh, do we have any questions here for anyone? Otherwise, I got a ton here, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it You know going. what, I want to riff a little bit on what you were talking about, if you don't mind. Sure. On, um, the way that, uh, and, and saw this at Revision 3 and Discovery, I see it more and more now, is that, you know, it, particularly for the, so the, the fans that show up at VidCon are basically between 13 and 23 years old. Very much Gen Z with, you know, the tail end of Gen Y. And they look at these creators, and we saw this when we were doing Dignation at Revision 3, is they're not, they're not on a pedestal, they're, they're friends. It's a friend base. Exactly. And it's very much that to work with those communities effectively, and this is why I was really, really pleased to see a lot of brands doing this well, is it's not just like diving into the community and scattershotting like a shotgun, a bunch of messaging and diving out. The ones that I think do it really well, I'd be interested in what you think, were the ones that come into the community and want to be members of that community and want to bring things to that community or allow the community to do things or go places they couldn't otherwise do. And they go in with a commitment to be part of that for, you know, I won't say forever because nothing's forever, but really they want to be part of it long term. I don't know if you're seeing that as well, but. It's, it's all about long-term engagement. Yeah. So it's really taking the best of CRM marketing and applying it to influencers. And then also taking a step back as a brand, which is a risky proposition, but then knowing that the best way to engage, with, uh, engage an audience is to have, let others do the talking on your behalf. Right. Others that they respect, you gotta they care go, about, right? and yeah. you got to let go. And, and how hard is that? It's extremely hard. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 brand marketers are wired to not let go and be control freaks. So it's really about this new age of, of, of marketing where you've got to take a step back and trust that things will, things will work out the way you want it to. You know, Jim, to add to what Benson is saying, and it's, it's, they've got to get used to the generational shift. And we've all 
yeah. read about millennials and the recasting of what millennials are like or like this. And Generation Z has its own characteristics. And that generation was, and I was at VidCon too, I mean, it was incredible, the buzz, the intensity coming from those kids at VidCon, the, the fans who were also you know, peers with the creators. You know, I, I just think it's, it's more of a question of the brands really looking at it like, we've got a new audience type here. And to Vincent's point, we can't control them. They won't be controlled. We have to let them do what they organically would like to do. And as brands, we have to integrate our messages with, with what kind of content they want to consume. Yeah, it's about taking a step yeah. back and basically enjoying the ride. And, right. And yeah. if you have a really strong social community, then that community will actually act as your police. They will actually mm -hmm. ensure that everything is on message. And, and, that's it, and that's what the beauty of this is all about. You know, it was another interesting just reflection. I mean, I was thinking about um, having done this for a while. And there are some early creators in the YouTube space who you know, got really big early on and still have big audiences, but you know, they're six, seven years into it and they're kind of flattening out a little bit or maybe they're you know, declining a little bit and there are a lot of new creators that are coming up. But I think there's this big opportunity for a lot of these early on creators who got big on YouTube and have been doing it for six or seven or eight years who maybe are looking to expand what they do or maybe looking to do a little bit less of that. Or you know, there's an opportunity to work with some of these folks in ways that you might not have been able to three years ago. Two or three years ago, some of these creators would have been like, I need millions of dollars or whatever. And now they're probably a lot more open to, let's work together on some of this stuff. And because uh, I need to reinvent myself a little bit too. Right. So I don't know if you guys have seen that at all, but I think that's a, it's really interesting to see what does a YouTube, what does a YouTube star who's been doing it for eight years do when they're you know, not the new kid on the block anymore? They're not the big shiny new thing. Right. And I think, you know, Vince, you have been talking about this beacon to connect too, right? And the importance for brands to, to actually you know, put their hand up and say, hey, come and talk to us. You know, mention, you know, here's what we can provide to you guys to help you create better content, right? A absolutely, and that's part of um, an intense discovery process. We call it finding your brand soulmates and personifying the brands and, and, and the talent and ensuring the perfect match between the two. But that process also involves finding people who are authentic. Sometimes it involves finding people who are already advocates for your brand, and in that sense, they will actually go out and, and engage with their audiences with minimal incentives. They just want to be discovered. They want to be acknowledged by the brands that they love, and then, then they're off and running. All right. You know, that, I think it was last year here we were talking about uh, how you know, the, the, the top 100 creators are, are really difficult to work with, but there's that big open space between like 100 and 1,000 that are a great white space to work with. And I wonder, did, are we still seeing that? Is that still a, a absolutely. huge Absolutely, I mean, with the emergence of, of the A-list YouTube celebrities and celebrities on other social content platforms, there's a lot of people who aspire to be them. Yeah. So those are the people that if you get earlier on, you can engage with them in, with the CRM style, style of approach that I mentioned. Right. It's very similar to what Nike does with their, um, their grassroots type of approach where they give sneakers away to students in high school. Uh, hoping that one of those students will be the next LeBron and will be receptive to, to signing on with them as a major endorsement deal. Right. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. So another question. Yeah. One over here. Yeah. Can you guys give an example of a brand that has kind of let go and let the creators do something with it and been successful with that? Um, I, I'm, to I'm to happy to. I mean, I think you look at um, like 11th Gorgeous and Secret. They let go and really let them do it. I think um, you look at Purina is doing this. Um, I think Marriott's doing a good job of getting in and working with brands. We did a lot of work with um, Budweiser at Revision 3, and it was a struggle, but they let go and have done some really interesting things along those lines. Um, Taco Bell, I think, has done a really good job letting go. Kia um, also. Um, so there are brands, I think if you look at what these guys have done on YouTube that have really helped in that way. And, you know, I think, um, anyway, that, that's just an example. I'm sure you guys have others. Yeah. yeah, and if you look at the new style of um, social content formats that are based on live stream, that really is about brands taking a leap of, leap of faith and letting go because there's no real censorship there. And I was on um, Periscope the other day, and I believe it was Southwest who has an ambassador that's on there where... They do it in such a way where it's so integrated 
only a trained eye or a marketer could tell that it's, it's part of a brand integration, but it's about a live stream where this, this um, stewardess talks about her, her experience on, on Southwest, the, where she travels all around the country and how it's a, such a great company to work with, but in a very implied way. And that to me is an example of letting go because in a live stream environment, you really can't control what's being said. Yeah, I think we're uh, all out of town. A lot of time. So, time uh, in town, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. out of town. I actually heard that we were, uh, yeah. Ailey Summit was uh, trending on Twitter in, in town. There we go. Oh, so yeah. thanks you all for, for tweeting. You, no. And uh, all right, we're out. Thanks. Jim, Jay, Vince, and John, thank you thank guys. You. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Let's keep things moving, moving along. Thank you. So uh, our next session here uh, with uh, Michelle and Marcello uh, is actually an interesting one I'm looking forward to hearing more about. Uh, you're kind of on one hand, you have a brand, Ipsy and Glam Bag, that has over 1 million subscribers, is generating over 100 million in annual revenue. For the gaming people here, it sounds like uh, World of Warcraft for makeup. And at the same time, for the Ipsy Open Studio, it's a community mentoring platform for empowering beauty content creators and more. Really sounds like uh, something that's making what the future is for, for TV and movie studio modeling and talent. So there's two really interesting dynamics happening in terms of the business and platform that they've developed and really the power behind it. And at the heart of that is actually, if any of you have watched Michelle's content or any of her past interviews, uh, what I probably like most about it is actually her humble and genuine approach to the craft uh, and her passion about it. So that actually goes a long distance for me when learning about businesses and their approach to it. So in general, really good people. So let's invite two good people here on stage to join us today. Please come on down and welcome Michelle Fawn, founder of Ipsy, and much, much more, as well as Marcelo Cambria, CEO and co-founder of Ipsy. Come on now, folks. Thank you so much for watching. See you on my next video. <laughs> um, thanks, everybody. Um, so let's get started right from the beginning, right? Hi. Happy hunting. <laughs> so I, I wanted to ask a very quick question, actually. How That's oh okay. I see a lot of guys. All right. I see you. I see you. It's probably different than uh, than what we think of. Well, I mean, the foundation of the word itself, ipsy, is derived from the Latin word um, having a sense of self, herself, himself, ourself, and that word was really the inspiration be t um, behind really uh, the community that I've been a part of for so long since uh, 2007 when I uploaded my first YouTube video. Um, and I had hundreds and hundreds of comments from women all over the world requesting for advice on uh, specific needs, whether it's skin, um, hair, uh, makeup, and so forth. And being only one person, I couldn't really answer all their questions. And so um, Ipsy was really born from this need. Um, and from there, you know, we um, originally when we launched, you know, we were just a beauty subscription bag service. But now we've evolved so much more than that. And Marcelo, like, feel free to jump in. Um, Ipsy is now like a, a multifaceted beauty platform. I mean, we offer so much more than just beauty sampling. We reach to over 20 million women who um, want to learn about beauty and they want to be part of this amazing community. And we ship uh, out over 1.5 million bags and uh, with every month we get over a million reviews, uh, beauty reviews from all of these uh, people who are very engaged and they wanna, they, they're so hungry to learn more about beauty and to really discover new products. And part of that conversation also leads with content. So um, when we were developing Ipsy, um, we knew how important content was because content is king. You know, you have so many platforms out there, but all those platforms, they need content that's very specific to that platform, whether it's Twitter, um, Instagram, YouTube. And so YouTube, we were very focused on it because when you think about makeup and you want to learn about makeup, it's very, very visual. Um, and I also, myself as a creator, I know that it's easier for me to learn um, using a visual method, but um, for someone who wants to learn more about makeup, like if 20 years ago, if, if a woman wanted to go and learn about how to do a smoky eye, she'd either have to go to a beauty counter or and buy products or go and pay for a beauty seminar. 
But today, I mean, it's free and it's so accessible. A woman could learn how to do her makeup in her bedroom if she wanted to. And so this is what really Ipsy was really about is just having a more intimate dialogue and conversation and building this relationship with an audience that's very, very engaged in beauty. And how, how does this parallel, you know, I, I know you well now, Michelle, and um, you know, even in the last three years or four years since we met, um, or is it five years now? It's crazy, but um, you, you, you've changed so much. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how your, you know, um, your transition from being, you know, in, in Florida uh, to coming to LA and how you see yourself, your career evolving and, um, and how that parallels a little bit what we're doing at Ipsy. And this was five years ago when I moved out to LA. 2010, and um, even during that time, a lot of people didn't weren't really educated in what social media was. Um, they, they called it new media, when today it's technically just media. That's what social media is, it's media. Um, and they didn't know what an influencer was, and so there was a lot of education. And, and the reason why I decided to move out to LA was because I knew that all of the agencies were out here, all the brands, the production company. I mean, really, if you wanted to uh, do something in the media or entertainment business, you go to LA. And so it made a lot of sense for me to come out here. And when I came out here, I was able to meet with Marcelo. And I told him, yo, like, I have this amazing YouTube channel and I have millions of, of followers and it's great, but I know this is not sustainable. I know it, just, it doesn't just stop at YouTube. There's so much more that I could do. And there's so much more that needs to be done. And I'd love to do, I'd love to create a business. And I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be so much more than just a YouTuber. And Marcelo and I, we uh, came up with the idea of Ipsy. And 2011, we launched it, end of 2011. And please, Marcelo, interject if, <laughs> if you want to tell them how many bags we sold out within Sure, yeah, we, we sold out. I think you, you, you put your video up and we sold out in like 30 minutes. Uh, 7,500 bags, our first 7,500 subscribers. And, <laughs> and we were packing it at Marcelo's house. Like it was a true startup. And, and so um, you mentioned Crate and, and what you do is a lot more than um, be in front of a camera. Um, what, what do you think, you know, a, a lot of people in the audience I think wanna figure out how to work with influencers. What is an influencer? What's the difference between an influencer, a celebrity, and maybe a creator, or what you consider yourself? Well, we can start with um, the one that most people already know, celebrities. I mean, celebrities are very talented people who um, play characters or they perform and they're entertainers. And they really are in their own category and they've been in that category for so long. But since really the birth of the internet and all these emerging platforms, when they emerge, like YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and so forth, um, you influencers started to really make a, a huge impact um, in, in the digital space because now you have like two tiers of talent or creators, if you want to call them that. You have the celebrities who are almost like the untouchables, you know, almost like gods and goddesses. And then you have influencers who are almost like your best friend or big sister, big brother, someone that you know, someone that you want to have a relationship with or you know you can talk to that person. Um, and these are the people I truly believe are the ones who are really revolutionizing uh, the media landscape. and it's all through the power of truly like empowerment. Like a lot of these influencers are just naturally talented. They might have never have had a chance to make it in Hollywood, but with these platforms like YouTube and Instagram and Snapchat and Periscope and Meerkat and Vine, I mean, I can keep going on. You have these stars who are, who are using this platform to build their following and to convey their message and vision. And it's such a powerful tool, but Again, I want to say that it just doesn't, it doesn't stop from there. There's so much more, and this is why I'm really excited to talk to you guys about really like, at this point, is it just about social media, or can we start building businesses and bringing something, um, bringing more ideas and bringing them to life? And, and so, between, okay, so between an influencer and a celebrity, I have a clear idea. How, how you've talked to me a lot about kind of the difference between a creator and an influencer, and wh how would you define that? Well, celebrity, or, you mean influencer and a creator? And a creator, yeah. So an influencer today is almost like the models, you know, like they're, or the talent. Um, they're the people who are very talented at what they do, whether it's looking good or being funny or making jokes or, and the list goes on. And then you have the creators who are very special. They have talent, but they also have um, that drive and ambition. You know, they're just naturally motivated to work 
um, and to think and to come up with new ideas and to experiment. And these are the people I really believe um, you guys as brands should really approach because they're the ones who are just constantly thinking about the next thing that they can upload rather than just doing the same thing over and over again. And that's not, a, I'm, I'm not trying to like say, say anything bad about that. I'm just saying there is a clear difference between a creator and an influencer. Um, and the creators are the ones I truly believe are going to be the future leaders and entrepreneurs of, of, of tomorrow. Great. Um, I don't know if, do you guys have the video that we were going to play? I don't know if we can play it. Yes, um, so, so maybe before we play it, um, well, let's just play it, actually. <laughs> so, so eight years ago, I uploaded my first video using only a webcam and a simple editing program on my laptop. Fast forward to today, things have definitely changed. I want to introduce you to Ipsy OS. This is not your normal studio. It was inspired by your hunger to create. Throughout the eight years, I learned how to shoot, how to edit, how to light myself. Most importantly, I learned how to bring my imagination to life. Now, with all this knowledge and experience, I want to pass it on to you. It's not about the fancy cameras, the editing program, collaborating with others, having access to all these beauty events, but the main purpose of Ipsy OS. So we want this to be a safe haven for you to do what you do best, create. All the support a beauty creator would want when starting out now starts here. Guess what the best part is? No strings attached. You have 100% control of all the content you shoot here. We're not going to limit you to using certain brands. And it doesn't matter if you're only on YouTube, only on Instagram, Snapchat, Vine, I mean, what else is there out there? This is your creation. You should use whatever you want. We just want to be able to provide the tools and resources to bring your vision to life. As for me, my true talent is not what I can create in front of the camera, but it's what I can do behind the camera. I just want to help you get there. Lights, camera, creation. Welcome to Ipsy OS. For more info on how to be a part of this, go to ipsyos.com. Good luck. When I mentioned that my, my true talent is what I do behind the camera, it's very true. Like I'm actually, I'm very shy. Um, that's why my voice is really shaky. I'm very shy in talking, talking in front of a lot of people. Um, but if you put me behind a camera, if you, if you pair me with an influencer or a creator, I can really make magic happen and I can help them. And this is really what I want to start. And this is why Ipsy OS came to life was we wanted to create a platform um, an operating, not operating system, well, it is like an operating system, OS, but it, it really is an open studio where we have an open relationship with these beauty creators who can just come in and shoot uh, pictures, videos, whatever content they want, collaborate with other creators, join in on our um, exclusive beauty events that we host every Thursday called Thirsty Thursday, where we get a brand, a specific brand to come in and to host a, a party with us where we get to drink, hence Thirsty Thursday. And um, it's very successful. I, I, I would like to say that one partner that we had ho who hosted Thirsty Thursday, the brand was ColourPop. They exclusively gave um, all of the beauty influencers that we had at Thirsty Thursday um, all of the new uh, lip glosses that they were launching. And um, so all the influencers the next day were tweeting about it, um, swatching it, uploading videos about the swatches, and taking pictures of it and sharing it on Instagram. And when ColourPop launched, within a day, they sold out of all their lip glosses. And so like, we really do see the power in um, cultivating this relationship with the creators and just being there with them and mentoring them and just helping them no strings attached because um, oftentimes I, I hear so much from a lot of these creators who get frustrated because um, they, they need support and they need help and they haven't found really like a, a haven for them to come in where they don't feel like they're competing with other creators where they can actually collaborate and share ideas and really cross, cross um, promote and pollinate. And that's why... Uh, and... and, and it, it truly is free. We, we don't ask for any exclusivities. You know, we work with creators from all other multi-channel networks or all multi-channel networks. Um, and we don't take a cut of anything. It's really a way to give back to this community, just like giving them the tools that Michelle would have wanted if she was really When I started starting. out, yes. Um, now, so 
Having said that, we wanted to really keep it interactive, and then we'll, we, we might uh, <laughs> ask more questions. You know, I might ask more questions, but I'd love to take some of the questions to get an idea for what you guys are interested in as well. I'm sorry? Um, I think within a week, we had over 10,000 uh, signups. And we're still going over, we're, we're still going through the list. It's a lot of people. But the cool thing about IPSOS is that if you're not in LA, you can still be part of, 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 of IPSOS. And besides providing um, all, of, all of the studio equipment and, and, and the resources and the people to help you bring the videos to life, we also um, create tools for the beauty creators. And so there's one um, that we created called um, Guru Giveaway which is a tool that uh, we only, it's only exclusive for the Ipsy OS members. And these beauty gurus can host giveaways very easily um, through this website. And we actually take care of the logistics. We take care of, of, of choosing the winners for them. And we ship it out. And we also source the products. So they literally don't have to think about anything. And in return, what they are able to do is really grow their numbers because of, of uh, the program that we we implemented into the website. So um, we started it out, like I think we launched it last month and it's been very, very successful. And so these are the tools that we're also providing besides um, you know, camera and production uh, resources. Um, as a female entrepreneur who is building an enter digital entertainment platform for women, um, I think I know why you started Ipsy. But I mean, Icon. But I'm really curious. After all your success from Ipsy, why why did you start Icon? What was the need there? Well, Ipsy is so beauty focused, and really, that's really our market. We are laser eyed focused on beauty, and that's a big category. You guys already know on YouTube, the beauty guru community is like half of. I mean, sometimes I feel like it's half of what. YouTube is because it's such a big, massive world. Um, and that's a market that we really thrive off of and we want to help cultivate. But that being said, um, there's so many other genres and, 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 and points of view that I'm really interested in. That's why I decided to partner with Endemol Shine Group to launch Icon, which focuses primarily on lifestyle content. And that being said, lifestyle being a very broad topic, um, that gives us the ability to really work with other creators who focus on something that's very niche. So if there's one person in Australia that's really good at making the, the most beautiful macaroons and 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 and, they, and she and she does like and I know her actually. I, I want to help her cuppy and cake. Um, she's and she's one example of all of the all of the creators and talents around the world that we really want to just help help build their brand and really just just get. You know, bring up bring up their awareness and just help them become micro entrepreneurs. You know, I feel like this is actually going to help the economy. Like, we actually need to have more and more uh, small businesses to really stimulate the and reinvigorate the economy again. And so, I feel like the best way is is really just providing all these resources and tools so that we can just jumpstart. Because you can imagine what I did with one video that I shot with my webcam in 2007. I've built. Um, a, a, over $100 million uh, revenue generating company just from this one video. Imagine with all of these other creators who have other stories and other point of views that they can share that can actually also help the world. Um, and I feel like how it helps the world is it really helps share and exchange ideas to better improve the lives of whoever is watching the content. So as far as um, creating content, how much of your content is uh, generated through personal interest versus what's trending? Both for me. Um, right now on my YouTube channel, just to be really transparent with you guys, I haven't taken a single sponsorship this year. Um, every video on my channel has just been pure experimentating, or a pure experimentation and also just being creative and cr creating content that thrives off of of really my community and what they want to see from me. But it, it's also, it's also, it also gave me the ability to incubate ideas that if I see that it works, I then pass it along to my Ipsy team and, and we just, we, 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 we take those ideas and we put it in our system with all the other creators to really help um, grow their numbers and influence um, by generating like amazing content that lives on different platforms. So that's what I do on the side personally on my own channel, but Beyond that, like I, I work really closely with the talents and creators. I teach them a lot on like how to edit. Um, 
better ways to optimize uh, different platforms. So if one creator is really, really good at improvising and maybe he or she is really good at like talking and 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 just and, and answering questions, I get them to go on live stream. I, I tell them you should download Meerkat or Periscope or get on you now and 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 continue this conversation and just get them excited, you know, because a lot of these creators they they end up they end up working in a world that they're also living in at the same time. And so a lot of them, I don't know if you guys know, they get burnt out. A lot of creators and, and influencers get really burnt out because they have to post on so many different platforms. And so when you give them something where they can just play around with and just have fun, it actually gives them the ability to come up with better ideas for their channel. And so that's why for me, it's important for me to continue this mentorship where I can really help the next generation of creators. Well, I'll, we'll, we'll do this. Um, so just playing off of that one, and I think, I'll, I'll make you run around, Jay, that way. I think you're kind of like, <laughs> you feel like you need good. exercise. Um, <laughs> but um, they talked a little bit about craft, and I think sometimes it can get, you know, we, and I include myself in it, we can get overly commercial in terms of thinking about something that's really a storytelling medium. What are you excited about in terms of storytelling and the craft, and where are you, where do you think you're pushing the boundaries? Well, I think um, storytelling is always going to evolve with people, but what I'm most interested about are the different platforms that are going to help evolve these storytelling ideas. So like, for example, 360 content, I'm very interested in immersive, immersive content, um, virtual reality, um, just really like play, playing around with what's gonna happen in the next 20 years in media. And, and really a lot of it boils down to storytelling. And beyond that, storytelling in general um, connects everyone together. It connects people together. When you share stories, people relate to it. That's why I think social media is such a powerful platform because it really is a platform for storytellers to share ideas and to talk. And just to know that someone else out there in the world probably agrees with you. And there's something very remarkable and familiar about that. Um, and so I feel like the re we're really just at the beginning of what we what I call the digital revolution and you know the last time we had something like that was the industrial revolution and you saw how that really changed our economy for the better and so now I feel with the digital revolution instead of instead of it being so focused on America because that was the industrial revolution the digital revolution is really going to change the global economy I believe because digital is so global I mean they call it the World Wide web for a reason and and what I'm most excited about is just finding all these other creators and talents around the world who have something very, very unique to share. So this applies to beauty and fashion, but it has bigger implications as well. Um, for so many years, uh, it, it's sort of been dictated uh, from above uh, by various companies and so forth, uh, what the standards of beauty and fashion are. Uh, do you really feel that on a global basis uh, that it's becoming more democratic on having sort of an input from what people feel it should be and sharing those ideas? And could you kind of expound on that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's what the internet brings out of people is for them to, to really express and share uh, their unique ideas or beauty or whatever it is, like their vision. And that's why I really believe just the idea of what is considered a beautiful, beautiful face today is, has changed dr dramatically because now you can just go on, online and, and you can see so many faces that are different ethnicities and, 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 and also most importantly, just, just different ways of, of really expressing that beauty. Um, and so just in general, fashion and beauty is evolving right now. I mean, a lot of people are saying, well, it, it's changing. I'm like, no, it's evolving right now. It's happening right now. I see it. Like, you see now the youth, the, the young generation, um, they are really embracing their imperfections. They know that they're uniquely special and beautiful. And, and it's... And, just seeing their conversations and their comments when they're replying re when they're replying to me and sometimes I'm also curious to see what my followers are posting so I'll just spend a day going on some of my followers Instagram account to see what they're posting and it's incredible because the youth they're they're, they're becoming confident they they are very very smart they're very capable and so if that's the case then we need to start creating these uh, th um, these platforms and 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 these companies to really help nurture their talents and their ideas because that in turn will help 
um, really generate more businesses. I mean, in this case, Ipsy being one, but I'm just one person. So imagine, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say imagine more Michelle Fonds, but that idea, imagine more creators around the world who are very, very motivated to be an entrepreneur. Imagine, all, imagine the businesses that they're gonna make and how that's gonna affect the world. So that being said, it's gonna start with the fashion and beauty, I really believe. Like that's gonna change and part of that change will happen because um, now like every, every basically all, all these, how do I say this? Everyone has a phone, right? When I think about the first video I uploaded on my YouTube channel, it was a webcam. But now like you have five-year-olds with iPods and smartphones and they can pretty much make their own content. And so if that's the case, we're gonna have more content, right? So that means we should really like have a system that can help these creators produce the best content that's authentic so that if one person who, um, let's say, uh, they focus primarily on gaming, one day like this person can produce their own game and have their, create their own Nintendo, if that's possible. But I really believe we're, th we're almost there and we're gonna start seeing that. I think that's a great question. And one of the things that we believe at Ipsy is that the brands of the next 100 years will be a lot more niche brands. So that they're not going to be, um, have a mass market approach for w through which they do product development, for example. So, uh, because millennials, they want a brand that they can really relate to, and you can't be everything to everybody. And so, um, what we're seeing on our end, our brands like ColourPop or Anastasia or you know NYX or many other brands that have a much more targeted approach, and those are proving to be a lot more successful, and, and, and also all the way down to kind of the retail level, you see this with, with NPD numbers and, 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 and sales numbers. Um, the brands that are really succeeding are the ones that have a focused approach and that are able to bring, build a posse around their brand um, and, and really have found uh, a voice. So. Any other questions? Yeah. I know that this is probably a very complex system in terms of helping these creators grow their audiences and become better at what they do. But is there maybe one thing that you feel like you focus on? Is it cross-branding audiences? Is it sharing resources in terms of helping them? Does that make sense? Um, no, no, totally. I totally understood your question. And it's that and so much more. And it is very complex because every every creator and, and every um, influencer is very very special and different. They have a very unique approach um, with their content and their branding. Um, some creators I know are very specific with a certain angle they want the camera to point at because this is their best angle. And it's very important to know these things because they might not want to do live streaming if they're just walking around. So, so for me, like what I, my approach is very holistic. I when I when I mentor these creators, the first thing I ask them is, why are you doing this? You know, is it the passion? Is it the money? Because if it's the money you might be in it for the wrong reason and you're gonna get burned out really fast, but if you're truly passionate about this, this career path um, and, you're, and you're also ready to fail, if need it be, but if you're passionate about it, it's part of the process, it's part of that journey to success is to fail. And, and if you're willing to experiment and you're willing to really just put your 150% into this, then yeah, let's do it. And so what I, what I usually do is I ask them why they wanna do it, I look at their channel, I look at all of the stuff that they're posting, and then I ask them, like, what, where, where would they like to take their content from there? And from there, the conversation will change. For some of them, they want, some of them will want to have their own brand. Others will just want to just continue doing this. They want to do this for the rest of their lives. They want to grow their following until they're like old and they go, they, they die. Like they, they want to grow old and die with their followers. I mean, I think it's really remarkable that there are people out there that they want to be that best friend, to, you know, from, from life to death. And I think that's very, very. And so um, that's why it's so important for us to just, you know, help them and, and mentor them and just guide them. And everything that I've learned, because, you know, starting, starting back in 2007, I was kind of like the guinea pig for social media. Um, and a lot of brands when I was, like, for example, Lancome, when Lancome was with me uh, five years ago, uh, they didn't know what an influencer was, but they just trusted in me. And so that's why as a brand, if you guys you guys just have to trust in that influencer that you're working with because they'll know how to sell and showcase or share whatever it is that you want them to share, talk about. They know how to do it in the most authentic way where 
the audience will be curious to know more about whatever it is they're talking about. So I hope that answered your question. Sometimes I feel 100%. like I kind of go off, but I try my best to come, come back around full circle. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Michelle and Marcella, the president, you guys are great. Also, I think you guys also hit on something really, really, we talk about a lot, which is the brand brief that comes from a brand and the listening brief that comes from the audience. So the moment you guys get your ideas out to marketplace, it's incredible the comments and thoughts the consumer has and immediately crafting that new brief that is in the voice by those that are actually communicating it. So uh, I think Michelle is really hitting hard on, on hopefully not uh, putting too many words in her mouth, but the, the brief or the message or the, that comes from the audience and the consumer that you're constantly reading that goes beyond just the walls of your office. So very inspiring, very informational. So thank you for both joining us today. All right, let's get, let's get, keep going. Actually, I think even Michelle talked on some streaming. So we're going to keep on that streaming edge here and we're going to have Twitch and uh, ReNanet join us on stage here. Let me do a little setup here for you guys real quick. So Andy, I, so most of you I'm sure are familiar with Twitch and many of you may have seen Andy over the years. Andy is a consummate evangelist in esports at Twitch and he's over 15 years experience in media. I've also enjoyed seeing him speak. Uh, they actually have a TwitchCon event coming up in September. If you guys really want to get your party on uh, and enjoy all things streaming. Uh, it was funny. Uh, I've kind of listened to sports for a while. There's a gentleman named Colin Cowherd on ESPN. He's no longer on there. But uh, he said the day I, I stop uh, broadcasting ESPN is the day ESPN starts broadcasting esports. Colin's not on there, and they actually started covering esports. So it tells me that it's actually coming around. And for Steve, I'm, I'm great. We actually have Steve here today. Steve Fowler came on down from Seattle. He's had a marketing at ArenaNet. Oddly enough, he was instrumental actually in the building of the summit uh, nine years ago. So if you're not having a good time, please see him after his speech. But uh, Steve's really representing the best balance of marketing and understanding unique positioning and course selling ideas around data and developing effective consumer relationships. I think the journey he's been on with Guild Wars 2 and how he's leaning into esports is something special that can be related almost to any brand. So. Please uh, come up on stage, uh, Andy and Steve. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I am Andy Swanson from Twitch. Quick raise of hands. How many of you have ever watched an eSport event? Hey, that's pretty good. We got some gaming people in the audience. Normally, it's not that high. I recognize some of you guys, too. How many have actually been to a live eSport event? Very, 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 very cool. Um, I think my slide should be coming up. Please. Maybe not. OK. Um, what if I told you that last weekend in Seattle, over 17,000 people crowded into the key arena to watch teams battle out for a $18 million purse. I would say no way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what if I told you that the winning team took home $6.6 .6 million for playing competitive video games? <laughs> what if I told you I was wearing the t-shirt of the winning team that won the International Five Evil Geniuses? That's how big, that's how big esports are becoming as a part of culture, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. It is starting to eclipse uh, some very popular sports that you may know, like hockey, baseball, basketball. Uh, what we've got going on up here is examples of live video game, live esports events happening. One of them is an esport event, one of them is an actual sporting event. So as I move through this, I want to just show that the passion and enthusiasm and excitement that we traditionally associate with uh, traditional sports, we're actually seeing in droves in the esports community. Uh, this is an example of a Staples Center where there is a basketball game going on, and this is an example of the Staples Center where the League of Legends Championship is occurring in 2014. So, just how big is esports? Well, in 2017, it's expected to be a billion dollar business. It's just almost there this year. And by 2020, they expect it to triple to be a $3 million business. Just to give you an example of how many of these are happening around the globe um, and how big the prize money is starting to grow for the actual talent that, uh, that plays the, 
the games. Viewership, here's an interesting one. The League of Legends championship had 32 million worldwide viewers, and it gives you some pretty nice comparable stats to other, video, uh, other sporting events and other pop culture television events, just to give you an idea of size and scale. I think I can leave this, these slides for the people, right? I see some folks taking pictures. I'll, I'll be happy to post this post-event, so if you don't have to go through, because I know we're on a time crunch and I'm going to be spending a lot of data. So what is eSports? eSports is competitive video gaming that um, has a prize pool. It's organized, it has rules, competitive. Um, how is it done? Well, people organize these events, and then they need a place to broadcast it, which is where Twitch comes in, the largest platform for eSports broadcasts in the world. And then we ask people, why do they watch? Well, it's the same reasons that people watch traditional sports. There's competitiveness. There's aspirational elements of, I want to be that good someday. I have a favorite team. I like to root for my favorite team with my, with my friends. Right? Literally, a lot of the things that you can associate with traditional sports happen in eSports. It's been around for a long time. That's the thing that's important for everybody to know. Competitive video gaming actually goes all the way back to the pinball days when local pinball halls would have competitions for cash, if you think about it. Um, then with the advent of the arcade, they started having you know, uh, arcade based uh, for prizes. Once we got into uh, 2000s, we had the internet. We had the LAN, what we call LAN parties, where they sort of the, the, the birthplace of traditional esports as we see it now, where people would actually bring their computers in, connect them all, and play competitive games, first-person shooters in most cases. So if you think, see things like Counter-Strike, that's why you see that. And then developers started actually making games specifically for the competitive environment. And at the same time, an online streaming service called Twitch started broadcasting this. So it's been around just much like poker had been around for hundreds or you know, 100 years, but it wasn't until the advent of the pocket cam where people who weren't at the event or who weren't playing could actually enjoy the experience. As far as growth goes, it is a global phenomenon. It's very important for people to understand that. Esports, both from a competitive perspective and a viewership perspective, is worldwide. So some of the numbers that we're going to see here are pretty impressive, but that is because they're touching people all across the globe. People oftentimes want to know, what's the NBA or the NFL or which is baseball in esports? It's a little bit more complicated than that. So esports are played based on a particular game. So people compete at a particular game. Um, in the cat case, it would be Dota 2, League of Legends, StarCraft, a whole lot of different games. The way that esports are organized is in sort of four different tiers, I would say. The first is going to be publisher and developer-driven uh, esports league. So Steve and, and the folks from ArenaNet and Guild Wars 2 uh, would be the folks that develop, do, do, do League of Legends, the International, Blizzard. They actually organize or co-produce the leagues themselves and run the tournaments. We also have a lot of independent leagues, so people that actually put on esports, and these numbers are big, where they actually don't own the IP, but the IP owners let them use their game to competitive. This would be things like uh, DreamHack, Intel Extreme Masters, ESL are all examples of these. We also have a lot of grassroots and small gaming um, esports programs that are all basically online only. So this is where there's no physical activation, people are actually just competing online. And then you actually have the teams and the players th themselves streaming. So imagine the idea that you could actually watch uh, Kobe Bryant or LeBron James or um, you know, any professional athlete actually practice their craft on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So that's the actual team players and streams. And all of those are broadcast on Twitch. So that's, for, for us, uh, this community and understanding this community and, and really nurturing it is something that's very near and dear to us because it's actually how Twitch got its formation. Um, just to give you an idea of size and scale on Twitch, and again, all these numbers I'll make available to you so you don't need to take notes. Um, over 89 million spectators worldwide last year on esports. What I love is over 11 billion minutes were consumed watching esports on Twitch last year. So how do brands get involved? And I think after I throw this out there, if you're not familiar with it and you're not familiar with how it's organized, I think how do I engage this? Because obviously there is an incredibly passionate, incredibly active community, but how do I get involved? It's actually simpler than you think. So when we talk about branding opportunities in esports, I'm gonna talk about four different ways. And this is gonna sound kind of ridiculous, but you could just run commercials. <laughs> you can just run targeted media that focuses on esports. Um, and just like mo most companies when they're tra targeting traditional sports, 
they're going to buy ads, right? It's an ad buy. But you can actually focus your media all the way down to the game level. So if you want to focus it on a specific game or a specific geo territory, you can do that. Even though the events are happening worldwide, you could say, I want the US viewers of a Dota 2 game that's being played in Cologne, Germany. Okay? Or you could take sort of the ESPN approach, which says, hey, I want to get the sports demographic folks, so I'm, I'm going to buy ESPN across a variety of their channels, so why don't I just focus my spend on esports in general, so I can just be a part of that community, so that when people are interacting on any esports side of things, they're being touched there. Second is actually integrating into the actual uh, events themselves. So this is no different than the Capital One Bowl week. Right? I'm going to throw out some if you guys are traditional sports guys. Uh, AT&T at the half, right? where the brands are actually built into the broadcasts themselves. All of these events, and I gave you some uh, examples of them, the Capcom Pro Tour, Heroes of the Storm, Halo Championship Series, all have branded opportunities. These are things like where there's static placement in the actual broadcast, audio callouts, the player's de uh, the desk where the uh, shoutcasters are calling from. It could be much like the um, Dr. Pepper halftime, you know, throw the football, get the million dollars. All of those things are available because these are m events that are being watched by millions of people all over the world. If you are interested in a physical activation, a lot of these actually have physical opportunities on site. So some of the biggest ones, I just mentioned the Key Arena last, uh, last two weekends ago was sold out with 17,000 people. Uh, this coming weekend, Madison Square Garden is sold out for the League of Legends North American Championships. So 20,000 people will be in Madison Square Garden watching the North American League of Legends Championships. So physical, on-site activations, your ability to touch people, have them give away things, be there to write the check, for example, uh, of the winning team. One of the things that we're seeing, and this is interesting because you don't see this in traditional sports because it's very difficult to put on, quote-unquote, exhibitions in traditional sports. But because these are uh, significantly online, we were actually doing an, an awful lot of custom esports tournaments where the brand actually sponsors the tournament itself. Um, so this was an example of some films that have done it in the past. Uh, the, the John Wick CSGO finals. John Wick was a Keanu Reeves action adventure or action movie. Um, so they sponsored a, a game that was about first person shooters. So again, uh, tying the brand specifically to the game and the demographic. Um, we had a great example of this one here, and I, know, I think I'm on time, still pretty good, um, where Duracell had a 26-hour battery, rechargeable battery. So they did a 26-hour Madden marathon where pro players and pro NFL players and competitive Madden folks actually played in a 26-hour uh, consecutive-hour tournament to feature the brand of the Duracell. So again, lots of different ways that brands can engage here. And then, interestingly enough, these teams are sponsorable. So I mentioned Evil Geniuses here, I'm wearing their t-shirt, but all of these guys that compete with the teams are actually sponsorable, much, much like uh, a NASCAR team would be. Or if you look at this, the jerseys in uh, soccer, they have a brand sponsor on them. Um, these are things where you're getting your logo, you're being a part of any of their streams on and off the brand, you might be on their jerseys. Uh, so I just wanted to take a minute to show you the overarching what is esports? We're going to talk a little bit more about it, um, as well as let you know that I've never been a part of something. I've been uh, mentioned I've been in video games a long time, about 17 years, where so many brands are so interested in getting involved in esports. I really feel like everybody is standing around the pool, and a bunch of people are dipping their toes in. But pretty soon, somebody's going to do a cannonball, and everybody's going to be, in, everybody's jumping in. And so that's the, the momentum that we're seeing with, with eSports um, and, and what's happening on Twitch and with our publishing partners. Great. Thanks, Andy. So up next is uh, Steve Fowler to give us that brand publisher perspective on eSports. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I represent kind of the other side. We're a developer and publisher up in Seattle area, ArenaNet. We make a game called Guild Wars 2. And... Um, I'll talk about why our esports is a little different than some of these mega esports uh, groups and, and, and developers that uh, Andy was talking about. But first, I want to show you a, a highlight clip, if we have that video ready, of uh, one of our recent World Tournament Series uh, that we did in Boston for PAX East, if you could run that.
they have to climb a huge mountain here in these last two minutes to take this away from them. We've got the decap, no kills coming across the board. This is so close. Eight very, point very game close. at the moment. They don't oh get my the last God! Game. They don't oh, get it! Logo. Come on, boys! That is gonna be it. Your World Tournament Series champions, it is Orange Logo! I want to thank every one of you for attending and every one of you watching at home. Good night. That guy, Rom, jumped out of his chair before the game was even over, cheering on his other four team members as they were about to head to victory and, and be uh, first place in the event. And it's not just those guys. It's the thousands and thousands of people that are watching on Twitch as we're streaming this. And why does it mean so much to us as a game developer and publisher? Well, there's, there's kind of two main reasons I'll touch on, and I'll keep this short so we can do a little Q&A. Um, number one, let me tell you a little bit about Guild Wars 2. We're not League of Legends or Dota or Smite or some of these other big competitive only games. We're a big MMORPG, like a World of Warcraft. And so people that play our game don't just compete. There are plenty of pl uh, players in our game that stand around our capital city and role play with each other, or go in dungeons and kill dragons. But there's also a lot of people that really like to fight other real people, and they we give them a, uh, a game mode uh, called PvP, uh, structured PvP in our game, and it's completely balanced, very fair, uh, high-stakes, uh, fast-paced action game, if you will. What we've found for Guild Wars 2 is, um, in order for us to be successful, we want to maximize playtime. So we're an always-on game. It's an online world. And the more people play, the more people pay. And so we need to have reasons why people can log in every day. And so we do lots of things on those other game gameplay modes, like we provide episodic story content that we put out every month, and we do new dungeons, and we do expansion packs like this one that's coming out uh, pretty soon this year. But those are all very um, uh, resource-required, uh, 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 development uh, team-required uh, pieces of content, where something like this is completely sustained by the community. And so what we can do is we can, we can really hit on two things for us. Number one, we can increase playtime, um, which directly translates to, to dollars for us. So as an example, uh, people that play our game in general, the average uh, player of Guild Wars 2, plays about 722 minutes a week, which is pretty impressive, right? They, they log in a lot of time in the game. But if somebody incorporates PvP into their playtime in Guild Wars 2, that jumps to 840 minutes a week. And so it's really important for us to give lots of things to do in the game uh, and to have PvP be something that can be self-sustaining. I don't have to have developers that are cranking out new episodes of PvP. It's players like this that are fighting each other. They're creating the drama, which leads me to that second big point. So from a marketing perspective, it's g content generation, right? These guys are the celebrities of our community. Um, and it is human drama. It is, this is basically reality TV for gamers. Um, it is live sports. It is all of that. But um, one thing that I'll end on here before we go into, into um, uh, the discussion is the, the, the in, most interesting thing that I think came out of uh, our latest World Tournament Series. So that was, a, that was a highlight from Boston, I think, in March. We just got back from Cologne where we did another World Tournament Series. And uh, we had four of our best teams in the whole world, one from China, two from Europe, one from North America. They battled out. It was, it was completely insane and intense and was awesome. Uh, but the stories that emerged after that were really the things that sustained the community involvement. And it was, it was about personalities. So the, one of our teams uh, out of Europe that's one of the best teams in the world is called uh, the Civilized Gentleman. And I'll tell you a little story about their, their leader. Uh, their leader is a guy by the name of the Lord Helseth. And the Lord Helseth is quite full of himself um, and went on Twitch uh, the day before the event and proclaimed that they were already victors and that it didn't matter who was playing uh, in the tournament. It was just going to be him watching at his own leisure who, who's battling for second and third place because he's already guaranteed the victory, right? So there's uproar amongst the community. This guy's the villain of, of Guild Wars 2. He ended up not winning. In fact, their team came in third place. Um, and then later that night, when we went to the team uh, uh, victory dinner, we took them all out and had beers and stuff like that, he decided, because he, he's very competitive, that he wanted to take, out, uh, wanted to take on somebody from the, the, the winning team. So the team abjured 
uh, from North America actually won the WTS in Cologne. Uh, they have uh, one of the guys on the team, his name, he goes by Noss. Noss and Helseth, after four or five Kolsches, decided that they would arm wrestle to really settle who the most competitive uh, person was. So Helseth uh, sits down with Noss, breaks out the right hand, and takes him out. And Helseth saying, basically, again, proclaiming that he's victorious. Um, but then that wasn't enough. He wanted to prove that he could beat him both ways. And so he said, let's go left-handed. And so they went and grabbed arms left-handed, 45 seconds of struggle. And all of a sudden, Helseth's arm goes, Pfft. and he looks at his arm and he goes, seriously? Noss broke his arm. We had to take him to the hospital. We had to get a splint done. He, his, his right here was shattered. And that is the story. That is the content that for weeks now after, uh, after Cologne that our fans are talking about. Uh, another guy, Rom, who you saw on the, on the, on the video, uh, another human story, right? He, he came back after, uh, after Cologne, and they came in second place. He was really distraught because he had won uh, uh, the event in in Boston. And so he decided he was going to stream for as long as he possibly could to analyze how his team possibly lost and would spend, because we, we streamed for eight hours straight that day, all those matches. He deconstructed every single match to the point where it was 4.30 a.m. in the morning for him and he fell asleep on the stream. And that doubled our viewership because there was a Reddit thread that came on, Rom is now asleep on his stream and people poured into the stream, it jumped us like 10 places on the front page of Twitch. These are the reasons why we do eSports, thank you. <laughs> That's great, and I think it's all about the people too, right? So. Uh, you're talking about the personalities here too, and that's also where the parallel comes in with, with sports, right? But how do you feel about, because there's some terms that are mentioned uh, when we're talking about esports, it's also referred to as competitive gaming, for example, uh, and you're talking about these people as cyber athletes and so on. So uh, do you think that that sports parallel is, 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 is valid, or would you see the branding, so to speak, of, of, of esports moving in a different direction? Oh, there's certainly as much competition and training, probably even more, put in by these professional players than, than professional athletes. And no one's, going to, no one's going to argue that Kobe Bryant isn't going to be able to be a much more athletic uh, 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 person who can dunk and do amazing physical feats. Um, but these people put in hundreds and thousands of hours into their craft and are now getting so sophisticated that they've got team uh, uh, coaches and, and, and programs to, 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 to train them, it's professional facilities where uh, they're, they're working on it together. Andy, you can talk yeah, a little bit more. In most cases, they, they live together yeah. and they train almost 24-7. They have houses and the, the manager will rent out a house and get sponsorship for the house so that these guys can live and train and do it in a location so that they can actually try to hit as many of the tournaments as possible because I mentioned the the worldwide nature of it. These guys could be in Cologne one day and then here in you know, Las Vegas the next day and then Taipei the next day you know, competing in these events. So the other interesting thing about that is that um, the average length of professional gaming is only like four years because unlike the physical element, they don't have the signed contracts and, and it's difficult to keep going. But, but the difference between a 21-year-old and a 25-year-old from a hand-eye coordination or even an 18-year-old is so much so that people are out of the competitive gaming side of things by the time they're not even 30, um, which is interesting. However, many of them have huge long careers. We have a guy on Twitch right now uh, called I'm a Cutie Pie, and he, he's an ex-League of Legends player, and he has a humongous following anytime he comes on and plays. So they can make money in a different way, but it's just interesting to think about what the hand-eye coordination element. So we're going to see, you think you're going to see a lot more stars emerge uh, in, in this field and have a, a similar following to, to a Kobe Bryant or, you know, as you mentioned before? Uh, I think there's no shortage of personalities. Um, you know, as again, Guild Wars 2 is not the biggest esports game, but already from the small community that we've had, we've got stars emerge that have their own followings that become partnered on Twitch and start making a, a real income, not only from the, the, the tournament uh, winnings, but from being celebrities and streaming themselves and becoming brands and icons. So yeah, absolutely. It, it's interesting, there, um, this weekend, the Madison Square Garden tournament is League of Legends, and um, one of the teams, Team Liquid, which is a very popular esports team, um, is actually having a meet and greet at Washington Square Park, and they anticipate somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people coming just to say hi to them before they go compete. Last year, about the same. 
That's amazing. So before I open it up for questions, I mean, uh, just speaking to a room of marketers here, I mean, how do you uh, see this form of, of video programming if you set the, the live uh, component or the event component aside from it? Like, how do you choose to invest in, and why in, in, in esports video programming as compared to, you know, engaging in, in, in any other form of video programming that could be, you know, promoting your game? Yeah, I think that um, uh, Andy hit on it uh, as well, which is th there's a unique um, ability for us to have way more content uh, be live and streamed through all of these individual athletes, if you will, streaming their, their practice, right? Where you don't get that from NFL or hockey or whatever it is. And so from us as a brand, we can always be in front of our consumers. And these guys are influencers, right? The, the best of the best players are sitting there and teaching you one-on-one -on -one and interacting with you, answering your questions on how to be better at the, the passion and, the, and the, the game that you love, where you're never really going to get that from Kobe Bryant. You're never really going to get that from uh, a, a football player. You're just not going to have that same one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. And so the video uh, uh, element of that is, since it's all real-time, uh, it's it's, it's so, so much more compelling because of the interactivity to it. So that's one of the, the, uh, the great things I, I, I like about Twitch and about other streaming services is there's that one-to-one -one relationship with this personality, this person that you, you admire so much that you have the ability to ask questions and have them guide you uh, personally, which is, uh, I think, pretty unique. I right. think en engagement is huge, obviously, is that they're doing it and they're staying there for a long period of time. It's not a fleeting, I'm in and I'm out. Um, the average length of time for somebody that spends on Twitch is 90 minutes. So they're spending an awful lot of time. And I'm sure that you know, engagement is such an important part of your business, Steve, yeah. that you know, that's an added part. Yeah. Do we have any questions here? Lori? From a demographic perspective, who's participating? who's watching, and then because of that, what brand categories are coming to you? Because again, I don't see a lot of women circling around this, not that that's a bad thing, or we're coming, but I'm just wondering, you know, as, as a Unilever or a P&G, would we come to you? Um, so can you talk a little bit about what you guys are seeing uh, from, a, from a gender perspective? Uh, you could probably talk more broadly about it since we're, I'm just one brand, but. Yes, so initially, um, from, from Twitch's perspective, initially the, the first person to come were game companies and then Hollywood films trying to meet a male demographic. But now, I mean, we're literally talking to Gatorade and Nike about esports, right? I mean, traditional brands that have been in the sports industry for a long time, Under Armour, are wanting to get into the space. Um, it, it's just a, a male millennial play. I mean, it's where they're engaged and where, they're, you know, where they can't find them in other places. This is an authentic and pretty much untapped area for them. So in any any brand that's that's in but the we're starting to see major brands uh, t to your point engage right like Coca Cola and Ford and even have people who are managing their esports marketing right yeah you'd be surprised how many people now at, at agencies and at brands have esports the ambassador and it's usually the 25 year old guy that likes to watch LOL or Dota or Starcraft I mean who gets it and understands it and says listen I spend six hours a weekend watching this you could be hitting me but you're not are, but are women coming in. We're seeing more, more and more. Um, I would say, you know, it's probably an 80-20 right now, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit less as far as that's concerned. Although we see uh, the women coming, for, if you go to an event, you'll see a lot more of the female audience there. And it can also depend a little bit by game. I know you probably have a better skew. I mean, our game overall skews about 60-40 uh, about uh, male to women. The PvP component, I will say, is more male for sure. Um, it's more aggressive, it's more competitive, and so we do see a higher skew of, of males there. It's also a little younger, so our game overall is average age about 34 years old, and then the PvP component is about 24 years old. And, and by game, that can change too. So like first-person shooter like uh, Counter-Strike Go or Call of Duty will, will skew very male, where a card game like Hearthstone or something that's a little bit you know, not as aggressive tends to be a little bit more balanced. Our time is up, but I think we have time for one more question here. Do we have a, the, the mic, please, too? Just a real basic question. Um, so the athletes, are they um, going across sports and across different types of sport uh, of games? And are there events that combine, like a triathlon, for example? 
Uh, I would say that uh, not usually. Usually they, they focus on one particular game, but there are teams that will sponsor several uh, uh, groups of individual players that play different games, like Evil Geniuses, as an example, has teams that compete not just in Dota or League of Legends, but have uh, several of them. But usually a, a player to get good enough to win tournaments for real, this kind of cash, they play that game and only that game, right? It's not, it's very rare to have a Bo Jackson, right? Yeah, I, I would agree. That's, that's sort of how it's set up, is that they're focused in on one particular game. Maybe a genre, maybe a MOBA to a MOBA, but not in general a shooter to a shooter. But in, gen in order to get so good at these games, you have to really know every single nuance to the game. All right, that's it for us, I think. But one more question over here. Can we get a mic? Okay. I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat it? Yeah. You just said that this audience is only on Twitch, but with something like the arm-breaking story, how do you then tell that story after the stream is over? Yeah, uh, maybe I misspoke. Uh, the, so uh, as an example, uh, there were several media involved with that. Uh, although uh, we weren't streaming the arm breaking incident, uh, that got out and uh, was talked about by another streamer from another uh, game that was on Twitch. But then a Reddit thread popped up about that. That Reddit thread then percolated down to our forums and then eventually there were memes created that went up onto Facebook of uh, putting Helsis face on various things that obviously you could come up with your own wild imagination. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a viral activity that, as a marketer, it's a luxury to have because I don't have to create this my, myself. It's, it's the community self-sustaining. It's a community interacting with each other through these personalities and stories. Great. So there's no video available to see. I, there is not a video. <laughs> not that I know of. All right, on that note, thank you so much. All right. Uh, all right, all right, one in the morning, Keith Richards, Michelle Fawn, and Broken Arms. It does not get better until you come back this afternoon where it's an amazing lineup of speakers and panelists. Right now, we are taking lunch. It is 12.15, or 1.15. Please, we're going to try to stick with a 2 o'clock return so we can stay on, so I apologize for doing that to you. Lunch is two double-sided buffets out by registration. There's high boys scattered about, and please, we invite you to come back to this room to enjoy your lunch as well. So again, 2 o'clock, and at 2, it is going to be... Uh, uh, going native, and we have a great group uh, with video link, and then we also have the fireside chat for Snapchat. So go ahead, eat and enjoy, and we'll see you back at two. Thank you.
going here in about a minute or two. Master Matt Rice can help pull people in from the outside, dude. Tell them to come on down. Whoop, whoop. How are we doing? People coming in from the outside. Hey Frank, you want to hold up your uh, hold hold up your arm there, buddy? Yes, nice cast. Don't arm wrestle with me, dude. There you go, dude. That was a great story, Fowler, on the arm wrestling. I want to know what 11 billion minutes equal. That was an incredible number. If someone can do the math, and how many years that is, I don't know what that is. It's a lot. <laughs> a lot. All right, let's get, uh, let's get this going on the second half. I know uh, we're coming off of lunch and keep it powered up. So the man for the job actually is Jim Lauterbach. He's perfect for this. Let me do a little quick setup right here. What's going on now with uh, Narrative and Snapchat and, and Jim and, and getting down this journey. So I actually remember one of the first meetings we had at the agency and talking about Snapchat. The team mentioned uh, the cost of entry was like $750,000. And I'm like, how many years is that? Like incredible what kind of uh, the point of entry in there. And, uh, then the notion that, you know, the message disappears. So I'm like, I want to meet with these guys and let's, let's figure this out. So Snapchat certainly has been something that uh, has been talked about a lot in marketing, being deployed in campaigns. And I'm proud actually also to have uh, Dan Altman out here, who's a co-founder and CEO of Narrative and dedicated to a Snapchat network, as well, along with Jim Lauterbach, who's a brand strategist again at uh, Watch It, editorial director at VidCon and venture partner at uh, Social Stars to help moderate this thing. So without further ado, Let's have Dan and Jim come on down. Thank you guys for having me. It's awesome to be here. Dan Altman yeah. from Narrative. Um, and uh, look, I, I think I want to start, um, and again, Dan's building really what I think is of the first real media company on Snapchat as a platform. Much like, think about BuzzFeed in many ways, building themselves on Facebook, et cetera. But, so the company's called Narrative. Um, so talk about how you got started. And I think it's really interesting when you think about it from an, an entrepreneur perspective that, and, and I've known Dan for a little while, but you, you were actually doing something entirely different. Yeah. So, so talk about the journey and how you got here. Yeah, so we were uh, a network focused on YouTube, um, helping creators kind of better monetize super fans, connect with super fans, and really kind of understand their audience a bit better. Um, we went into a Disney accelerator program that Techstars put on with them, um, and really kind of started to see a lot of our creators using Snapchat every day. You know, it, it required less production, it required less time, it required less thought, it was just a very free-flowing medium that you know, they saw as important. At the same time, you know, Disney was thinking about it, they were looking at mobile-first platforms, and YouTube was getting really crowded, as everyone in this room, I'm sure, knows. Um, and so we really turned our attention to Snapchat and said, this is a platform built on mobile, that kind of represents a lot of what we think of the future of content, which is you know, less comments, more free-flowing, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow, and that was kind of what we, what we wanted to focus on. Yeah, so talk about how you started in Snapchat. So I think initially when, I, um, when you were coming out of Techstars, they said, oh, it's the first MCN for Snapchat. And so I was thinking it'd be kind of like you know, Maker Studios for Snapchat, or you know, where you end up bringing in affiliates and you run them, and I thought, oh, that's a really good idea. I don't know how it's going to work in practice. But you sort of morphed a little bit from there also. So it's not so much that. Tell me about where you are and what the vision is now. Yeah, I mean, we just started to look at the fact that we could create amazing content really inexpensively. You know, the same way there were platforms that came onto Facebook and they said, you know, this is a great place to build a brand, to build kind of a reach. We really looked at Snapchat and said, this is a, pl a great place to build brands, to build reach, and to build an audience. And so we kind of took our, our theory of, of what was working on Snapchat and we continue to you know, work with major brands, work with big creators, but really focus on how do we create content that we can own that you know, speaks to the audiences, that uses the right creators in, in, in the best way possible. How do you own content that goes away after 24 hours? So you actually, you own the content, you can save the content, so we are just saving all the content, and owning it, and able to distribute it on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and getting really good at 
How do we parse it together? What should go where? We would never take everything and put it on another platform, but we would take highlights the same way, you know, you see an Instagram post making it onto Facebook, we want to take the highlights of what's happening on Snapchat and move it to other platforms. Yeah, people have done this with Vine, for example, very successfully on exactly. YouTube, where you see Vine strung yeah, together. Yeah, it's got Vine stars very successful from that. You know, they, the, and, and I, I talked about this earlier today, um, the sort of thing for me at VidCon that I sort of walked away with is these are all different video formats, and Snapchat in many ways is a new format where it just goes away in 24 hours, it's like short little nine seconds or less things strung together, you could storyboard. Talk about how you tell stories on Snapchat and how it's different from telling stories on some of these other platforms. Yeah, I mean, you know, the way we look at Snapchat is it's very free flowing. It doesn't require production. You know, the most production, the more production you have, you know, the, the less genuine it looks. Right. So it's really like, you know, you can think about it going to, a, you know, an NBA game. You would pick maybe your best picture and put that on Instagram. But Snapchat is really, you know, where am I going to eat? Who am I going with? It's telling the story in a more comprehensive and free-flowing way because you know that tomorrow, you know, you ordering food at a restaurant isn't going to represent you on your account because it's gone. Right. So I think the fact that it goes away, there's no comments, and it's so kind of, there's so, such an you know, authentic nature to it allows for a very different type of content creation. Yeah, I mean, the thing that, and I started using Snapchat and playing around with it uh, earlier this year just to understand the platform. And at first, as a long-time content creator, I was like, oh, my God, my content's going to be gone in 24 hours. I make the best stuff in the world. I, I, I can't live with that. And then I realized, I was like, you know what? Snapchat, in many ways, I find this. I don't know if you find this, but it, it is what we've always strived to build in a media brand, which is something that makes people come back every day because they have to. Yeah. You know, I want to addict people to my content so much they come back every day, but when it lives forever, it's like, yeah, I'll get to it tomorrow. Yeah. But if it's gone in 24 hours, yeah. right? I mean, how does that change the way the creators approach the platform? Yeah, I think they, they create it. You know, you see Viners doing maybe one Vine a week or a mm -hmm. few Vines a week. They're doing, you know, 17 to 20 snaps in a day. Yeah. So it just, it affects it because you're just making more of it. And so, you know, we try to take the best from it and distribute it in other places, but really it's, it's, a, it's a place that you can be more comfortable sharing and be more comfortable kind of making more content. Yep. How many people are on Snapchat? Use it regularly. Cool, good group. So, you know, those of you who aren't, um, you snap and connect with people, but there's also my story where you can create stuff and, and people subscribe to you and, and all that. But there's, I know they've been rolling out local stories so that yeah. they're pulling stuff together and they curate around events. So there's curating the Iowa State Fair and a bunch of others. When you look at creating content, when you and your creators create content, do you distinguish between creating for, for my story versus creating for local versus creating for these events? Do you send people to events to start snapping so that they're part of those events? How do you think about that and, yeah, and I mean, programming for, for those? For us, really, our audience is the creator's audience or the channel's right. audience. So sometimes those two things combine, um, which is great because it gives them exposure. It gives whatever brand or publisher we're working with exposure. But it's not, you know, it, it, we, we just kind of think about creating the best content and, and sometimes that, that ends it ends up on its way to, mm -hmm. to one of those other places. Yeah. So really, you're not focusing on those sort of curated events that they're pulling together. It's like, we're going to make great content if it shows up also. Not yet. Not yeah. yet. So I think really for us, the focus is just make great content. A lot of the times, that yeah. ends up on one of those places. Right. Um, but not, 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 not yet. Yeah, I'm going to pull up Snapchat right now just because I want to see what their, I, I, I looked at it yesterday, but I look at it today, what their sort of events are. And one of them was the Iowa State Fair. By the way, we're going to, you're all on Snapchat now. Um, we're going to do a quick snap here. So, yeah, this is the A-List Summit, and we are talking about Snapchat and narrative there. Yep. And uh, so I'm just going to, sorry, I lost all my blue cards. I'm just going to go, boom. We're going to put that on my story. And uh, they don't have my local story today, but um, I'm just going to say, yep, great. Um, now, they're live, San Francisco, LA, Perth, and the Iowa State Fair. So you wouldn't just send people to the Iowa State Fair, hoping they get on, We probably right? should. Yeah, down um, the road, right? <laughs> send everybody to Iowa. But yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, they, have de they definitely have different focuses for some of them. Like Iowa State Fair, they're showing it's all the different. Yeah, it's stuff, all the, it's, right? it's all the, it's it's all all the candidates. candidates um, but, you know, it's definitely worth trying. If you have the best snaps in that city on that day, you know, you'll yeah. work it on. Well, talk about um, sort of influence. We heard Michelle Fan talking about influencers versus creators and how creators are always pushing the envelope and influencers kind of do the same thing. I don't know. Um, 
How do you see influencers or creators developing on the Snapchat platform? Is it different from some of the other online video platforms? Are there people who work across multiple platforms? Or you think there are people who are just so good at Snapchat they're just going to develop there? Yeah, I mean, I think Snapchat, because they're such a low barrier to entry, mm -hmm. has, has kind of proven itself to be a place where you can be a creator and be really innovative without having to spend a lot of time or spend money on production. And so I think there's definitely YouTubers and Viners and Instagrammers and you know, whatever else that make their way over and they're great at it. But we do have a large portion of our creator base that are just on Snapchat. And it's because it's just so easy to be on right. Snapchat. And if your life's interesting and you're you know, pretty good at holding up a camera to it, then you're gonna be good on Snapchat. So you know, that's kind of how we think about it is just, it democratizes content creation in a new way. Um, and so, you know, definitely a lot of great creators that wouldn't be on Vine or Instagram or YouTube. Right. Yeah, I saw even uh, Hank Green, who runs uh, VidCon and the, the Vlogbrothers. He's most excited about Snapchat these days. He's like, he's having tons of fun with it. And, yeah. I, and I get it, because it's, you don't really have to plan it out. I mean, you can plan it out, but it's just, it's just a, it's a really interesting way to connect. Yeah. So, the top Snapchatters, um, uh, how many followers do some of the top Snapchatters have? What, what is the numbers there? Yeah, I mean, in our network, we have creators that are seeing anywhere between you know, 10,000 to you know, close to a million views per snap. So on mm -hmm. a given day, you know, they can see a tremendous amount of views. It's, it's just you know, constant creation. And, and so we're definitely seeing the numbers creep up. And uh, it's, it's still word of mouth. There's no dis, you know, discovery. Right. But it's, it's kind of fun to find new people, follow them, see their story. and people like the fact that it's a little hidden. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what do you see as the demographics of, of Snapchat, just to be clear about sort of who's yeah. going up there to watch this stuff? I mean, it's still, from what we see, and we don't know kind of the, the overall demographics, from, from what we see, it's still really young. You know, a lot of college students, mm -hmm. I think their, their kind of report is 17 to 34. Uh, we see a lot of 17 to 24 as kind of the sweet spot, and a little, you know, female skewing. But that's just yeah. kind of from our campaigns, not from, Snapchat in general. Well, my experience with my son who's 16 is that there's a heck of a lot of people that are 13 to 17 there yeah. as well. Definitely from what we see skews pretty young. Yeah, yeah, nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about how brands are using Snapchat and some success stories that you've seen and things that work and things that don't. Yeah. But before we do that, we've got a little video about 30 seconds of something you did with yeah, one so intro this is with ABC minute? Family. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of publishers. They come to us and say, kind of, how do we tell stories around our content that kind of complement what we're doing. We know that when Pretty Little Liars is on TV, our fans are all snapping anyways. So why not create content that complements it? We can weave brands into it. You know, why not control the conversation instead of having them scattered around? So this is a little video or a little portion of a video of what we worked on with ABC Family for a number of their shows. Uh, Pretty Little Liars becoming us and Stitchers. Um, Pretty Little Liars is now uh, above a million followers, and really for us it was about creating a voice for, for the channel. Okay, so let's take a look, a couple, minutes, a couple seconds of it. Hey guys, it's me again, Snapchat artist M. Platko, and I am getting excited for the winter premiere of Pretty Little Liars, which is less than an hour away. Welcome to the Becoming Us Snapchat. I'm Snapchatter Brandon Harvey, and I am so excited to watch the premiere of Stitchers tonight with Sean Darius, so much so that I got this totally real popcorn to totally share for Brandon. Yeah, like we are totally in the same place, like watching Stitcher, sharing the same popcorn. Totally. Make sure to tweet pictures of yourself following my instructions. So was that all one story? No. On the, no? So okay. those were little highlights from different from parts of the season. And those were three of, three of our creators that we work with, all managing different channels for ABC Family, creating content for them every week, really focused on, you know, how do they match the show, how do they, you know, talk about what happened last week, talk about what's happening this week, talk about what might happen, you know, next week. So let's th think about it from the brand perspective. For ABC Family, their goal, I assume, is to drive tune in, right? Yeah, their goal is to get as much engagement while the show is airing as possible. So would you put things out before the show went, went up to get people to watch? Would you put things out during the show to get the engagement all, going? All of it. All so of we, it? we manage, you know, the, the entire channel for them. We sit, you know, we create programming when the show is not, you know, in season. We create it when it is in season, and we, you know, want to drive people to watch the show and then 
you know, grab super fans, but grab also new followers. So definitely a lot of before and then, you know, a lot of during. So you would put these Snapchatters up on their channel. Exactly. As well as their own channel, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. And so you said there are about a million followers, subscribers? That's the right term there. Um, so yeah, followers, followers? subscribers. Okay. All right, uh, use either know. one. <laughs> so um, I remember talking to you a few months ago and you were telling me about this and you said, you said the open rates were incredible. What's the open rate when you put yeah, something I mean, like that on? Yeah, I mean, you know, we see open rates, you know, 60% and up. So it really, it be, you know, I think because of the urgency, because yeah. it still feels like they're your friends. It right. still feels like you've added them, you've found someone new, whether it's a show or, you know, a, a retailer, and you want to open everything that they show, what, everything that they're putting up. So it's, it's been really, you know, amazing to see up to 90% open rates. 90%. Is anybody else floored by that number? I mean, I, I know, you know, the YouTube channels we built, Revision 3, and some of the others I've seen, if one out of 10 or one out of five of your subscribers actually watch, you're doing something right, right? Yeah. That's a 10%, maybe a 20% open rate. Email open rates, terrible. Yeah. 60 <laughs> to 90%. I yeah. just think there's something going on there. Yeah. Something's definitely going on up there. Um, so when you think about um, other companies that have built, uh, that you're following in the footsteps of, who do you look up to and are you trying to pattern yourself against maybe a BuzzFeed or a Vice or something else? Or are you trying to sort of go down a brand new path? Like, how do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I think, you know, we look at platforms like that that have built brands on, net, you know, on, on channels that they saw as the most effective at their time. So, you know, BuzzFeed did a great job on Facebook, and now they have a brand that can move to Snapchat, Instagram, you know, wherever it might go. So, you know, companies like that to us are really exciting and, and ones that we look up to because they, you know, build brands for themselves that can translate right. elsewhere. And um, so, um, back to the brands. Who, who else is doing a good job on Snapchat? I mean, I'm sure you look around a lot of what other people are doing. Who's doing a good job? And give an example or two of you know, maybe stuff that you might have done or something that somebody else might have done that you look at and say, wow, that's, that's good. Yeah, I mean, ABC Family, honestly, they've been great mm -hmm. at social just in general. So, you know, they've been able to speak to an audience through Twitter, through Instagram, through YouTube. They're one of the most, you know, tweeted about TV shows for Pretty Little Liars. So they've been an amazing partner for us to say, you know, let's look at this new platform. Our fans are there. Let's get there before anyone else. And you know, they've been awesome at kind of creating new ways to to you know learn about who to follow and you know move to other shows and use their most social show to drive to others. Mm -hmm. So they've been a great partner. You know, when we look at other brands that are on it, Taco Bell's been doing a great job. They're usually first movers, and they've been really exciting in the space. And we've done some really great stuff with Marriott, who's obviously creating content digitally in a lot of ways. Um, sending creators you know, so, around the world. So talk about like, what works for a brand on Snapchat. I mean, you're not just going to say, well, I've got my 15 second creative. I'm going to cut it up into two seven seconds and run it out on my channel and that'll be great, right? Yeah. That doesn't work, right? No, it really has to be a story. So it has to be, you know, it can't just be day of. It has to be like, you know, so if you have a new product coming out, how do you build excitement for it with stories? Mm -hmm. How do you tell a story leading up to it? And then how do you tell a story that day? And so the best creative that we see is, is really focused on you know, telling a story over time versus trying to do as much as you can on one day. So if you're, you had a lot of brands here and, uh, and agency folks, if you're talking to them, should they build their own channel on Snapchat? Should they find influencers to work with? Should they do a combination? What's the goal here? Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully for us, the yeah. goal is to spend a lot of time and a lot of you know, you know, energy on Snapchat. We think it's really important in that, you know, when you look back in a year, you're going to say, I'm happy that I started building last year instead of this year. Yep. Um, I think building a channel is really important because, you know, if you're going to spend any time or effort there, you should build something that you can tap back into. Right. Instead of just, you know, like Instagram, you can save it and maybe spend a little money here and a little money there. You really have to kind of create a tone and a voice. You know, for a movie studio, it's less about creating a channel. It's more about how do we just get a lot of attention really in a really innovative way qu as quickly as possible. Yep. So it really just depends on kind of what the goal depends is. Depends on the what brand. the goal is, right, exactly. exactly. So, but for Marriott, you would recommend Marriott should have their own channel. They should put stuff in and then bring influencers in and out, but also have the influencers yeah. or the creators on their own channel interact with the exactly. brand. Exactly, and then also, ways. you know, guide the channel. And what we do is we guide the channel whether there's creators on it or not. Right. So say, you know, they have staff in their hotels. We didn't do this, but, you know, the idea being, how do you create a voice between your kind of big events or between your big spends right. uh, that keep people you know, interested and engaged? Um, what's an example of something that you tried that didn't work or something that somebody else did and you're like, oh man, 
I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, I think you know a lot of brands want to treat it like another platform, like YouTube right. or like Instagram. And I think you know the the brands that we've worked with that have just wanted to take produce TV movie content and put it on Snapchat have seen that doesn't resonate with people. You know, it's not the way Snapchat's meant to be used in that section at least. Um, and you know, thinking about it from a more organic you know standpoint is, is more effective. Right. Yeah. So yeah. even more organic than YouTube and things exactly. like that. Right. Exactly. A lot of the lessons that we learned on these other platforms, it sounds like you've got to learn them. And it's even, it's even more important on this platform. Yeah, exactly. What about um, data? How do you know, how do you get, because Snapchat seems to be a fairly opaque platform. Yeah. How do you know what people are watching and who's watching and what those demographics are? And how do you report back to a brand about their success? Yeah, I mean, it depends what the success, you know, what, what's success. So is it brand building? You know, is it getting as many people to view it as possible? Which, you know, as a, as a user, you can track and manage and, and we help make that a lot easier. Um, or is it, you know, taking a screenshot and, and sending people to, to use a, you know, a, a coupon code mm -hmm. somewhere? So it really depends on kind of what success is um, and, you know, what our kind of secret sauce is, is to help brands get better at it and to, you know, achieve their goals, whatever they may be. Right. So, but you can give them to say, this is how many people watch, this is what happened, these are our open rates. You, we can give them in a more sophisticated way what they already can see. So, right. you know, we right. just kind of, we kind of, take what they can see and, and make it more, you know, make it smarter over time. Is that some of your secret sauce that yeah, you guys exactly, have built? Okay, exactly, cool. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Um, are there any questions out here? Uh, we have a question right here. To, uh, yes, sir. You got a microphone right behind you. Hey, how's it going? Kevin with Digital LA. Hey. Uh, great. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, how should brands sit like a, a film or TV studio or a beauty company should, how should they use Snapchat? Yeah, I mean, I think it really just depends on whether it's a long-term or short-term strategy. So for you know, a movie studio, we'll a lot of the time say, what's your week looking at? Like, okay, so the trailer release, we need to do a bunch of stories around. The, you know, the week of release, we need to do a bunch of stories around. And we'll tap into creators on their own channels with their own distribution. And we'll say, how do you tell the story of being excited for the movie? That's, you know, that's really what it comes down to. You know? So we'll put creators on it that we see Maybe if it's a franchise that they're familiar with, that have talked about it, that have engaged with it, that would be excited for it. Um, that's kind of from a movie perspective. It's, it's shorter term. It's, it's little spurts, unless it's a, a franchise uh, that's going to be you know, around over a long period of time. And for a brand, we really see it as build a channel and tell your story on that channel and, and really be you know, think about it over a longer period of time, because it's going to be important to have that audience there more so in a year versus you know right hey, now. How do you plan out content for Snapchat, given the way that it's developed and put up? And uh, are you storyboarding stuff out and thinking about what each of the individual snaps will be over the course of a day, and then executing them, or is it a little bit more like we're just going to see what happens? It's definitely storyboarded. We're definitely saying you know we want every piece planned out. We want every snap kind of you know we we want it to feel, look, and and still be very natural. Yep. But we want there to be you know, a, a frame around it so it's not just kind of, you know, free-flowing and, and random. Right. And so when you do something in a day, let's say for, 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 you know, pick a client, but how many snaps will you plan out over the course of 24 hours? And then do you do them all at once or do you do a group here, a group here, a group here, a group? How, talk about the timing of that. Yeah, content. I mean, usually our stories are between 15 and 20 snaps. Mm -hmm. They're a mix between, you know, videos and images. You know, there we, we want to give images, for instance, because we want people to be able to take a screenshot and share it. Right. So we that's one of the things we look at when we're working with brands is what's the mix between videos and images. Videos are great, but they're you know less they're less shareable. They're right. they're clunkier to to put on you know Twitter or Instagram. Um, so you know, for us, it's throughout a day, 15 to 20 snaps, videos, images, you know, four to seven seconds. Is there a time that Snapchat, you're, like, do, you, do you look out and say, well, you know, the best time to post these snaps is at, at 9 a.m. and 6 p.m.? Is there certain, like, Yeah, I mean, if you look time? at the young, demo, the, the demographic that's, that's young on the platform, it's, it's when they're coming out of school. Right. It's, yep. You know, in the summer, it's a little more random. But, you know, you can just kind of follow where a yeah. younger demo is, is spending their time and, and when. Other questions? Yep. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say. So the question, by the way, for those who didn't hear it, um, is you know, Facebook's a couple posts a day, Twitter, et cetera. Um, you know, YouTube maybe a video a day. Is it? Are you saying that you need that a brand should be doing 20 snaps a day to keep their channel alive? No, no. no. So the, the, that amount is more for a creator rather than a brand. I would say when a brand posts a story, which you know we have brands that do it once a week, three or four times a week, it doesn't need to be every day. When they post a story in order to tell a comprehensive story that makes sense from front to back, that would be between 15 to 20 snaps, but that doesn't need to be every day. Um, so you can keep an audience engaged on Snapchat by just doing something weekly. Exactly. Or just doing something a couple times a week. We have a question over here as well. Um, and so I think it's interesting because that, you know, we all learned with Facebook and YouTube, like, when's the right time to post? How many posts do we do? How do we not fatigue the audience? How do we build people? So it's, it's that learning, I think, is really interesting yeah. on Snapchat. Question over there. What about timing? You want to, when you release this content, you want to make it feel organic and natural, uh, but at the same time, you want to have it scheduled. So as far as timing, how do you decide when is the right time to do it? And when you do figure that out, do you stay within that same time frame, or do you vary each uh, campaign? It really just depends on kind of what the initiative is. If you're at an event and that's where you want to, you know, really tell your story from, then you do it over the series of an event. If it's something more random, like, you know, going to your different shops and meeting employees or whatever it might be, then you can kind of space it out throughout a day. But we really look at it like keep the story moving, really have a, you know, this is the start, almost, you know, you can literally write it out. This is the, you know, the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end. And really, if, you, if you're kind of telling that over a day, it, it really just depends on kind of what the initiative is. But, but making sure that, it, you know, that people are excited for the whole day is important. Yeah, I found it really uh, illustrative for myself when I was learning about video and television and advertising and YouTube to actually storyboard chart out commercials and things like that. So I remember doing that uh, and was like, oh, that's how they're doing it. I think, you know, as you learn about Snapchat, it's not a bad idea to go to some people who are doing it really well and, and really storyboard out what they're doing. So give me two or three channels people should follow on Snapchat where you should learn from them and really take a look at what they're doing and kind of storyboard it out so you get a yeah. sense of what works. All right, well, I'll give one of ours and then one of uh, okay. <laughs> one that we just really think is a great channel. So, I mean, Taco Bell is a good one. They tell their brand story in a really interesting way. Um, I think it's just at Taco Bell. Yep, Taco and then, Bell. And then, you know, for, for more media brands, publishers, at PLL um, is the Pretty Little Liars PLL, account. PLL, Pretty Little Liars, right. Um, and we do weekly content for them and, and really kind of help guide them through, through you know, telling an interesting story. All right, so in 15 seconds, what do you think the future of Snapchat looks like uh, from a media perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, to us, we think it's distributing, you know, uh, dis it's, it's disrupting traditional content in a new way that, that's kind of more democratized and, and free-flowing, and, and we're really excited about it. Cool. Dan Altman, thank you very much. Thank you guys, too. Really appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Bravo. Well done, gentlemen. Well done. Uh, 69%. I think that's also a tribute to the fact that the platform's native style is for to go away, so you almost want to click and feel like you're missing something and you can't go back to it. But really interested in that stat. Storyboarding actually, I actually didn't even think about that on the Snapchat side, the way it was being articulated up here and the amount of, the amount of content up there. So uh, I think people here are gonna continue to get deep into Snapchat and where it represents. There's actually a great speech recently by the CEO on the advertising model they're going after and, and development there. So as you guys look online, there's a, they're definitely moving forward into, into a bigger and better ways. All right, uh, and actually, I think we can keep the momentum going. This next uh, session actually kind of even brings it up to a, to a higher level in terms of uh, winning on multi-platform video strategies. So world biggest publishers are now getting on board with Facebook, Instant Video, Snapchat, and other platforms offering them a publish, a publish natively in mobile apps and outside of the wall gardens. How do you navigate this integrated video landscape to reach new viewers who will engage with your brand on the platform of their choice? And I'm honored to actually have four really smart people up here, uh, starting with Juan Bruce, CEO and co-founder of Epoxy, kind of a software that allows creators to syndicate their content on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as Rebecca Makarian, our very own Senior Vice President of Digital and Social Media and All Things Wonderful. Uh, Frank Seaton, I apologize if I mispronounced that, CEO of Beachfront Media, leading video technology company enabling video distribution and video advertising across all screens and moderated by Jocelyn Johnson, who's actually the founder of Video Inc. I don't know if any of you 
uh, subscribe to the Video Inc. Daily email, but please do if you don't. It's a great source. Jocelyn, excellent job on that. Also, heads up uh, JJPR. Uh, take it away, guys. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks for that shout out on the subscription as well um, for Video Inc. That was awesome. Um, so, you know, we were actually pre talking um, this topic um, just a few minutes ago, and, and really it's interesting because. Everybody in the industry over the last year or so has really started to diversify their video strategy away from being just um, focused on YouTube to a number of other platforms, many of which, you know, narrative obviously dealing with Snapchat, but many of which we've um, heard about earlier today. So from each of you, and I, for this particular question, I just want to run down the line, um, you know, starting with you, Frank, on what do you think is the like one strategy that you think works when someone's evaluating like how to build out their multi-platform strategy? Sure, it's the way, we, can you hear me? Okay, it's the way that we um, talk to, to brands and to, um, to content providers, uh, or content creators, I guess, is that really you wanna, you wanna figure out how to like have owned media. So how do you get your content out there in an environment where you can get the analytics and where you can monetize it? So, uh, and of course, you know, for, from that standpoint, you can engage users even more. Uh, both from your content perspective as well as brands. So we really kind of you know, talked to a lot of people about like, you know, what do you, going forward, like not just one year from now, but five years from now, like what do you want your world to look like uh, in terms of like how you're engaging with your audiences and how you're actually working with the brands? And I think that's the real core of, uh, of what we've been helping people do. You know, from our side, it's really about talking about the different types of content we can produce and then what the right audience is more even than the right channel um, and where that audience then lives. So, you know, I was talking to a group earlier and I was using the example of The Walking Dead, right? If you're gonna promote The Walking Dead to The Walking Dead fans on Facebook, like a 20 minute trailer is probably fine. They're gonna love it, they're gonna eat it up. But if you're gonna try to spread that out to a mass audience of people who may like zombies, kinda into action, you're not really sure, then you probably need to really think about the length of that and how you're grabbing them faster um, and where that's targeted. So for us, it becomes very much about the audience that you're trying to reach and then, then the platform, then the piece of content that's gonna be right for them. So that's kind of how we approach the strategy. Yeah, building on that uh, comment, you know, I think you really don't have a choice anymore on deciding where you're gonna be. Your audience has kind of decided that for themselves. Uh, every time that they take out their phone and cl click on an app, you know, are they deciding to go to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat? That's really defining where you have to be. You know, we've moved from a world where there were limited slots and you could drive your viewer to those places to a world where uh, the viewer is going to decide the consumption context and experience an app they wanna be at that moment in their day, and you're either gonna participate in that conversation and try to get your content in front of them, or you're not, and they're gonna spend their time with some other brand or some other piece of content. Uh, and so I think, you know, really the, the multi-platform uh, is some, you know, primarily at Epoxy we work with uh, YouTube creators or video creators, um, and they've known for a long time uh, that they had to follow their audience, even before platforms like Twitter and Facebook had viable native video platforms, they were there sharing their content and creating uh, and building on conversation because that's where their community was. And so I think we're moving into an era where brands and uh, traditional media companies have to act like these native digital creators and participate where their audience is. Juan, on that side of things, um, I think it's interesting because about two years ago when, when YouTube really was the main distribution and main marketing platform, I heard a lot about you know, migrating your audiences. Like X, Y, and Z YouTube creator is awesome because they can migrate their audience over to Facebook and they can migrate it over to your product. Um, do, how, do you, how do you view that whole kind of migration pattern now? Like, are, Is it better to try and migrate to all these different platforms or should you well, focus well, on one and go deep? Well, I mean, I think that the reality is it wasn't a migration. They already had fans there. They were just taking control of those fan bases. And in the early days, you would see even if a YouTuber, for example, wasn't choosing to participate much on Facebook, 
a fan group or multiple fan groups would pop up and they'd have their own community right whether or not they liked it and that's the reality and that's even the reality with traditional entertainment uh and music i remember uh in the mid 2000s doing a consulting project for a record label and meeting with their digital person i said so what do you do and they said oh well you know uh we take down facebook fan pages and that's what i spend most of my day doing and i was like are you kidding me <laughs> um so I think it's less of a migration than just those people are already there, that conversation's going there. Are you using the right tactics to connect with them? And are you creating or recreating or editing your content for that context? And so do you think that it's important to go, um, just to get to the second part of that question was, do you think it's important to go really deep on one particular platform and then go to the next and, and hone in on those audiences? Or do you think you should just diversify all at once? So I think you should diversify and make it an iterative process, right? It's kind of, um, it's testing and experimental to figure out what's working, uh, what is your audience on that particular platform? Yes, you will probably find that some platforms are stronger than others, um, but often that's hard to predict until you started dabbling in it. Uh, and one of the biggest things that we tend to find is, you know, rules of thumb that often get written up in, in publications about social media for a certain type of thing can be just wrong or drastically different because we see creator to creator and demographic to demographic, very different performance and audience dynamics across these platforms. And one of the things that we talk about to our creators, so we work with both uh, YouTube influencers as well as uh, big media companies, uh, Condé Nast, Reuters, um, uh, Time. I think the big thing that we talk about is like, uh, from a distribution standpoint, you gotta think about each of these as endpoints of your distribution strategy. So um, you know, one of the key things we do is provide tech to enable distribution, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, your audiences are where your audiences are and you wanna be there but those audiences can shift quickly to some other platform that's the hot new thing. So how do you enable a distribution platform where it's easy to add on an additional place where you know your audience just shifted to? So Condé Nast's audience may be completely in a different platform uh, than, you know, say like News Corp or say like Michelle Phan. So, you know, you really want to go where the audiences are, but also you need to have sort of a multi-pronged uh, strategy that you're also creating your, your owned and operated as well. So you want to make sure that um, if you're really for the super fan or the super engaged user, you want to give them something more. So you, there's all these tools and technologies out there to enable them to do that. Uh, and you know, to the standpoint where uh, you always have to treat every distribution point like it can go away tomorrow. Google can decide to shut down YouTube tomorrow, for example. I mean, obviously that won't happen, but um, they decided all of a sudden you know, uh, to shut off um, access to YouTube inventory through ad exchange. And that was a very sudden change and a lot of advertisers are, are it was a very sudden thing for them. They could change their mind or any, any one of these platforms can change their mind about allowing your content on their platform. You have to be ready for that. You have to be in multiple places and think about it that way. So um, getting, getting to the point of, of brands and maybe Rebecca, this is more on, on your side of things as well, but um, when a brand is considering how to diversify across those, because I feel like a lot of what we're talking about right now is sort of creator-centric. So if, if we're a brand and we're actually looking to activate creators or we're a brand and we're maybe looking to build our own presence on those platforms, you know, how do you, how do you go about that approach as, as Frank is alluding to? Yeah, I mean, I think the iterative, be a little bit of everywhere is very much true. But, you know, I think when you think about moving people, right, getting them to change a behavior, that's a hard thing to do. So if you're going to say, I want everybody to be on my YouTube channel and I'm going to hit them with content on Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram and I'm going to direct everybody to YouTube, you're shifting a behavior and that's hard to do. It takes more time. It takes more money. So often that's a higher cost to you to shift a behavior, whereas getting them to do something in the moment, in the moment that they're there is lower cost. So then you have to assign the value to it, right? So if they're your whale and they're your big spender and you know that person's really valuable, then absolutely you should be shifting them to apps and your own channels and you should be driving them so that they're getting everything you're putting out because you know they're gonna spend, you know they want it. But if you don't know that yet, you do have to have that diversification you know, as a brand to be pulling in new people and be you know, looking at that upper funnel part of it and saying like, how am I building interest up here? And those people may shake out, 
to the bottom, but we all know how the funnel works. Not all those people make it to the bottom yet. <laughs> so while they're not there yet, you know, hit them where they're at. Don't make them change their behavior. You're gonna spend way too much time and money trying to make them do that. So give them what they want right where they're at, right then and there. And if it's not on your channel yet, partner with a creator and get it in front of them where they live because that's gonna be the easiest way to get them to know your brand. I also want to throw out some kind of organizational uh, advice. If your social team and your video teams are not working together, this is going to be really hard. If you have a siloed social team uh, from your video team and they have different goals, if social like just has goals of engagement or grow the numbers on the social accounts and video team has views uh, and they don't work together, things tend not to work well, right? So that team needs to be united and united under a common set of goals because the reality is a lot of social platforms are becoming video platforms. And when you look at what works, it's not just getting that piece of video content to work, but if you take a, a page from hit creators, they're often doing what's in essence a campaign that has text, stills, outtakes, get, uh, GIFs, memes, um, and all of that content is flowing through these same platforms and it has to be unified to make this authentic and make it work. We're um, at, our, at our midpoint. I like to just do like a middle point shout out and see if anybody has questions on anything so far, just in case something is resonating. Okay, um, so when you're looking at, at and again, I'm gonna talk about engagement because I think that that's really interesting. Um, to, to focus on because you can't have everybody engaged in the same way on every platform, right? And um, each one of the platforms to the point made earlier is like apples to oranges to cherries to bananas. They're all different, right? They have their perks and their downfalls. Um, so when you're looking at engagement or maybe some metrics across each one of those platforms, is there any unifying property on that side? You mean how do you make the assets and how do you publish it to it? Yeah, so that's the other thing. You can't just look at pushing the same asset to every platform because they're not apples to apples, right? So, uh, you know, YouTube is search-based, um, performs really well for searchable content and for longer formats. Um, Facebook and Twitter now have native video with autoplay in the feed, so you have to think about what's the edit that captures people's attention as they're scrolling by in that feed. Um, obviously, Instagram and Vine are totally different formats. So you need, and again, this comes down to almost a, a operationally like the, the same type of psyche that a social team uses to figure out what works with posts. It's integrating that back into the editing, right? So if you have a separate editing team, they don't know the flow of social, and they're just given some assignment like, give me these things, odds are that's not going to work out very well. Yeah, I would add to that that engagement is a really broad term and it means a lot of different things. So I think someone mentioned earlier in one of the panels that it's about really understanding your objective and your KPI when you set out. So engagement can be a simple like, an engagement can be a view, an engagement can be a share, which everyone sort of sort of wants the share, right? And and all of those are valuable at different levels and they're more valuable from different audiences, right? So uh, again, going back to the whales, the share among the whales is really valuable because you know they're very likely to have an audience similar to what you're going after because of who they are, right? It's not to say it's less valuable among someone else, but it's more valuable there. So as you sort of think about engagement, there's all different things. And then like, we're talking about video length of watching, right? So, so that asset you put out, if you put out a 40 minute piece, again, using The Walking Dead, you put out a 20 minute, 40 minute trailer, how long did people watch it? If you put it among fans, they probably watched most of it or the whole thing, but you'll see those three second drop offs, the wider your audience gets, right? So it has to be about the, the audience. It just depends on that KPI and what engagement you're going after. Yeah, I agree. I mean, from a purely brand perspective, um, knowing the KPIs on the different platforms is really, really important. Uh, I'd be surprised how many brands don't actually know the, what the KPI would be on Twitter, for example. So is retweets the KPI? Or um, you know, what, is, what is the actual KPI on each social platform? And then being able to measure those KPIs across platforms is, uh, is super important. But also um, making sure like in each environment, from an engagement perspective, that uh, 
whatever the, the engagement like metric is like on those platforms, make it super easy to for users, you know, basically remove friction. Um, remove friction for them to to act on uh, your piece of content or, or you know act with your brand. So that's why I always say you know you you can always uh, so so the super fan you may want to have an app they can download for you know just the average average casual user um, that may not be into Twitter but may into Snapchat you need to be there. So I think it really depends on like where the audience is and then we're figuring out those KPIs and then having sort of different levels of engagement for for the casual versus the super fan uh, type of person for your brand. Yeah. You know, I've, I've heard um, a stat recently kind of being passed around that 20% of YouTube subscribers are active. So if uh, PewDiePie has 18 million subscribers, only 20% of those are really active. You guys are enabling um, through technology for there to be an in-app environment. So of that 20% that is active and able to move over to an app, what are you guys seeing in terms of retention and keeping them there? And how, do, how are creators or how should brands be keeping those people in that environment and building it into a daily habit. Yeah, I mean, we, we focused on subscribers for a long time, but now we're actually looking at daily views or monthly views, because that's such an uh, important metric from an engagement perspective and how many people are actively watching those videos, because if they're really old subscribers, they may never, ever look at that channel's videos. Um, so really, it's those, it's those monthly views that are super important. Uh, from there, you know, uh, we could totally tell, like, when we do the on the app side, we can tell based on, you know, the number of downloads, but based on a promotion, like uh, some people will get 70% of their viewers to download an app, and others will get 5%. Uh, so you can really tell sort of like who who has real sort of super fans, uh, and who you know has more of the casual. Hey, this I'll check out this video, and and it seems kind of cool. Like I'll watch it and then get on to another one. So um, it's pretty it's pretty easy to tell pretty quickly uh, based off of some of the stuff that we're doing. And any any interesting ways that you think brands can engage in in those com in those types of communities with the creator? Yeah, we'll definitely look at the metrics, of course, like the analytics and what's happening. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think I think the important thing is to not just always focus on that top tier, you know, creator that everyone's trying to engage with. Like, look at your segment and like who are the people that are really um, getting like strong monthly video views uh, for that particular segment, uh, and really go after those. There's a huge amount of like sort of what I call mid-tier creators with 500,000 subs uh, around there um, that actually drive more video views um, than uh, someone might have 10 million subs. So it's really sort of looking at your segment and figuring out like who those best mid-tier creators are. And it'll be a lot more cost effective too. You're not gonna um, have to do huge upfronts and, the, and they're, very, they're very much willing to work with uh, brands that they, that they believe in and, and work with you. So I think that's like you know, the strongest advice I could say from a brand perspective. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with that and say that there's a lot of creators that are um, y y that have a, r a really great uh, following and engagement that may not be on your radar. So dig a little bit deeper. I mean, we work with most of the big multi-channel or multi-platform networks um, to help them structure these deals. And so I think you want to be digging deeper to the engagement because just going for as Jocelyn pointed out, uh, a subscriber count as a way to evaluate doing a deal may not be um, the best way to do it because there were a lot of different ways that people arrived at those subscriber counts. It's kind of similar to in social media. There's a lot of different ways brands arrived at their social following counts, and some of them did not weren't organic and uh, don't don't have the most active uh, subscribers. So really, um, you know, asking the network to show me some data on engagement across platform. Of course, you should be asking what's the multi-platform reach, so not just what are typical YouTube views and comments, but what's the typical um, you know, Facebook reach, what's the engagements, the reshares, what's the typical Twitter uh, reach, um, and on Twitter also, who else is talking about it? So a little plug for Epoxy, but like we have a tool that lets you know who's talking about YouTube video, even if they're not using the hashtag or calling out a creator or brands at handle. Um, what's the typical reach on Instagram? So looking at that as kind of a whole package to be able to evaluate whether this could be a good partnership or not. And then saying, hey, we're not just gonna do this maybe with one halo person, but could we be more effective picking from the middle of the torso a variety of people 
that are going to have strengths on each one of these platforms to kind of align with your goals. I, I would add, you know, you guys, a lot of you in the room, I saw hands go up earlier of how many brands we have here. You guys have so much power to ask for analytics and ask for data. Do it. Do it every time. Data is really like the gold mine here, right? So demand that from your partners. Push your analytics as far as it will possibly go. Think about analytics. You know, I, I got into social from PR because I liked the aspect of being able to know a little bit about what everyone was doing. And we've built an analytics team that does that as well. And I hope that all you guys have analytics teams who think about analytics in an integrated fashion. But can you track them from the creator app, through the video they watched, through the funnel, see where they dropped off, see what they purchased, see what they bought, and can you bring it full circle? And that's the goal all of us should be striving to get to because the more data you have that tells you what you did at the end of the day, yes, share a voice and changing conversation and who you're moving in that conversation, absolutely important. But most of us at the end of the day are here to sell a product or sell a service or get someone to sign up to do something. So push as hard as you can to get the analytics to go as far as you can in that process. And the good creators who value their partnerships with you will give you data. They will partner with you and make that part of the table stakes. You know, the early days of working with celebrities, people were often shy, oh, I got such and such celebrity. I can't also ask them to do a press interview. I can't also ask them to do this. You have the money. You can. Um, so ask and and demand it. You know, demand that of your partners to be that good because it will drive your business. And, and that's a good point about the data. I mean, that's so important. Uh, and not all the social platforms do share that data. Actually, as a matter of fact. Right. Uh, and so you know, I would say if you're going to be doing social, uh, you know, campaigns, like definitely figure out also how to get as much first party data as you possibly can get. That's why I always say, like, it's, you know, it used to be that microsites were big, and then all of a sudden it became Facebook pages. But then all of a sudden your Facebook pages, a lot of those likes, you couldn't reach them all. You had to pay for it. <laughs> so it's like, all right, you really should still have your, an own and operated strategy where you can drive people back to your microsite or to your app or whatever it is. And then you can gather data around those people. So, you know, we do things such as, like, geofencing uh, uh, based off of, like, people that, like, have entered your store or been in your parking lot. Uh, for the past year and then, and then other areas that may be of interest to you. So that kind of data, like you're not going to get from all the social platforms. So I feel like it's like one of those things where, um, you know, the, the more data you can get from the social platforms, the better, but you're not going to get as much as you absolutely want. So so, so in jumping on that, um, there's definitely a di difference between auth data and public data. So if you're a brand or an entertainment company out there operating, um, you know, you may have a social media um, service that is letting you see public data around performance. The creators you may be publishing with have a lot richer data when you're off into their account. So there are services that like all the networks use, I mean a lot of them again use epoxy, and we can pull that off data um, so you can ask for it and say, hey, what, what are some of the deeper engagement stats there? The other thing I'd say is uh, don't just go for hashtags because hashtags are Yes, they're really simple to pull, and people love them because, again, they're simple to pull from public data, um, but they're often not the best um, either predictor or monitor of how something um, performed because, especially around video, for a large part, um, consumers who are sharing and talking about video don't remember to use the hashtag you're trying to promote, so you're missing a ton of the conversation, and you may have two campaigns that look pretty similar hashtag-wise, but conversation-wise, like have a lot of other stuff going on, so don't obsess with the hashtag. Yeah, it's interesting that we're, you guys brought up um, the point of data um, and u utilizing the analytics, but I feel like those analytics are ultimately um, a driver to inform the creative, mm -hmm. right? And when you're doing creative across all of these different platforms that are, um, like we said, are not apples to apples, um, in Facebook you have to be able to grab the attention and within three seconds. Um, if you're in YouTube, you know you have that five second on the on the pre-roll ad before the, they skip, so you kind of have to get their interest early and then keep them beyond that five seconds. Vessel is just resorting to a five second ad altogether. So if you're using that data to inform creative, um, you know what do you think brands should be considering when they're looking at all these different platforms that kind of have different environments? 
from the creative perspective? First five seconds of <laughs> pretty much no matter what platform you're on, you got to capture them within three to three to five seconds. Well, for sure. Does that does that ultimately then I, I compromise it, the brand's ability to tell a real story if they only have that? Well, I think it, it gets seconds? it gets back to that integrated team, right? Because if you have a guy sitting in a video editing bay who doesn't look at any data and wouldn't care to look at any data, um, it's never going to iterate to that person being having a good practice of cutting that content. Right. If they all sit together in a little group and they all have the same goals and the person writing the copy on your Instagram or Facebook post is sitting next to the video editing person and they try something and then they iterate, you know, a couple hours later and they try something again and the video editing person starts to get a gut feel for what's going on, you're going to end up having a lot better performance. So again, break down the silos. I mean, there's two things basically. I mean, from in a mobile world, which is what we're in now nowadays, um, just looking at the trends and where everything's going, you're, there's two things you're trying to defend against: the swipe or the home button. So, how can you engage user long enough so they don't swipe past, or you know, scroll past, or hit the home button? And I think that's why the three seconds. It's not you don't have to tell your story in three seconds. You just gotta capture some engagement, get them to stay, you gotta get rather them to than stop. scroll. Exactly, yeah. or home button. So. Any, any questions right now from the audience? We're about five minutes, five minutes in. Nobody? Nobody? Be brave. If you have a question, go ahead. Oh, wow, good. We've covered everything. We've just, we were just well, so we're brilliantly done. thorough. So I guess the, the, perhaps the last question um, that I would have that I feel is a, an issue that's resonating across the industry, especially from the brand and the creative side, to kind of stay on that theme for a minute, is um, this uh, audibility versus viewability um, issue. What do you guys think about you know, muted videos and not just catching that attention span, but when you're advising brands or you're, you're talking to creators about distribution on all of these different platforms, what do you, what do you think audio uh, plays a factor on that? I think it better be good content because I, I, for me personally, and I see lots of people do this, like I'm scrolling all the time and I stop and watch videos without sound constantly. It really has to get my attention for me to click the button to play the sound and oftentimes I'm not in a place where I can. So if I miss the message that you're trying to give me because I didn't hear the sound, you're probably missing out on some of the platforms. Other platforms, again, this is where your data comes in handy, right? I would say that's less likely if I'm personally on YouTube. I tend to be headphones on, listening to something when I'm on YouTube. So every user behavior varies a little, but Instagram and Facebook, I would say in particular, I, I'm largely watching without sound. So I think this goes back to having a great story, whatever that story is, having a great piece of content and making sure that that content, if it doesn't have sound, you know, or can you put captions in it because they need to hear what it says or does it just give the message without it? Yeah, I, I think this is, comes back to, uh, again, understanding, having the people who are doing the creative understand the context. And there's actually, I think, some historical irony here in that if you go all the way back to the age of silent film, everybody was flipping out that talkies were going to ruin <laughs> everything. So here we are back to uh, an era of having um, a really good venue for silent entertainment. And so if you, if you get creative people figuring out how to do that edit, um, either with the point of, yeah, just keep watching it without the sound, or, you know, click on it and let's start hearing some sound, right? But again, it comes back to you got to make that hook uh, without the audio in those contexts. Um, to me, I mean, we focus on getting to 100% viewability with sound on. Uh, at the end of the day, that's what the brand is paying for. Um, and I think that's what we need to, as an industry, try to deliver on. Um, there's realistic, you know, things that you're, you're dealing with in terms of in-feed video ads that are auto-playing with sound off. Um, it, that, that, you know, obviously you need to try to get their attention uh, pretty quickly. And uh, the trend is definitely moving towards uh, those type of units. But it, at the end of the day, it comes down to pricing. So are you going to pay as much for that ad versus like a full screen audio on 100% viewable ad? Probably not. Um, so I think, you know, I think there's going to be a place for all these different ad units. Uh, but I think there's going to be different price points. Do you, think that, do you think that ultimately it should come down to the brand deciding or the creator deciding to go in first into an environment where 
maybe video is autoplay with audio, or should they just always optimize for no audio? I think they should just choose. I mean, they should be able to give them the, the choice of what they want, and then they set the price that they'll pay for it. So, you know, it's basic, you know, it's, it's de basic uh, you know, supply and demand. So if there's demand there, then the, they buy it, the price goes up. If no one's buying it, then the price goes down. So uh, I think there's definitely a place for both. Um, and uh, we've seen su success uh, with both in-feed, you know, audio off ads and, and also like full screen, 100% viewable ads. Um, it just comes down to price. Cool, and then I wanted, we have only a minute left, but I wanna get each of your prediction on whether live can finally take off with Periscope and Meerkat, and should brands really start focusing there, or do you think it's gonna go the way of live stream over the last five years and just fizzle and spike and fizzle and spike? We'll start with you, Juan, and we'll work towards Frank. So is live streaming going to take off because of Meerkat and Periscope, or will it continue on its previous trend, a la Ustream? Well, I might argue that it's already taken off because of Twitch. So that's a whole other, but that's a whole other context because that's also shown the power of um, following mechanic, right? Which is awesome uh, for everybody that's like, it's the content, it's the content. Well, yes, it's the content, but it's also the following and social mechanic. Um, now, I'm not gonna make any bets on uh, Periscope or, or uh, Meerkat as the the um, golden children of the kind of uh, of the the media type, but I think yes, live streaming is definitely here to stay in one way or another. We're in the super early days of it, so there's a lot of interesting um, kind of opportunities uh, going on. I mean, I've already seen around some um, uh, live events and um, uh, happenings going on where you'd have a couple brands that actually decided to have somebody participate and they just all of a sudden have thousands or tens of thousands of people um, watching because nobody else is there doing it. I mean, I'm a car guy and there was a just big uh, Monterey Historics and, and vintage car event up north last weekend. The few brands that actually stream something, which almost nobody was doing, got tens of thousands of viewers, right? And it was probably one of their interns shakily holding a phone because most of the coverage, <laughs> frankly, sucked. Um, but it was still interesting to see. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's here to stay. Cool. I would totally agree with that. I think it's, it, it was here to stay with Twitch and even Ustream before that. I think you know we've all been dabbling in live streaming. I think the content's gonna get better. I think the creators are having a big impact in that because they're upping the quality of live streams and they're also bringing audiences to it. So if you know someone you like is gonna be doing a live stream, you're much more apt to watch it, right? And those are gonna be kind of like the early days of radio from a basement, right? Those are gonna be the people who bring people in. And then the rest of us are gonna come in with our media corporations and we're gonna make shows out of it. And eventually we won't be talking about streaming, you know, pre-planned programming through Netflix. We're gonna be talking about live streaming shows that are being filmed right then in there yep. um, and that will be I think the new normal eventually and and the other things will continue to exist you know we'll just get more diversification in entertainment and media cool yeah I mean it's here to stay as long as everyone has a cell phone in their pocket it's definitely gonna be here to stay so you stream live stream they're a little bit early in the market uh, Periscope Meerkat hit in the market uh, just right so um, my prediction is iOS 10 will have it built in <laughs> love it cool Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. And um, does anybody have any last questions? I think we're like way over time. So if you do, you missed your boat the other two times. But awesome job, folks. Thank you. OK. Uh, and talking about content, we have some more content for you. We are coming up on a, a break, a networking break. They'll be back out in the foyer. But a couple things before we head out there. Drop your business card in. One of our sponsors, Curse, is doing a great raffle. There's a jar out there. Please drop it in. Uh, this afternoon, folks, just keeps getting better. We're going to go to the Data Driven Studio. Uh, if any of you know New Form Digital, that is Ron Howard and Brian Grazier's group. Um, we are also following that up with Microsoft, Halo 5. Video 
did audio kill the video star? Uh, and then Barbie. Barbie is going to be going native on YouTube. And then lastly, the Influencer Roundtable. You are going to be looking, listening to influencers that collectively have over 15 million subscribers. So it's going to be great. Follow that up with a reception and we're good to go. It is 310. How about 10 minutes? Can we get here like 315? Uh, 320 would be awesome. Refreshments right outside the door. Thanks, everybody.
to do Schwab, how are we doing over there? Are people coming in? Do it. Say, come on in, everybody. Give a holler. Use that big voice. Come on down. Any more stragglers waiting for out there, guys? Jay? Should we get going? All right, so let's start picking it up here. A few quick highlights from that last session. Uh, brands acting like digital creators. I think it's an interesting statement because it's easier said than done, but that muscle memory of being able to operate at kind of the speed of conversation is, is challenging. Siloed social and video. I feel like I just had that meeting last quarter at Eisenberg Group, but it's a big deal. And actually sitting side by side and reorganizing and operating that way is a differentiator and uh, proof has been, uh, we've seen the proof there. Uh, subs versus views, I thought that was interesting, the little dynamic swing to look back at views versus subs and 20% of subs engagement. Uh, Rebecca made a really good point on demanding the data. Uh, there's that old Ogilvy quote, right? Data is, uh, data is kind of like a, a lamppost at night that drunkards sit against, stand up against. So it's, it's kind of the data is important, but directionally, what's the insight there? So data with actual insight, because there's so much big data now going out there. So being able to interpret that and have a POV from it. So our partners at Epoxy uh, that uh, are speaking and talking about data insights, uh, they're great for, for collecting that and, and directing that, uh, that journey. And then uh, forget about hashtags, man. I'm gonna go hashtag A-List Summit one more time because you know we do want a trend. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw a hashtag out there, counter to what Juan said. All right, let's get moving into our next journey. Uh, with our friends at Tubular and New Form Digital. So identifying rising star storytellers. Storytelling has been used a lot today. So it looks like we've got a solution here of how to find someone to do it for us. Scripted engagement content and grow audience. And speaking actually with Allison and JC, I found the discussion actually the art and science behind partnerships to be unique and welcome them to be here today to share us their ideas. So with that, as they're kind of strolling up here and maybe playing some video in the background or whatnot. But I've got JC uh, Congilia. Did I nail that? Damn. Senior Vice President of Business Development, oversees New Form Digital, joint venture of Discovery, Brian Grazer and Ron Howard, handles deals, partnerships, and operations. This guy has produced 25 pilots and 17 series in production on the foundation of content creator strategy. I'm sure that number's increased or decreased or moved sideways, but. Exactly right right now. Boom, did my research. Yeah. Allison, who is an excellent partner for Eisenberg Group, co-founder and VP of marketing and business development at Tubular, a tool we use, which uses their audiograph and Tubular Lab software technology for analyzing influencers across several platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Vine, Twitter, name a few, uh, are helping power the success that's going on back there at New form digital so how does the storytelling happen guys thank you thanks thank you thank you I've, I've never done a fireside chat before i was hoping that there'd be s'mores or something well I, I always like fireside chat <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was august crazy. la fireside fireside that's, that's, you gotta have I'm it in, in. nice so thank you. Thank you for inviting a, a, a new form. Yes, thank you. So we're saying this is going to be the first fireside where there's questions coming from both, both angles, not just, not just me asking questions of JC, so, right. so get ready. Um, so I wanted to start by just saying a little bit about Tubular and also sharing some, some data, because that's what we do. We're the most widely used video intelligence platform. Um, and so our data and intelligence is usually more interesting than me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a few slides um, that just tells you who we are, what we do, and, and some interesting data points that we've been uncovering about cross-platform video. Then I'm gonna um, turn it over to JC and he's gonna play some videos. So get ready for that. That's gonna be maybe more fun. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the future of the data-driven studio. What does that look like? And very interestingly, there's a lot of brands in the room and um, I think a lot of brands are thinking about how can we build a, 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 a content studio ourselves and not just partner with content creators, but how do we build a studio that helps um, get our message and brand out there and connect directly with fans. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what that, what that looks like. So, let's see if this works. Nope. All right. So um, basically, if you click again, you're going to see a big stat, which is 
of all internet traffic will be video in two years. So you all know this, video is a big deal and it's, it's only growing. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's a lot of video content out there, very fragmented world, you know, HBO Go, Netflix, Meerkat, Snapchat, YouTube, Facebook, there's video everywhere and how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, if you click again, you can see that, keep clicking, there's um, a, a growth in video, but measurement hasn't kept up. So there's no one out there who's measuring all that content, what works, what doesn't, what's trending, and that's the gap that Tubular aims to fill um, and, and give you the data you need to create the right content, distribute on the right platform. If you click a few more times, one more time, yep, keep, just keep clicking. Um, you'll see that we've, we've, we basically are the largest data resource. We're powering video intelligence and that's enabling you to create better content strategy, uh, distribution strategy, paid marketing, finding influencers, connecting with influencers, all these things that data are important for, um, tubular powers. And we work with about 100 enterprise customers, brands, media companies, video platforms. Um, a lot of you are in the room, Mattel, Pepsi, Activision, Warner Brothers. Um, it's been fun catching up with, with customers and um, we, um, we're excited to work with so many of you across the video ecosystem. Um, today we're tracking 30 plus platforms, so it's not just YouTube data, it's Facebook, Instagram, Vine. One day I hope Snapchat, if there's someone from Snapchat here, come talk to me, I would love to. Love to pull your data in as well. Um, but uh, you know, it's a cross-platform universe, as Stephanie from Style Hall was saying this morning. It's not just about one platform, it's about how do you build your presence cross-platform. So interesting trend is this democratization of video creation. Um, anyone's a video creator. So now, you know, NBC has the same power as someone in their basement in Kansas. Anybody can create content and get it seen by an audience. And so what does that mean for brands and media companies? How do you stand out in this crowded universe? Um, how do you create content that resonates with fans when fans are, are getting to choose the type of content they want to watch? And if you click again, it's not just platform proliferation, it's creator proliferation. So you actually have 2.5 million individual publishers on YouTube alone. And 1,200 of them have over a million subscribers, Michelle Fan and, and many other influencers who have um, been stopping by throughout the day. And so there's 20,000 brands that's pretty crowded. Some of them do really well, some of them don't. Um, what's your strategy? How do you use data to create the right kind of content and get seen? Um, and there's a, there's a couple different strategies out there. And um, while JC isn't, isn't necessarily a brand, he is a cutting edge digital driven, uh, data driven digital studio. And so we're gonna learn from him about what he does, what's, what is his strategy. And I think there's a lot that we all can learn from that. Um, and so this is the, the next slide is the last slide. Um, he's gonna talk a bit about PJ and how he found PJ using tubular software and found the data he needed to make some pretty cool decisions. Um, and uh, this is just an example of some of the data that tubular offers. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you Thank to you. launch into to what new form is and, and oh, show some videos. Yeah, of course, of course. So, um, and, and you're seeing the screen here. This is uh, the dashboard that you get, uh, any consumer can actually get. Uh, at uh, the Tubular Labs profile page. So uh, PJ Ligori uh, is our talent that we work with here on a project called Oscars Hotel. He has a YouTube channel called Kick the PJ. Um, as you can see on the, um, uh, on, on the, the, the diagram here, his social reach is kind of 1.4 million. Um, and that's an aggregation of the YouTube channel that he has, his Facebook, his Twitter, his, his uh, his Vine and his Instagram. Um, and so we found uh, PJ uh, about 12 months ago. We at Newform Digital, and, and let me give you the quick background on, on Newform. I can talk a lot about PJ. Um, so Newform is 18 months old. We are a digital studio. Um, we are, our investors, uh, as the introduction said, are Ron Howard, Brian Grazer, and Discovery Communications. Um, and we're really focused on scripted originals uh, for digital audiences. Um, and so these are uh, action adventures, they're dramas, they're comedies. Uh, in, PJ, in PJ's case, it is a, uh, it's a puppet-driven fantasy world. Um, and we typically take um, YouTubers, Vimeos, Vimeoers, Instagrammers, and Viners, uh, and cast them as uh, lead actors, actresses, uh, and in some cases, they're producers, writers, and directors. Um, we uh, have produced exactly 25 pilots in the last uh, in the last 18 months, uh, and luckily, we've sold 17 of those into series, um, and uh, we're really proud of, proud of that stat. Um, I could talk a lot about our, our content, but I think that the video actually does it better justice. So, can we play the the company sizzle? Newform tracked some of us down and gave us a cool opportunity to come together to make a new level of project for the internet. 
new form and asked me if I had any cool ideas. It's so cool that a company is giving creators such a unique opportunity. It's been awesome working with them and just having their faith in us because they also understand that we know our audience the best and they've given us that guidance but also given us a lot of great freedom too. There's some really heavy hitters behind New Form, so getting those kind of notes is just really important for me as a filmmaker. I think New Form is the, the number one digital company when it comes to making really high quality content with YouTubers. It's actually been like the best experience we've had working with a third party. New Form was really, really good because it really helped us fine tune the script and make it amazing. And I don't think we could have done that on our own. that we've produced over the last year. Um, I, I'm excited about this panel because we use Tubular a lot in our business, and we talked about this um, you know, prior to the, this conversation. You should probably charge us for more license seats. Um, we, we use Tubular both in our development process and then in our analytics process. So in our development process, we're casting uh, from these social networks, and, and we need a, a data source that can validate some of our creative assumptions and add on to them. Um, and so we use, we use Tubular to find new talent, uh, and then we use uh, a tubular to kind of cast additional talent for our projects. Um, and the, the quick story that I haven't even told you yet is, you know, we are religious about the dashboards for, from tubular. Uh, we had a casting session that just happened in our office last week. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Lisa Kudrow and Dan Bugatinsky's production company, Is or Isn't, um, and we do all their digital productions. Uh, and we've sold a show to Refinery29. It's an original show. It has the great title of Shitty Boyfriends. It's about shitty boyfriends. Uh, and we were, we're doing a casting session in our office, and it's Dan Bukatinsky who stars in Scandal and other things that you've seen. Uh, Lisa Kudrow, obviously, of Friends, and our development exec. Um, and our development exec is literally pointing to our, our tubular uh, page and saying, this is how big this person is. And th those guys are just nodding. Um, it was cool. It was a cool experience. That's awesome. um, so, so we use tubular to kind of develop our properties and find new talent. Uh, our business model is really on funding pilots and funding proofs of concept. We release those pilots on typically YouTube channels, uh, and then we use Tubular again, and we look at the results of, of, of what is happening in those pilots. Um, and so, uh, and I just have to flip my, my card to get the stats right, but we're, we're releasing a white paper with you guys today, I think. Um, and we looked at these 25 pilots, we put them up on YouTube, we put them up on the channels of the creators that are in our uh, our pilots, and we found that we saw a 150% increase in views on our stuff versus things that are in the channel, and a 33% increase in, in shares, likes, and comments. Um, and so we see our new form uh, scripted content performing, uh, or outperforming basically everything else that's in the channel. Um, and it really validated kind of some of the creative assumptions that we had. Yeah, it's, it's amazing content. I think one of the coolest things that New Form is doing is it's not just um, taking influencers and putting them into the content that they typically create. It's, it's taking influencers and giving them creative license to make something um, that's even better or that's different. So for example, we see on YouTube brands get about 1% engagement on average. Um, and YouTube stars get on average about 6% engagement. And with new form, the content they're creating gets 9% engagement. And it's, um, it's highly engaging content. It's a new form of content. And, um, and it, it's an exciting thing you guys are doing. Yeah, it, it, the, the, um, the fun part of, 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 it, uh, or of using tab Tubular for us, really, in, in this respect, and kind of looking at the results, right, is validating some of these creative assumptions that we have, right? Our creative assumptions are, are basically that, one, uh, YouTubers, Instagrammers, Vimeo, and Viners, these influencers, are the actors, writers, directors of tomorrow. And, and we're starting to really see uh, that play out from the, the quality of the creative. And two, we're starting to see that the audience will stick around for a 15 minute pilot that, that's shot on their, on their page. Uh, and they'll comment and they'll like and they'll share. And that's what these numbers kind of bear out. Yeah, and, and taking, taking um, Tubular out of the picture, you know, what do you see uh, as, as the future of um, digital content, you know, what do you what do you see moving forward? What are you doing that you know you are on the cutting edge of something new? So what is it that you're doing, and what do you see moving forward in the future? Yeah, I, I, so uh, let me tell you exactly what's going to happen with digital content. Um, <laughs> it, uh, I think it looks a thank lot. Thank you, thank you. That'd be really nice. Actually. <laughs> uh, uh, and that was facetious, by the way. Uh, it looks a lot like like your your slide two, right? Um, where you have um, lots and lots of different. Um, outlets that are that are featuring digital video so um, we did a, a quick poll uh, you know my job is to go talk to distributors about these projects um, 
I had a, a, a two-week block. I met with 12 different distributors. Uh, 11 of those 12 weren't weren't investing in original video content two years ago, um, and only four of those 12 existed even three years ago. Uh, and they're all uh, out there licensing new original video content. So we've seen a proliferation of platforms that really need their, for lack of a better reference, house of cards, um, and, and that's what we're trying to produce. Um, I think the other interesting thing is, is what I see kind of in these panels today is uh, brands and advertisers and marketers taking a step kind of outside the spots and dots model uh, and really thinking about kind of content and influence uh, in new and interesting ways and, and how, do they kind of, how do they get there, right? Um, and uh, I guess kind of one of my key takeaways is that um, the data that, that platforms like Tubular provide uh, are a good uh, lingua franca, they're, they're a good um, baseline for us to um, you know, have our conversations about the value of certain influencers. Uh, and that's certainly how we're using your platform today. Great, and if you could give brands three secrets to success around building a digital studio, what three, would it be? Three secrets of two success. To, two to five secrets to success. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll form a line uh, over there. Uh, and, and then JC will whisper something in your exactly, ear. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so uh, a couple secrets of success. So one is uh, we, we have done 25 pilots in a year, and there's a reason for that, right? We think that there uh, is a need in the digital marketplace to produce and produce at volume. And, and I've heard speaker after speaker today talk about uh, what's the appropriate amount of volume of content per social platform, uh, how much should I be producing and when. Uh, and we think from the scripted side that we really need to t turn on the kind of scale thing that happens in digital businesses. Uh, and so we're focused on you know, these 25 pilots and 17 series over the next year. And, and we look, you know, as we look out, we're looking to kind of double and triple those, those numbers. Uh, so scale really helps. Uh, two, you know, we want to leverage kind of what already exists and build upon it. And so, uh, you know, finding the right talent, which we use Tubular or have, on uh, uh, creating the, the content and then validating those assumptions are really important in how we approach this marketplace. Uh, and then I think the, uh, the last uh, piece of advice that I have for anyone starting a, a content studio is um, start 18 months ago. Um, yeah, we're, 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 we're well on pace and, and it, it's a rapidly changing environment. And, and you guys are working with brands as well, right? We are, yeah. So, um, you know, typically we're producing kind of these scripted digital originals. We also talk to a lot of brands who say, hey, I, I want to leverage an influencer in kind of an elevated, more refined production. How do I do that? How do I, you know, how do I choose the right influencers? How do I tell story in, in a concrete, coherent way? Uh, and then how can we work together to kind of make sure that that gets the distribution of these millennial audiences and these digital audiences uh, that, that can really kind of see the, the power of our brand? Um, so we, uh, we uh, just finished a wrapping on a project with Tylenol. Uh, and, and with Tylenol, we created kind of a documentary series, um, all filmed by digital filmmakers and influencers uh, that talk about family. Um, and it's done really well for the, for the brand. And I feel like a question people often ask about influencer marketing is how do you measure ROI on it or does it work? And how do you guys track success of working with with influencers? Yeah, I, I mean, that's that's a that's a really hard one. So uh, it's a hard one, but I think we're kind of getting there, right? Um, and so uh, part of what we're, what we're, our thesis is, is that influencers bring their audience, right? And it, it um, everyone here um, throughout the day talked about a lot about this, but when we talk to distributors, you know, they think about how much they're spending in production and how much they're spending in something like P&A to market th their product. And they look at, a, at a, a studio like ours and they say, wow, we can leverage kind of that entire social footprint um, to, to market around the productions that we're working with you guys on. Um, and so uh, our success turns out to be how are we motivating those audiences to kind of go, uh, the audiences of the, the stars that we're, we're casting, uh, to go uh, consume the content that we're creating, um, either on a YouTube platform or on a, a different platform. Um, and it might be a great time actually to show, uh, if we could pull up that last slide that we were talking about. So we, we started, um, to talk a little about this guy PJ, right? And so uh, PJ Ligori, he is a UK filmmaker. He started on YouTube, uh, I believe, five and a half to six years ago. Uh, he is a puppet maker. He made uh, uh, many of his puppets out of cardboard to start. Uh, he's a rabid following on YouTube, so something like 750 subscribers. Um, we uh, we know of him. We used Tubular to kind of validate some of the assumptions that we knew about PJ. Uh, we gave him a little bit of money to make a pilot for us in October of last year. We shot that pilot. 
Um, and then we put it up on his YouTube channel. Uh, and then we looked at the tubular numbers around the uh, success of that, that pilot, and, it, and especially around the success of that pilot vis-a-vis -vis other things in his channel, right? Uh, and we saw that we were getting double the amount of views uh, and triple the amount of watch time on our pilot versus everything else that's in that channel. Uh, and so then we took that, that, that data set and the creative that we had and took it out to the marketplace. Um, and we took it to Vimeo, and Vimeo came in, and, and they said, we want to invest in this property. We want to turn this into something bigger. Uh, and they gave us a little bit of budget to go make a, uh, a thank you, a, uh, uh, a series that will debut on, on Vimeo on September the 15th. So Oscars Hotel for fa Fantastical Creatures. Uh, please set your browsers to oscarshoteltheseries.com and go pre-order the series. Um, we, we took that, that those dollars from Vimeo. Uh, we uh, recast kind of our, our pilot uh, and went out to a wider group of influencers to star in Oscars Hotel. Uh, and we ended up casting uh, 40 of the biggest social media influencers out there, uh, including PewDiePie, Cutie Pie, uh, Grace Helbig, Hannah Hart, Mamrie Hart, uh, Tyler Oakley, uh, and others. Um, and uh, we can show the sizzle. So if you can just uh, watch the place for me, I'll be back in about a week. A, a week? Um, Uncle, I don't know if I'm exactly qualified. Oh, don't worry. The place practically runs itself. Runs itself. Do me proud, Oliver. See you in about a week. <laughs> So uh, it, that really came about from a lot of creative energy, uh, but we used data to kind of sell it through. And um, you already have seen some pretty promising um, results around uh, pre-tune-in. Do you want to share some of those stats? Yeah, so um, y you know, Vimeo is a great platform. Uh, they have um, uh, <laughs> the trailer that we've cut, or that, that sizzle actually, has been seen well over a million times in the last three weeks. Uh, we released it at uh, Jim Lauderback's VidCon um, at, and the keynote, um, and the the uh, the influencers and the fans went went, went crazy, um, and it uh, we have pre-sales on on Vimeo on demand. Uh, what they're telling us 10x what it, what a typical um, on demand on demand show has for them. Uh, so we're so excited. influencers work. Yeah, and great content works. We hope. Yeah. So we have about five minutes left. Um, I want to see if there's any questions. And uh, if not, we, we can keep asking each other questions. What was the budget? <laughs> Hard hitting. Oh, Rita, you just go right for it. I like that about you. Uh, so the budget is, uh, the best way for me to, to say the budget for that is it is less than one episode of a network show for a series. For like a, like a, a show like Community, let's say. Yep. <laughs> So are you gaming the system? You know, are you trying to precast based on data first, talent second, or what's going on? You're kind of, let's cast these guys, let's make it, and then I'm gonna take the data because I casted them on the data to show proof of concept. Give me a little, I'm just trying to figure this out a little, uh, yeah, understand yeah. this. So uh, there, there's two things that are happening, right? We're using data to inform our development and casting process. Um, and and we, we now have all these data sources at our fingertips to be able to uh, point to the create point and validate to the creative choices that we're making um, and that happens through, through tubular um, and through things like our pilots that we're, we're self-releasing we can then both build an audience um, and, and uh, prove out kind of those creative choices um, and so um, uh, to answer your question I, I think talent and numbers are related right um, the, the most popular and best YouTubers are, are there for a reason uh, and have big numbers for a reason. Um, and, uh, and we're certainly using platforms like Tubular to help find them uh, and to kind of cast the right way. Now that all being said, 
uh, we have casting directors, we have people with years of experience in producing and writing and directing that are, that are putting these things together. The, uh, the punchline that I didn't say about Oscars Hotel is well, we were 10 days away from shooting and we got a phone call uh, from Lisa Henson uh, who had seen the pilot and she said, who is this guy, how, do you, how did you find him and how can we be involved? Um, and so they put the puppets together for us. And one other thing that's interesting about the data is um, data is not just uh, how many subscribers you have or how many views you have, it's how fast you're growing and um, what's your influencer score and questions like that that um, dig deeper into finding who are rising stars. Um, and so it's not just you know people at the top who are already at the top who everyone knows are at the top, um, but but someone like PJ who's um, who's a rising star with a rabid fan base and also a huge amount of talent. How do you find those people and build properties around them um, and and rise together? Um, so you know one of Tubular's earliest customers was Awesomeness TV, and they were working um, with Bethany Moda before she was Bethany Moda. Um, and so the idea: can you find the right talent to build your empire along with, and then find the next rising talent and go from there? I think is is um, uh, is a key for for anyone looking to build a video audience. And, and that's a great point too. I, I think because you guys have the data sources that are beyond just YouTube or beyond just YouTube and Facebook, candidly, um, you can kind of capture some of that rising energy uh, faster. Um, I think that that all of your data sources inform your your bigger influencer number. And one of the things that we pass along quite a bit in the office is, you know, your top 25 monthly um, in, uh, influencer tracking. Um, and we look at both your aggregated list as well as each individual platform. We see who's peaking and, and we try to, you know, kind of reverse engineer that a little bit. Um, for you guys, right, we're using your platform in a way that you probably didn't conceive of when, when you built the thing. Um, what, are, what are other examples of people like us that are, that are um, repurposing basically this great tool? Yeah, I think um, video intelligence is the key and there's so much you can do with data and intelligence and we're excited by everything that everybody is doing. So one is obviously influencer identification. Um, another is trending topics. You know, what are moms watching? What's trending with moms? What's their favorite type of content? Um, not just who are influencers that are popular with them, but what are different video types? Um, you know, for example, there's a trend right now called getting unready with me, where people at the end of the night take their makeup off and film that, not just putting it on in the morning. So for brands out there, can you track interesting content trends and, and make videos that are in that genre in order to kind of connect with, with fans and be a part of the conversation that's already happening? Um, also, you know, 80% of a, of a brand's content is, uh, in video is UGC generated. It's not um, generated by the brand itself. So can you find those people who are already talking about you? What are they saying? Can you give them um, products to, um, to help them and be a part of the story? Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of interesting things. People can use it for, for optimizing paid promotion or for tracking and benchmarking. Um, a lot of different things to do, but we find that you know, everybody is looking for intelligence and, and we're out there to try and give it to them. Uh, and then, could you just talk a minute, I know we're, we're slightly over, but can you talk just a minute on um, kind of how the new platforms and the, and the data from the new platforms, like what do you, one of the things we're thinking about is how do we market this thing, Oscars Hotel, right? How do we make a, a killer Facebook video that, that will get, uh, the sound will pop on and people will share it. Um, what are you guys seeing on, on, on different platforms? Yeah, interesting. Um, we There's a white paper that's fr floating around here that has some of our analysis cross-platform, um, but we do see different topics pop on different platforms. So for example, Facebook is big with news, a ton of news content on Facebook. Vine is really big in comedy and sports. YouTube is really big in entertainment and gaming and beauty. And so how do you know, you know, based on what you're creating, there's different platforms you should live on, different ways you should promote it. Um, but the key is, you know, finding those passionate fan bases. And if, if you are working with influencers, obviously market um, your PJ content to PJ fans, and that's um, that's that's going to be successful. Um, but yeah, there's 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 a huge amount of data. We're tracking it all. Um, if people are curious, um, you can download the white paper on realseo.com. Um, but we're you know continuing to analyze these platforms and and um, the similarities and differences and and what works best. Awesome. Thank you. Fabulous, guys. Thank you. Very well done. Uh, yeah, make sure, Al, so make sure you share that so we can uh, share that white paper. I'm sure people want to get access to that. Maybe we can retweet it as well as, uh, I know I mentioned earlier, we've got a white paper going around seven points of influencers that are being shared through the stream, so maybe we can share that as well and a link to that, guys. 1% um, brand engagement, 
storytellers through uh, influencers, 6%, new form, 9%, watching it through Facebook's ad roll on video, 50%. The uh, Facebook guys, I'm sure, are, uh, you know, the ability to watch video and drive through better content and better analytics clearly uh, is showing some power there. So congratulations to success with those guys over there. Um, all right, next up, what do we got next? Halo, I never heard of that. Audio killed the video star. So uh, I know when we're planning for this session, it brought me back to something. I used to listen to actually the original Star Wars back in the day on tape cassette. I mean, all two hours. This is uh, the first one. Just put me to sleep every night. Flash forward 35 years later, I found myself back in the same mind space, though, when I was listening to the 13 hours or 13 episodes of Hunt the Truth. So you guys captured something really special here. I was riveted, by the way, all the way to the very end um, as a fan. So to share the story behind the story of creating a story behind the story of Master Chief. Please welcome Ryan Cameron, Xbox Director of Marketing and Communications, responsible for many things over there, uh, working with Ryan over the years, including management of the Halo and Forza franchise, as well as Noah Eichen. He's our creative director at Eisenberg Group and really a thought leader behind this, uh, this overall concept and being able to share this thinking today. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Come thank on you. Down. Thank you, Chris. All right. Hey, so Ryan. We're, we're here talking about radio at a video conference. So That's right. That's good yeah. One. All right. So um, what is Hunt the Truth? We'll start there. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Hunt the Truth is it's the campaign for Halo 5 Guardians, but it became this audio series that's uh, spread over 13 weeks uh, during the course of March all the way to June. Uh, and it really told the story uh, of Master Chief. Uh, and our, our protagonist uncovered some not so nice things about him. Right. Do we have a video? Yeah, we, we do. So let's, let's, let's play that, that first kind of set up right. uh, the campaign. There are reactions that every marketer dreams of creating. This looks fucking awesome. On March 29th, 2015, we got millions of them. How did this happen? To find out, we have to go back. To a time when Xbox was wrestling with a very tricky question. How do you reinvigorate a franchise that has pumped out 10 titles since 2002? Well, if you're Halo 5, you flip the franchise on its head. You introduce a new hero, and make your old hero act like a villain. Then you create advertising deliberately designed to make Halo fans question everything they thought they knew. We began with a literal warning shot across the Halo Nation's bow. We launched it with a Tumblr page that featured one bullet and one word. An image so provocative that our fans hacked the Tumblr and pulled down the film it came from 24 hours before its premiere. The video also featured a hidden interactive message the viewer could discover that revealed the story of Master Chief. And just as that piece of content was catching fire, we released episode one of a 12-part serial-style podcast series to muddy the waters. In Elysium City, people just disappeared back then. One week later, on the most watched show of the year, we launched two commercials in the same program that were at once almost identical and yet total opposites of each other. The conquering hero. The one who was supposed to save us all. But now I must save us. From you. You've completed your mission, Spartan Locke. Mine is just beginning. Then we sat back and watched as the internet exploded. We generated these news stories, and fans went crazy, which leads us right back to these guys. Yeah, it's insane. Halo Ooh, wow. Oh, Halo shit, son. There are reactions that every marketer dreams of creating. It worked. Yeah, so, so show of hands, who knows who Master Chief is in the audience? Or there's don't. So Master Chief is basically the, the hero of Halo. He's the Boy Scout, he's invincible. And so what we are trying to do here is really call into question everything you've ever, th everything you ever thought you knew about Halo and really question you know, Master Chief and, and whether or not he was a good guy still and kind of flip that on, on the head. So, so that, that was kind of the, the idea here. It was really about creating that symbol of reevaluation for this franchise because we needed to really jar gamers from their complacency to think that this isn't just another Halo game. Um, this is one to pay attention to. And so the, the ask that came to us was, hey, we've got this, uh, this, this teaser coming out, and then a week later, these two commercials. We need something to fill that week, some content to support it, to, to connect the stories. 
and uh, get fans really excited. And this is this is back in March. So the game launches in October. We're talk we've got a long ways to go. Um, and so I actually saw the the bullet teaser. Someone showed it to me, and I was like, I mean, as a, someone who's played Halo from the beginning, I was like, what the, you know, what? Why? Who's shooting Master Chief? Why is he a trait? I had all these questions, and immediately, you know, I was also listening, and a lot of us were at Eisenberg to Serial, the podcast at that point, and they just kind of connected, and it was like, we need to do an audio series, something that can be in the in the world, and that can tell this story of the words in the bullet. Now, from there, it exploded into, as we, as we brought the idea to you guys, um, I think you guys connected with it as well, and then it's, it soon expanded into a three-and-a-half-hour, 14-episode, three-month campaign that it we never It was as easy expected. as that. Yeah, it was you know, that it was easy. It was so easy. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you, you take a game that takes two to three years to make and a lot of you know, focus and perfection, and we have a wonderful agency like Eisenberg who says, we've got this idea and we want to launch it in three weeks. And so it was... Uh, <laughs> and it's going to start Keegan-Michael yeah, Key from Key yeah, & Peele. It's yeah, going to be so, really dramatic. It's <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, uh, obviously there's, there's barriers to, to making this thing right and making it at the kind of have the quality bar that, that the, the, the game deserves because at the same time, as this is kind of part of marketing, it really becomes part of the product. It is the fiction of Halo. And so everything needs to be really true to the brand and true to, that, true to the overall lore. So, um, how do you, how do you feel that the the podcast worked to support the the campaign creative as a mm -hmm. whole? You know, what what do you think it did for the campaign? Where you guys were trying something really you know crazy with the with the TV marketing, what do you think it did for for the fan base and for the people who you know have been the core followers for Halo for for so long? Right. You know, going out so early with with marketing for for a game is is challenging because yes, we're going to raise awareness earlier on. However, you still then need to continue that engagement. And I think uh, the podcast was a perfect way to really give fans content and value for early engagement and continue to, to tell that story and kind of have this modern story uh, telling approach uh, through, through the spring and kind of leading us into some of our other key, key marketing beats. Yeah, and one thing that we did I think that was really fun and, and I, you know, I think fans really resonated with was we had that first meeting with 343 who's the developer of the game and we went in with some ideas, and immediately they, they latched on, and they had ideas of their own of how we could tie it into characters from the universe and other things. And immediately we started coming up with touch points that were pulling up the, the key art from Halo 2 or a commercial from Halo 3 and, and folding them into the story where it made all of the marketing campaigns Halo's ever done connected and made it this one big universe of It was all of perfectly story planned. Yeah. It, was, yes. it really was, yes. yes. Yeah, no, I think, I think one of the things that, that um, the development studio, 343 Industries, really appreciated is that there were some loose ends in the, in the Halo fiction that they wanted to help kind of tie together, and this really allowed for, for that. Um, but I think another key thing that, that uh, the podcast did is, you know, the, the campaign um, tagline and hashtag and conversation that we're trying to drive is, is hunt the truth and really to understand really what is going to happen in the game. And, and what we're able to do with this program is really just give answers throughout that lead to more questions. And the more questions that we drive, the more conversation that we see. And, and that's just been a, a perfect kind of equation for, for the campaign of, of continuing to be you know, thought-provoking, but also driving those questions because that drives further, further speculation, further intrigue, and, and uh, social chatter that way. Yeah, I think one of, the, one of the, the challenges was keeping people engaged over the course of the 13 weeks between Bullet and All Hail to Cost and E3, where there were some other great announcements, game focused. But um, wh wh how, how do you think, or, or what do you think is important about the way that, um, you know, in the campaign we reached out to fans and, and engaged them with content on Twitter and, and through these other channels? How, we had all these different digital touch points. You know, how, how was it for you connecting all of those and, and engaging fans? where they are already sort of uh, engaging with content. You know, what was important about that? Yeah, I think you know, a lot of conversation today has been around storytelling and kind of having that, that, uh, that spine of a, of a great story and, and having the podcast allowed us to have that through our marketing. So our marketing had this great storyline. So all of our various touch points from CRM um, and our email um, uh, campaigns towards, towards our kind of loyalist fans to, to you know, uh, smaller videos that we might uh, put onto Facebook to, to even our web, website um, construction kind of could, could tie into these various pieces of, of the, uh, the podcast. So it, would, it provided this perfect connection, connective tissue. 
Yeah, so we had these great videos. Mm -hmm. the, those were being distributed through our channels, but now we also had this podcast that was telling the story in a way that Halo hadn't really talked to fans before and in a place that they hadn't really been talked to before. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that podcasts allow marketers to, to reach fans in a new way? Um, in, in that, you know, a lot of times you don't think about, especially when you're creating a lot of video content, how you talk to people in their cars right. or while they're reading or doing other things. Mm -hmm. We, we kind of found throughout that this was a unique way to talk to people. Yeah. Um, oh, certainly, and, and, and I think, you know, Halo, the product itself kind of rests on this, of this idea of fiction. You know, it is a, a sci-fi universe, very rich, and that's one of the, the key tenets of the brand. And so having a, a, a long form format that really uses the theater of the mind and, you know, the, the kind of a radio audio format just allows for people's imaginations to take this story to, to, to their fullest uh, uh, point. So. Yeah, I mean, I spent, you know, season one was kind of crazy. Like you said, we started yeah. three weeks essentially before we launched. Right. Um, and so every week we were writing and producing the episodes almost live. Like there were some days on Saturday we were still finishing a cut. Right. Sorry to tell you that now. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, what was interesting to me was that I, it made me very engaged in the content. So I was watching the social channels a lot as we'd release episodes and see people talking about the content. Mm -hmm. And they were connecting with it in a way that was I'd never seen before. I mean, they, people were talking about sitting in front of their computer screen like it was the 1940s, mm -hmm. and that they, they were waiting for this more than they were waiting for Game of Thrones or other things. And, and it just became this, this really personal experience for them. And I think that's, that can be challenging, and, but it, it, it's something that I think is really important, especially with a brand like Halo. Yeah. So all that being said, you know, how, how important is sort of brand, infi brand affinity when right. it comes to a brand like Halo or, yeah. or other games you work on? Well, I think um, kind of two, two of the things that we've seen with this is kind of frame it up this way is that, you know, the, it's clear that if you have a compelling hook, so our hook being that you know, Master Chief is potentially a villain, um, but also having a very open-ended question, uh, open-ended story. So something that, that leaves that cliffhanger moment throughout, continuing to drive more and more questions as we give, give further answers. That kind of pulls in fans that are already, you know, already hacking Tumblr to try to get to answers about the game uh, prior, to, the, prior to, to its release. I think, um, uh, so I think having that brand affinity and, and, and also having a brand that, that already stands for rich fiction really helped us. And also, I mean, I think as, as the brand is sort of being turned on its head a little bit, right? I mean, yeah. what, what is being done with Halo 5 is, is really flipping the whole, mm -hmm. the whole thing. So the other thing that the podcast did, I think, was open up a new segment of the world mm -hmm. that all these people haven't seen before. Yeah. Um, which was a, a really unique thing because we love playing the games, we love going and killing aliens, mm -hmm. but we don't know what like the boxing coach is like as a person usually, right. or you know the the girl that she that he used to lay with the, in the grass was mm -hmm. like uh, with and, and that kind of stuff. So we got to see a, a side of Master Chief mm -hmm. and other character, characters in the world and how they feel about things, and and I I think the hope is that 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 creates a weight. So when you're playing the game, if you're really invested in the story you now feel that you are protecting those people that you just got to know through right. three and a half hours. Right, and, and also all of those, all those characters allowed us to, you know, you can probably talk to this in great detail, you know, bringing in even fans into this program. So there were, you know, a number of vocal fans uh, really excited about, about the podcast, and, and it allowed us to, kind of the real-time yeah. production of this allowed us to incorporate that. I mean, I think one of the coolest things we did, and we, I feel like we did a lot of cool things in, in season one, and we had a lot of fun, but... Um, we noticed the fans were so engaged in the content and that they were they were dying to participate. And so we, we started with some, some small things. We'd send out like little uh, boxing cards from the gym that Master Chief trained at to fans on Twitter. And those influencers would then create a video about that. What does this card mean? Why did they send it to me? What's going on? And we, we found that we were getting all this content being created just out of us sharing with people. And so we sent out the word to all the major Halo influencers there's like five or six that have pretty good followings, you know, Halo followers, 275,000 uh, followers on YouTube. And we sent the word out, we said, hey guys, look, we're doing an episode coming up where we could use voicemail messages. And we want these messages to be in support of Ben, who's the protagonist, or against him, or just prank calling him and making fun of him. And we gave them sort of like a one sheet, kind of, kind of like you would do with an influencer brief, uh, and tell them, you know, go to town, tell your fans to start creating them. And if, if they're great, we're gonna, we're gonna put them in the podcast. And we got over 500 submissions, audio submissions fully produced. These guys wrote their own scripts. They, they got super into it. 
And in episode six of the podcast, you can hear, you know, 40 or 50 fans leaving messages for the, the main character of the series, who then turns around and comments on, the, on those messages. I remember the, in that video, there's one guy from Australia who, he was, uh, he, got a, he got a call from Ian, who, who did our outreach, and, and uh, you know, he's like, he, Ian was like, hey, you know, we're really big fan of your videos. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, we watch all your videos, all your videos you make about Hunt the Truth. He's like, what the fuck? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, the people at Xbox, they've seen your videos, they really like you, and he lost his mind. And so he, he got his own special spot in the podcast. But I mean, that kind of stuff, uh, re it, really, uh, it really did a lot to help these guys um, build evangel evangelism for the, the show. And they, they would talk all day about it. And we never did you know, payments or anything like that. They were just huge fans that got involved. Right, and I think uh, related to that, just the, the number of, of professional actors that wanted to get involved. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I mean, touch that, was, that. that was like the most incredible thing from, from the get go. I mean, we. We batted around who we wanted to star in it, and you know, Keegan Michael Key's name had been thrown around, and I've been I've been a huge fan of his, and I knew from uh, Matt Bretz, who works at our, who was talking to Morgan earlier, who's friends with Keegan. You know, he's got a dramatic background, and and so and I, I I could just tell he would nail it, and so we we locked Keegan down, and once we got him in, people just started falling in line, and I gave like a wish list to my producer, and like one after another, they all felt they like they all fell in place, and we got everybody we wanted from. Kobe Smulders from How I Met Your Mother and uh, the Avengers films to um, some very famous video game names like Troy Baker and Phil Lamar uh, to uh, Janina and it just lists on and on and on. It was incredible. And the, the my favorite of all of them though is like the one you wouldn't expect. I was most starstruck by Stacy Keish, who's uh, like a really he's a he's an older actor and he's been in everything. And he was the one guy I was like, Stacy, it's so nice to meet you, Mr. Keish. Like I was just so like starstruck. Um, but it was great. And 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 heading into season two, which we're about to start recording actually on Saturday, um, we got some amazing names coming through. So it's, it's just been incredible. And I think they're all excited by this idea of this audio format coming back. Uh, so I don't know if should we take some questions yeah. or do you want to talk about what's coming up before we do that? With, uh, within the campaign, do you have any thoughts or anything story you want to continues. share? Yeah, story <laughs> continues. October 27th. Uh, cool, any questions? Yeah, I, I think it was a test in that sense. Um, you know, we, we hadn't been down this road before. Um, and, but I think it also, um, you know, one of our key goals is obviously to be a, a very social campaign, so driving continuous conversation. And, and so from just a, a baseline metric standpoint, having, you know, I think over 6 million yeah, listeners. Yeah, it, it's over six, you know, somewhere of 6 million now. Yeah, uh, to, and seeing the social chatter around the podcast on a weekly basis just, you know, achieved that goal for us. Okay, cool. Six million. Whew. I was wondering, uh, it's a two-part question. Uh, for Noah, have you thought at all about how, if, if you have created a genre in this kind of video category? Like, could you create a podcast for, say, Bleach? Um, and, then, uh, and, then, and then for Ryan, could you see... Um, working something like this on another IP, or would there be like a Me Too problem? Should I go first? So yes, I think you could create a, a podcast for Bleach. I think that although this has been done before and, and it was the sort of um, dominant way of telling stories back before television, you haven't seen a lot of it recently. And I think people forget that in a world where we're just constantly you know, being wowed by visuals, you kind of become numb to that. And although we, we love our visuals, um, when I'm driving my car, I can't watch the latest Transformers movie or something. So it, it, it allows me to kind of imagine what I'm being you know, played in my head. And, and with really good sound design, which I think we have in, in Hunt the Truth, you can sort of get taken away and you, you can experience a $500 million movie in your head. And you, can, you begin, like when you're reading a good book, to, to imagine the characters and imagine the places and imagine what's going on. That being said, as a narrative, I think that works really well for Halo. For Clorox, narrative may not be the ideal option, but I do think in all of social media, we don't want to be just advertised to. We want to be experiencing things that are enjoyable 
or they're helping us in some way. So yeah, I think if there was a podcast about the 500 ways that bleach could help me in my daily life, I'd listen. You know, like I, I think like there's companies like Lowe's who do this really well on social, like where they, if you go on Lowe's Vine channel, for instance, you learn how to like use coffee grinds to clean your grill and it's the greatest thing ever. So I, I think that in social exp explicitly, like we want to be helped in our daily lives. We don't want to be advertised to. So I hope that answers yeah, your question. Yeah, it's kind of product as marketing. Yeah. Which I think, uh, and, and to your other question, I think um, we were already compared to cereal, you know, which was the um, kind of original uh, piece here. And, and I think what really matters is, is the podcast good or not and having great quality. And so, yeah, I would be open to it. Oh, good. I have plenty of ideas. <laughs> we're already doing one. <laughs> I know you guys will be around if you want to tackle any more. Are we all good right now? We got one more minute. Any other questions? Come on. All right. Chris is kicking us off. All right. Awesome. Oh, sorry. Question. Hold on. We do have. Wait. We want more. Coming out there, like younger, like new players. Well, I think even, yeah, even from the video that we kind of showed, there's there's a definitely a breadth of of kind of demographic. And I think it, it really shows that, you know, you don't have to be, you know, involved in Halo before to really get into the story. And yeah, I, I also would say that, um, so I, I got a, there was some, I don't know where the survey was, but it, it spoke to that. The podcast really did a lot of work to, um, to not just speak to core, but to speak to mass and, and talk to new people who would not usually listen to something like this because we, we approached it in a, in a very, um, very easy to um, to take in way, um, and I would say that I also saw people commenting on like Twitter and stuff like that about how their mom would walk in on them listening, and they thought they were listening to like NPR, and then like you know someone would get shot, and they're like, "What's going on?" Like it, <laughs> it became a thing where where you you got like people started getting their families into it, and like they become it became like this familiar experience where people would sit around listening to this podcast. So, yeah, thank you. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, if you're, uh, if you're all into sci-fi or conspiracy, you can listen to all 13 episodes, Hunt the Truth, uh, through your podcast, and you don't even have to be a Halo fan at all and be riveted by, by the creative process. So these really good job, guys. Uh, you know, I often think of Master Chief, and then I can't help but think about Barbie. So <laughs> good luck. Barbie's coming next here, so I want to. We got to get both sides of the story here, guys. So let's just do that. Let's get into Barbie, the focus of the case study, incorporating the YouTube prevailing trends to reimagine Barbie as a vlogger. Well, well, well. And drive brand awareness, to eager fans in a manner that is native to the channel. How are you guys doing that? I am very curious. Let me do a quick intro here on Leanne and Julia that are coming out here from Mattel today over there from El Segundo. So thank you for braving the traffic. First of all, Leanne's part of theatrical, uh, she's a theatrical marketing entertainment veteran, joined Mattel about 10 years ago, blending a passion of content uh, along with uh, a portfolio behind her and experience in ch children's brands. Once a Barbie girl with her own dream house, tell her own stories. I think you kind of want to be a vlogger there, uh, Leanne. Uh, the focus of delivering the right content to the core consumer, the right content platforms that bring brands like Barbie, Hot Wheels, and Monster High to life. So Leanne, thank you, as well as her partner in crime, Julia, is leading the feature filmed initiatives at actually Mattel's Playground Productions, which is encompasses at extending existing brands as well as identifying, developing, producing new IP. And prior to Mattel, Julia had an 11 year tenure at Nickelodeon, where she helped build a number of lucrative television and film franchises and successfully extended the Nickelodeon brand into a leading provider of family friend movies. So more importantly, we've got Heather Vernon on stage. She's part of uh, our director of client services and is uh, native every day, actually, as a, a member of the account team and leadership here. But uh, it's your job to grill these ladies. And I want to figure out how Barbie's going native oh, in the I, lobby there. So uh, let's have some fun. <laughs> Go right. for it, guys. Sounds good. How, how's my volume? I'm a loud talker, so. Microphones make me a little nervous. Um, so yeah, so thanks for the intro, Chris. I think what we'll do is go ahead and dig right in and show a little clip of Barbie's first vlog post, just in case some of you didn't get to catch it quite yet. I'm gonna go ahead <laughs> and roll that clip. Hi, uh, okay, let's see. Where should I start? Um, my name is Barbie Roberts. Uh, I have three sisters and we live in Los Angeles. Well. 
Malibu. But um, I'm originally from Wisconsin. We moved here when I was eight years old. My parents are both writers, and they just really loved the idea of raising their kids by the beach. But we still go back to Wisconsin every single year for the holidays, so I feel like we get the best of both worlds. I get to surf, and I get to snowboard. My friends and I just really love sharing new ideas, um, new music, favorite movies, videos, tips on personal style. So my sister Skipper wanted me to start this vlog. Ta-da! My first post. Introducing myself. Here are 10 things you may or may not have known about me. My two favorite co- Okay, guess we're gonna cut it off there. So you'll have to you'll have to tune in. You'll have to tune in to find out more. <laughs> not in many more things. Cliffhanger. <laughs> um, so why don't we just go ahead and, and dig right in and just talk about the inspiration and even the process behind you know reimagining Barbie as a vlogger. I think creating this very authentic, specific personality is something different than what we've we've seen before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think first I would I would like just like to acknowledge the fact that it's so fun to come up here and be Barbie, right? After all of the speakers today, and I think there's so many different perspectives and experiences with that brand out there um, in the audience, whether you've seen her as a pop culture icon at SNL or you grew up playing with her like I did. Um, I think what's interesting about this brand is it's really about a girl's imagination and how she's playing out that imagination and, and really on a path to self-discovery. And so I think ultimately this platform allowed us a really unique opportunity, I think, to begin to have that voice and really speak to, I think, what already this brand is really you know, resonating and, and delivering, I think, as, um, as a promise to girls. Uh, yeah, I, would say, I would say yes to all of that. And, and also the thing that's interesting is that um, Barbie for years has not really had a voice. And you know, right now, in a year that a woman is running for president, we talk about how Barbie was the first person on the moon. Barbie was the first woman who ran for president. Barbie had all these firsts, but you know, she's never really spoken. So right now, it's great. We have a woman running for president. It's great that you can break the glass ceiling, but what's really important is what you say. So when we were given the opportunity to actually give her a voice, doing it on YouTube seemed the most authentic to give her personality than you know, anything else that we've done. So it's really, really exciting and fun. Yep. Yeah, I imagine. Were there any other sort of YouTube channels or vloggers out there that you were inspired by or that she was inspired by? Yeah, I think holistically it's really more about the idea of vlogging and I think it's really about how we more, and I, this is an overused word, but I kind of authentically connect with our consumers and I think, you know, vlogging is such a popular way that, you know, our fans are already engaging on the platform that we just wanted to find a way more authentically to bring her to life. Um, it was actually the brainchild of a gentleman who's not with us here today, Isaac Hiroga, um, many of you know, and um, I think he really saw that opportunity for us to really, I think, take a leap into, um, you know, something that would deliver on that, on that with, you know, with, with girls and with our fans kind of around the world, and I think that's what really kind of was more our aspiration was, how do we do it, and in essence, how do we really deliver like the first animated character, you know, really in this form, and that was what really excited us, but of course, you know, scared us too, because ultimately then we had to deliver on it creatively, which Julia's done such a great job of. Well, and I, I'll say that the secret shout out is, um, I am a mother of three children. I have a 16 year old daughter, so I was a Barbie girl. My daughter loved Barbie. My, my daughter is now this amazing, wonderful feminist woman who is just on our phone all the time. On ev she just lives social 100%. So everything that we write, <laughs> I run by her. So it's not that there's a <laughs> vlog that I'm watching. She's like, mom. You know, like, oh, that's not what people do. So we, we have uh, our own Anna Eisenman uh, shout out. Great, great. I mean, have you learned anything new from your audience yet that maybe you didn't know before you were doing the vlog? Well, we, we, devour, we, we totally 100% devour every single comment. I mean, I just, I live on it. Like, we, we are Barbie, as it is our, our vlog post, right? We're just watching it all the time. So we, have done vlogs based on what people said they want to see, what people like. So it's complete. What we love is it's completely real time. We've created what, for what is for us a really new and amazing animation um, model. As Leanne said, we want this to be as day and date as possible. So while it's the first video vlogger, it's not done. You know, it's not scripted a long time in advance and just put up there and run through a bunch of marketers. It's done in as close to real time with mocap as possible, so that we can respond to. Um, 
through our fans and our subscribers. Yeah, and I think we're onto something because like we po we posted this first uh, vlog, which you'll have to go check out the rest, um, just a couple weeks ago, and within like the first six days, we had you know we had we had you know more likes than we'd had on any other video we'd put up for the previous you know six months. Um, so you know right away you do you get that instant feedback right from an audience in terms of how they're engaging, and you know you're on the right path, and you can lean into that and really deliver more, and that's. That's the beauty of this and what's so exciting and so different than anything else we've ever produced before. And, and I think it's going to affect our content and sort of the brand across the board. I mean, literally, people are like, we like that hairstyle. It's like, oh, OK. So <laughs> we'll Getting do a doll of that hairstyle, or we'll put that in a movie. But I mean, it, it's just wonderful to have a, a real-time connection. Yeah, communicate directly with your audience like yeah. that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for those of us who may have come from, you know, sort of longer form content, you know, creation, it's like when we animate our movies, we do a ton of research, but usually it's a stage where you can't really incorporate that feedback in in real time, you know, into it. So you can't change the hairstyle that you have in a movie necessarily. So that's what's so wonderful about this platform is, it's quick, it's real, and you can react. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, about three months ago was when the first vlog launched, is that about right? And already over one million views, mm -hmm. and the channel over 750,000 subscribers. So I think we could all agree, okay, it seems like this is working, but can you speak any more to KPIs that you guys are using to measure performance? Yeah, sure. I think it's it's uh, it's complicated, right? Because we do have so much data and so many so many analytics to look at. But I think there's several factors, and um, one certainly is engagement. And I appreciated the comment that that's kind of a complex, you know, kind of broad term. Um, but like the likes that we're getting, and I think you know, getting the kind of shares that we see and sort of getting all that feedback is certainly you know one important KPI for us. Um, I think retention and looking at how we're keeping our consumers and how the, you know how much watch time and how long that content is then leading to more engagement across the rest of the content we're programming into our channels is is also critical. Um, I think for us, you know, we're, um, it's a global brand, right? And it's, um, so we have an audience that, you know, is voracious for this content around the world. So we're also really considering, you know, how this content resonates um, with our fans. And um, I would say, Last but not least is, is you know, how are our fans discovering this content? And is it because we're doing a really good job of programming and, and driving them through with things like annotation? Or is it really that it's becoming very searchable, meaning that we're really getting a lot of engagement and therefore YouTube is favoring our content you know, through their own algorithm? So I think it's a mixture of all of those things that we're ultimately looking at. Um, but I would say engagement's a really important one because seeing fans like and share and comment is, um, is what's unique about this and really rewarding. Do you think you'll ever tie, is there an e-commerce part of this, or is this really all about brand awareness and expansion? I don't think we'll do e-commerce. I mean, she's, this is, you know, we do content for Barbie. Barbie's not just about driving product. Um, I think that uh, right now wouldn't really be authentic. I think right now she is, she is who she is. Yeah, and I think ultimately, this is a content platform, you know what I mean? It's ultimately a channel that sort of what's unique about it is that ultimately we're not only the creators, but we're also the programmers and we're the advertisers. So we're sort of everything in an ecosystem where typically we've been reliant on so many other partners in that process. And so I think that makes it, you know, somewhat unique, but we definitely view it as a content platform along those disciplines. And, um, and that's... That's really, I think, what the benefit of the platform is. And I, I think we would add, too, that just because I'm, I'm so in love with Barbie um, and getting to work on this, is that, again, over the years, she's this cultural sort of icon that people can project so much on. She's, she's, you know, she's a doll that people project so much about just this sort of society. And she hasn't had a chance to talk. And we know who Barbie is. We know what she stands for. We know what her principles are. You know, we know how much fun she is. So giving her a voice is, I think, one of the things that's most important for the brand, just so people can actually hear her and not just see her in a box. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know she was from Wisconsin. There's a lot of details in there. That <laughs> yeah, and she is. I she didn't is know. from Wisconsin. Uh, Willows, that's great. Well, I think, Wisconsin. So as the digital video distribution climate continues to change, I mean, how does Vlogger fit into your overall content strategy and potentially across other platforms? Yeah, I think, you know, we deliver content across a variety of platforms from long form to short form. And I think, you know, ultimately, 
this is something that's very unique. We feel it's very authentic to what YouTube is. And I, I would say, and Julia's heard me say this way too many times, um, but I, I harp it uh, constantly amongst all the marketing teams is it's really about the right content on the right platform, right? You know what I mean? So thinking about what's unique. And so for us, I think YouTube, you know, and, and the blogger um, in particular is so authentic to that channel that as much as, as we have control over it, it will remain, I think, ultimately a, a YouTube destination. And, and I think it, it balances out the portfolio of content that we do. I mean, we have made 33 girl empowering, you know, direct to consumer movies. You know, Barbie Life in the Dream House is sort of directed to a different audience, which is hugely successful. Vlogger is successful for a certain girl. And it's just we're creating a portfolio for, for everybody. And does that include sort of a transmedia approach? I mean, she's got like a huge app following as well, mm -hmm. right? So does that sort of tie in anywhere across the board? It does. Yeah. And we do have a story map, as uh, we do. Mm -hmm. You can talk mm -hmm. about it if you want. Or no, no, absolutely. Well, just, I was gonna say, but, our, but what's interesting about Barbie, unlike other transmedia properties, it's, it is not a story-driven property. It's a character-driven property. Um, and to, to Leanne's point, at the very core of the DNA, it's about an individual's uh, interpretation of Barbie. So it's about girls telling their own stories and having their own imaginations. So we have a story map so that it's all sort of balanced out, but we don't want to be imposing, want, you know, that, that's the challenge on the vlog. We're giving a personality, but we are not imposing, you know, a rigid story because we want to be encouraging people to tell their own stories. So our map is, is definitely there, but it's also important to us that it be very interactive and fluid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this was discussed a bit earlier too, but as we work across sort of all of our platforms, our social media platforms and sort of all of those um, channels, that we're also really thinking about assets very differently, right? We used to create a movie and then you would, you know, cut that up and you'd have EPK clips and you'd kind of hope you'd have enough to kind of feed the beast. Um, but now we're really thinking about how do you create the type of assets up front that really begin to speak to those particular platforms. And I, I think that's been a real learning for us and I've heard that repeated today. So I think we're on the right track. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, even pushing through content so quickly <laughs> internally, especially for sort of maybe something that could skew younger, seems like it could have some real challenges. Um, so I think that's, that's awesome. Um, so what's next? Can you give us any sort of input on, you know, is, will, will Skipper be making a cameo or Ken? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> Ken is definitely going to do, you know, do my makeup. There'll be that for sure. <laughs> Probably not until... Uh, we build that asset. Um, I think all the <laughs> sisters will um, will make an appearance. Chelsea is already kind of um, really interested in what uh, Barbie's doing, and she's a bit of a prankster in her personality, so she might be doing some things that are unexpected that even Barbie is not aware of on her vlog. Um, and we're doing a Draw My Life, which we're really, really excited about, um, so that we can all learn more about her childhood. Great, great. Well, I want to go ahead and uh, put it over to the audience. Are there any additional questions in the room? Right behind. Thanks, Jay. Uh, great panel. Um, that's awesome that, uh, that Barbie's on YouTube. A lot of uh, girls who are into Barbie are also on Snapchat and you know, Vine and Instagram and all those other platforms. Is Barbie also going to be communicating on those platforms too? And is it in her voice? You know, is she going to be responding as her voice? I think what's really you know unique about this brand in particular from some of the other brands that we're discussing today is in particular that we're you know we're speaking largely to a younger audience right and so I think with that comes a double-edged sword of we know they're there and in fact you know they're adapting these you know these um, technologies and these new platforms faster than we can even keep up right um, but at the same time I think for a lot of those platforms they do skew older and in many cases more towards parents or you know fans that for our brand may appreciate it for its you know fashion DNA we have a huge following on Instagram called Barbie style, which is purely a fashion-oriented play. So I think we we, pro, we have to think program programmatically about you know what those different um, you know channels represent and who our audience is there, and I think program appropriately. But um, I know Vine is launching Vine Kids, and so I think as they kind of go further, and I think we feel it's even a more appropriate platform um, in the same vein that YouTube now has launched YouTube Kids, and we're finding more safe ways to continue to deliver this content to children. We'll certainly embrace all of them. She'll she'll. Yeah. De if we do that, she'll definitely do vines. Aren't I creepy, by the way? I t the way I talk about her is if she's really real. <laughs> when you start working at Mattel, you start to at or Barbie. Oh, come on, there's going to be oh, other yeah. big Barbie Barbie's super gonna fans do that. out there. Yeah. <laughs> Barbie's going to do a vine. 
for sure. She's really into vines, but she's waiting to d be age appropriate. But she likes to create stories, so vine is a great place for her to be. Just picking up on that, how, with YouTube analytics being what they are, where you can really track 13 and up, how are you tracking sort of the demographics of who's watching this? I mean, there's a lot of subscribers, and I'm sure a lot of those people aren't necessarily, you know, um, over 13. How are you tracking that, and how is that, you know, helping your own understanding of the brand, and what limitations, and what do you hope to see with the, you know, things like the YouTube Kids app that, to help you really understand your audience better? No, absolutely. I think that's one of the challenges, and I think like many of the other panelists, we work really closely with Tubular um, and have really done some deep dives to really try to identify based on the content that's being consumed and kind of look at what those behaviors are and extrapolate out a lot of assumptions, which we have to do, right? We ha when we see that the majority of the subscribers that are watching our channel are women, you know, in the demographic that are very much our moms, we tend to have a, you know, a pretty good inclination, I think, in terms of ultimately who's consuming the content, but um, I think They've given us a lot of really good information that helps us as we think about programming. Uh, but it's you do have to make a certain amount of leap of faith in, in a platform like this where we don't have you know, the benefit of Nielsen ratings or something that would make these all so much easier. <laughs> but, but we are, I mean, just as a brand, we are trying to do some, also some of our own sort of testing to see if girls are fine, you know, shooting as content. Who are the girls? What are their ages? So that we have to make decisions on how entertaining it is for whom, you know? Um, but remember that Barbie's not just, I mean, she's not just for little girls, like everybody loves her of all ages. Anyone else? Oh, here. This is this piggybacking off of that a little bit, but specifically with the vlog, I mean, you can, you can see photos of commenters and things like that, and I don't know if you know all the ages, but for the vlog specifically, do you know basically what the demographic is and what is the interaction? What are they commenting about? What are they suggesting? I think, I think we can't, I guess, necessarily pinpoint, I think, the target audience. I think you can kind of get some intimations, I think, based on some of the comments and even some of the spelling. <laughs> can be an, you know, an intimation as to maybe um, what the target age is. But um, a lot of the ideas, actually, that Julia has, um, you know, was kind of you know, sneak peeking, I think, in terms of where we'll be going with the programming, um, a lot of those ideas, like Ken doing you know, Barbie's makeup, I mean, that comes purely from what kids are consuming and ultimately the feedback that they're giving us through comments and making suggestions. So as you guys watch the rest of the vlog, if you have any great suggestions, please join the commentary because I think that's really what's the beauty of this is, um, is that we have a creative vision for it, but we can be really adaptable in terms of taking consumers' feedback. So, And me as just a creative, obsessive producer looking at all the, the so this is not uh, based on any kind of um, research. It, it's interesting when the vlog first came out, I think that the people that were consuming it were older and they were really, and they were giving older, really interesting comments. Like it's very interesting that she's this when the brand is doing that. And, you know, so it was like, wow, very sort of intellectual. And as it's been out longer, now it's lots of like, I love you, kitty cat, kitty cat, kitty cat. Kitty. <laughs> um, so it's get it to me that says younger. But the, mm -hmm. even the I love you, like it's like I love your hair. Let me see your room. Let me. I want to see what's in your bag. I, you know, I mean, it's I, it's just so wonderful because it's just so sincere. All right, Bill Buckley. This is completely self-serving, if anybody knows me. I have three daughters, uh, 11, 10, 8. Two are Barbie girls, one is a skateboarder. They didn't bring any Barbies with them today. Uh, no. but, right. but we can hook you up. No, we can I'm hook done. you up. <laughs> Just give us your card. Okay. Uh, but but what I, what I, for the audience, and to pick back that last question, Barbie's dream house. I mean, I have sat through more. She's locked in the closet, like, what's going on? Yeah. Um, so truthfully, I was thrilled to see the vlog, but my, my two children didn't know about it. Do you know what I mean? So I think to echo your point is, like, I stumbled across it, I think, in ad week, and then actually sent it home for them to see, and now they're getting into it. So I guess my question to you would be, it's great that I think it's being um, sort of curated by parents or their siblings that are getting them started, but from a, like a multi-platform perspective, do you see on Barbie's dream house, there's gonna be a break for, for a blog from Barbie, or like how do you think you'll integrate it so we can get maybe quicker adoption by the younger set? Yeah, I mean, we have a huge fan base for our web series, Barbie Life in the Dream totally. House, huge. Um, yes, it was a yes. really fun project to work on. So um, 
I think that there's a lot of passion behind that that we know is translating to a lot of the engagement that we get on the channel. So I think there's a natural migration as we begin to introduce some of these. I think typically when we have sort of what we might um, refer to as sort of the, the more hero content um, amongst, you know, kind of what we're putting on our channel. I think we're using some of that also as opportunities to even advertise and kind of drive more viewership. Um, I think this is, she's posted her third vlog like last week. So um, this is early for us. And I think we also wanted to put this out there and, um, and kind of really engage with the audience. And, and I think we'll continue to lean more into that. And I think that will allow us to give more kind of marketing visibility to it being there as well as, you know, as well as the, you know, the organic nature of kind of having, you know, consumers, um, you know, come in. But I think, you know, Barbie Life and the Dream House vlogger, we have a lot of other content, um, you know, both on the channel today and that we're developing because um, we're really seeing this, this, you know, this, this platform for us as a channel and how we really need to program it, right? And along the lines of Google's best practice of hero hub hygiene and the three H's, I mean, we're really thinking about, you know, how do we start to program? And within that, it allows us more of those cross-programming opportunities that I think will, will drive even further engagement. In truth, I think that's great because from like the Dreamhouse perspective, it's just not as real. But I think the vlogger, to your point, gives the opportunity, especially from a parental perspective, to drop in some of those nuggets, which I think we appreciate our children seeing authentically in that channel. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. I think I was getting the wrap-up symbol, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, any last questions? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Heather. Great job, guys. Um, surprised JC hasn't tried to get Barbie to do a new form digital series yet, because the stats are probably insane on Tubular. And uh, Bill, good luck with those three girls, dude. Not going to survive. Uh, all right. We've got one session left. And then we've got fabulous cocktails with uh, an incredible DJ from the Playboy Mansion. Let's see what he plays. The uh, Steven, are we ready? Are we? We got whoop whoop. Okay. All right. Let's keep moving on here, guys. Uh, let's bring it home with some these influencers we all keep talking about. I guess we're going to meet some of them in real, real time. So Stephen, who uh, joined, uh, Stephen Lai, who joined Eisenberg as our head of talent management uh, for ION, the Influencer Orchestration Network. Uh, and he previously was at Machinima for many years, so very talented and very knowledgeable and, and, and glad to be working with him side by side every day. More importantly, I think he's assembled on stage here today, uh, a circus of fun is what I'm going to describe it. But uh, or over 20 million footprints of subscribers here divided over uh, a network here of influencers. So why don't you guys come on down? I know uh, I won't do you justice in narrating each of you, but Mike uh, Simmons, Bart Baker, Matthew Patrick, film theorist, Tom Cassell, Oga K. And I know you all got crazy handles and some crazy fun, so I'm going to let uh, Steven and team drive it from here. And Hi, guys, everybody. Whoa, energy. this is on. Thanks, Woo. Hello. We have Hello. Yay. Hello. Woohoo. Yay. Everybody, so wake away. up. Chewy Martinez. <laughs> hey, guys. Welcome. Uh, I'll give quick intros, everybody, on the panels up here, or if you guys want to give your own intro. Yeah. Um, Tom, you want to go first? Yeah, my name's Tom Cassell. Um, five years ago, I decided to start making videos, put it on YouTube, playing video games. Um, now, where it stands, I'm on like 9.1 million subscribers, 1.7 billion YouTube views, and on Twitch, 2 million followers on there, just playing video games. Some people like to watch it, and that's pretty much what I do. The first person to 2 million, actually. Woo! Yeah, first person to credit, Tom. Yeah, first person to hit a million followers on there, and then exactly a year later, um, three days ago, hit 2 million, so pretty good. Uh, uh, nice, yeah. Whoop. I'm Bart Baker. Uh, I am, I guess it's kind of the same kind of story. I started shooting stuff in my backyard and eight, five years ago, and uh, now I do music video parodies. That's my thing. Uh, they crush, uh, you know, <laughs> between like 10 and 90 million views each. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's awesome. It's, it's so much fun. I, I, it's the best job I could ask for, so I'm, I'm super excited to be doing it, and I'm happy to be here. Bart totally pays for all of his views, so that's They're awesome. all fake. <laughs> Ouch. Kidding, I'm kidding. No, it's all real. Um, my name is Olga K. Woo! Whoa. Yeah. Woo! It's okay, we'll get there. Um, my, name, 
My name is Olga Kay. I started on YouTube when it started back in 2006. Uh, my channel has a variety of content, sketch comedy, video games, uh, fashion and beauty lifestyle, and I also run my own brand, Mooshwalks Socks, that I'm not wearing today. Uh, so I'm on both sides of it as a creator that works with brands and as a brand that actually developing my own brand through influencers and um, other people online. Hey, I'm uh, Matthew Patrick. Uh, people online know me as Matt Pat the game theorist slash film theorist. Basically our channels are the myth busters for video games, film, and TV. So basically you take the nerdiness of an educational channel, fuse it together with the nerdiness of a gaming slash film channel, that is, that is what we do. That Mario can be diagnosed as a sociopath based on the DSM-5, <laughs> and that uh, in uh, the uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, Christian Grey basically follows the same steps that cults use to uh, indoctrinate Anastasia Steele. So that's the type of stuff that we cover. Uh, we're currently sitting at 5 million subscribers on The Game Theorists, averaging about 2 million views a video. Um, on The Film Theorists, we got a million subscribers in a month. We're currently at 1.2. We launched that about a month and a half ago, two months ago at this point. And uh, in addition to that, I also run a digital media consultancy. I have a background in neuroscience and, and data sciences. Uh, so you know, helping to consult brands with how to navigate the space. Uh, and we've consulted with a hundred of the top YouTube brands as well as uh, top video game developers, publishers, and even YouTube themselves, which was kind of a trippy experience. So that's me. Hey everybody, uh, Mike Simons. Uh, I'm creative director of Rocket Jump. And Rocket Jump uh, is a company that first came out on YouTube. It's Freddie Wong, and it's bun made a bunch of action comedy shorts and things like that. Got to 8 million subscribers. We made the first fully independent TV show in video game high school, where we basically controlled everything out of ourselves and working a little bit with our MCN partner. And uh, now, you know, we've got first look deal with Lionsgate, making a lot of bigger, better stuff, TVs, movies, trying to do everything while simultaneously still running the channel and doing everything like that. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Intro. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this panel is, is really great just because we have a very wide, diverse sort of, you know, skill set and audience and in terms of the content that they produce. Um, and it's great for a panel for today as, you know, a lot of the common thread that we've had is really around storytelling, right, in video. And each of these guys have, like, a different aspect and angle that they take towards storytelling. Um, so, you know, I thought it would be great. Um, we, we brought Morgan Neville up here earlier. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, but Morgan, you know, is a storyteller by nature, right? He, talk, he gave us an anecdote about how he goes through the New York Times and can just pieces and looks at each story and tries to pull, like, the narrative and find his own angle and take on it. So, you know, I wanted to throw the question back out to you guys, like, kind of what is your creative process and how do you find the angles that you find? Because, you know, you guys are all have different approaches and while you guys cover some, some semi-similar things at times, like you guys ha take it from a completely different angle. So, you know, I love to kind of dive into that process. And we can start at the end. Uh, you want to okay. get in there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess to sort of get into it, we're in a very interesting place uh, because we are coming out of this new media model of YouTube and things like that. And yet at the same time, we do TV content and we do very, very like VFX heavy oriented uh, content. And the problem with that is that stuff costs a lot of money. And it's been very interesting sort of finding a way to do that and balance the cost of what we do with the space. And so it's really, really, <laughs> it's really, really interesting uh, for us to sort of meet that challenge. And a lot of that has involved been, you know, working with brands and doing these kinds of things. But uh, the really interesting challenge is how do you do all that and tell stories? Because that's really what we want to do. We're a group of filmmakers, we're a group of creative mind people, and you know, most people, when they get into the space, they go off to Hollywood, they try to make a short film, they go to film festivals, they do all those things. We bypassed all of that. And it was because we were part of this generation that came along about you know, four or five years ago that allowed us to be just making a movie and putting it up every single week. It, you know, sure, it was two to five minutes long, but to us it was a movie. And uh, so it's really, really interesting to, you know, go into this new space, try to become what I guess you could call, you know, pe people don't even really know what to call it right now. Are we a digital studio? Are we this? Are we that? But, you know, the goals have always been the same, which is how do you tell really great stories? How do you keep it in, in touch with your audience? And, you know, even now we're, we're doing a big Hulu show. And it's really interesting taking our creative process and trying to put it in the space of 
a traditional TV show, and it's like, how do we blend and show what we are? And it's a little bit of behind the scenes, it's a little bit of how we make shorts, it's a little bit of, of sort of selling you know, your own way of making storytelling, and that's what we've always liked to do, is transparency, putting it forward, showing people the process, demystifying the process, it's why Rocket Jump even has a film school, and uh, it, it's what we like to do, is we take everything we do and we put it on display, and we, we just, you know, there's no mystery about it. I, th I think for us, so, you know, with the theorist channels and, and game theory and film theory in particular, it's a lot, of, our creative process basically revolves around finding those, those little details uh, that, you know, the, the developers, the publishers, the people who are working on these movies, these video games, you know, there's a lot of research and effort that goes into every detail in a, in a lot of these games, these movies, things like that. And so what our creative process is based around is finding those little nuggets of research or those little creative ideas that get implanted in there and might have gotten overlooked or you know really bringing those drawing those out to the forefront and and celebrating those um or looking at a story and and twisting it around and saying well what if this and then we'll go through the evidence and and kind of like all the different details in the movies and and films and whatever and, and draw those little piece of e pieces of evidence out to tell a different or, or more interesting, not more interesting, but a different way to look at the story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what if Mario was evil? Well, what evidence can you draw from that? What if Christian Grey isn't this romantic guy, but instead like a sociopath, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> and, and surprisingly, you can create these compelling meta stories from the established lore of those franchises. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, the thing that is so exciting about that is we're suddenly able to take those IP that have existed for you know decades, a lot of them, and make the audience appreciate them or look at them in a new way. So you know you've played Mario for decades, but now all of a sudden you have a different lens to look at this at this you know these games and appreciate them in a, in a new fun way and see like oh yeah he is punching Yoshi that is him being evil or like oh yeah Christian Grey did do this and that made him an evil guy. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's all about what is the value proposition for the fan? You know, what are they, and, and whether or not they've engaged with that IP in the past, you know, what are they learning from watching this video? You know, uh, we have one hopefully coming up uh, tomorrow that's all about kind of the upcoming movie Hitman. And it's all about the underskin armor that one of the characters wears. Well, we teach you all about the science of can that really exist in real life? What scientific technology exists? So now I, I'm appreciating it for the discussion of the movie, the critical analysis of the movie, but then also the scientific, uh, the scientific ideas that exist in that film. You know, and, and I'm learning more about the world around me from watching that. And I think at the end of the day, all of us, what we're doing is delivering something beyond what already exists with those existing IPs, right? It's a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we only have 15 minutes and 48 seconds, so. <laughs> I'll be real fast. Um, uh, the creative process is very simple. I know my audience really well. Um, I would only work with brands that um, I can already connect to. So then the creative proce process becomes very simple. You already know how to deliver a message to your audience. Uh, you already know what the st brand stands for and it just becomes this synergy um, easier to deliver to your audience and, and actually creates a better response. That was very quick. Hey. Um, so, we have 15 minutes and 17 seconds now. Go. Yeah, there's only 30 seconds. So. <laughs> um, so for a parody, it's like the process is two weeks. We will find what the hottest music video that is right, like currently what the hottest one is. We will watch it millions of times uh, in a writer's meeting. And then we have to pick apart as much as we can and find anything that we can to kind of comment on or make fun of about the video that... that uh, that we think the audience would find humorous. Um, and a lot of our ideas actually come from going to the original video and reading the comments because all the comments are angry people saying like <laughs> why they don't like it. <laughs> so so we can build we can build a storyline literally using uh, the audience's comments. So when people watch it, they feel like they kind of came up with part of the, the idea because they're all thinking it. Um, so yeah, we do a writer's meeting. Um, it takes like three days to figure out the script. We shoot for a day, maybe two days. If it's a big shoot, we'll do three days. And then it's like five days of post, and then it goes on YouTube, and then we do it all over again. So it's nonstop. Yeah, yep. absolutely. I can keep mine pretty quick. Well, I woke up at 7 o'clock 
No, I went to bed at seven o'clock this morning because I was working all night. And when these guys put in like so much time and effort into what they do, I don't want to sell myself too short. But I play video games, so like, <laughs> like yeah, like this guy does all this research. The game theorists do all this research, and I just kind of like sit down in my chair, play video games. Yeah, you know that's kind of that's kind of it. But it's like the the view, like you know, t for example, if you look at like the biggest channel on YouTube is is PewDiePie. You know, like gaming is like one of the biggest verticals, if not in my opinion, going to go to the top vertical and take over music because it's so huge and the industry is just continuing to grow. Um, so for someone like me, I just wake up, you know, do my day to day routine, breakfast, same from a computer, play some video games, record it, render it, upload it, and then millions of people watch it. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a bad lifetime. No, no. Um, so, you know, it seemed like the common thread that you guys all kind of talked about was your audience, right? And I yep. think I, w I was looking at the numbers last night and I was cranking it together. Um, I think the social reach on the stage is about 40 million. So that's nice. across all of your different platforms. Technically, four, 40 million, 355, 355 being mine, <laughs> um, 40 million from you guys. Um, so, you know, and, and those, those are across a lot of different platforms, right? Um, and, you know, you guys are all on a lot of different things. Um, so, you know, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the approach that you guys are taking. Like, how are you approaching, you know, Tom, you're on YouTube, you're on Twitch, and clearly you're very successful on Twitch, right? So, like, how do you approach that differently? And I know, you know, we just talked outside a little bit about Snapchat, a little bit about Vine. So, you know, how do you approach those different mediums? How do you approach those different platforms? And do you find that your audience is receptive to come over with you? Or, like, how does that sort of go with you? Well, I decided to take like a big a big step like two years ago um, with Twitch because YouTube has built-in live stream, but there's also a successful platform called Twitch set up. So I decided to go ahead and give that a go and set myself the goal of trying to push a million of my followers over from YouTube over to a base on Twitch, which, you know, trying to get a million unique people to sign up to something is a pretty like daunting mm -hmm. task, but I smashed it within about four or five weeks, something like that. We pushed over 330,000 people just to go and sign up to a website to, again, watch me play video games, which was super successful. And it just grew and grew and grew like that. And before you knew it, um, I kind of took the method of breaching um, like what is against YouTubers sort of practice of being like, I'm going to copy something from TV. And when I copied something from TV, it was like, at this set time, every single day for two hours, I'm going to live stream. Like, as a YouTuber, you can just put up a video and hope people see it, or you can keep it on a schedule. But for my live streaming, every day I decided I'm going to do it every single day and just stick to the schedule. And every day I saw my fan base grow, the viewership grow, and to one point I hit 121,000 people concurrent just watching me play Minecraft. Like, it was, <laughs> it was ridiculous. Like I set like, records and stuff like that, and I had an absolute blast with it. And I never thought it was going to get that big. And if I continue on doing what I'm doing, I hope to one day to be able to just randomly, you know, get up, have breakfast, turn on my computer and stream to 250 to 500,000 people. Like, having that sort of influence is absolutely incredible. Like, I can get anything trending worldwide within 10, 15 minutes, like, just with my audience on Twitter and just, like, make amazing things happen, raising money for charity, that sort of stuff. So, like, with great power comes great responsibility, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Bart, did you want to talk about any of the other platforms you're kind of interested um, in? Right now, my two biggest that I'm starting to use are Snapchat and yeah. Vine. I, I do Vine because I am friends with all the big Viners, so they're in all my videos, so it's like, why am I not doing these Vine videos? So I just started like a month ago posting regularly, um, and it works really. I mean, I've, you know, I've gone up like 120K in like three and a half, four weeks because I'm working with all these big people. Um, there's no point in not being on that platform. Um, Snapchat is just it's a awesome. beast. Like, <laughs> I think I, I'm doing like between 1.5 and 3 million opens a day on oh, Snapchat. Wow. Um, <laughs> which is like, why? I don't know. People like to open these Snapchats. But they're so, they literally are the most uh, engaged audience, Snapchat. Right when you put up a snap, every single person, like, they're just constantly on that platform. It's thousands, thousands of views yeah. in seconds. It's, like, it's insane. You know, 10 seconds late, like 25,000 views. It's like, yeah. wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, those are the two biggest that I'm focusing on, um, you know, uh, in, sure. uh, off of YouTube right now. Yeah, so uh, whether you're a creator or a brand, you have to be on top of all the social media networks that are coming out. Uh, so my recent one that I got into is Snapchat. Vine is the only thing that I skipped, but Snapchat and Periscope. So there's a... Um, 
really big thing happened for me for Periscope. Periscope is a live streaming platform, and I've noticed that it, um, that's the first social media platform that is used by brands before influencers, which I thought it was really interesting. And um, being on the platform uh, for maybe a month, I got my first brand deal with Nestle. And when I talked to Nestle about why they chose Periscope and what other platforms they were working with, they said, we only want to do Periscope. We want to be the only brand that only does Periscope and we don't do anything else. And I thought it was really interesting. It's a shift. So if you're a brand or a creator, you have to always be on different platforms because you never know what's going to take off. And uh, last night, as, um, I signed up for CyberDust. Anyone? Yeah. Mark Cuban. Yeah, Mark Cuban. He, he Cyber just Dust? followed me on Twitter yesterday. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> should probably get to app. Guys. Guy's got three billion dollars in the bank and just randomly followed me. Okay. Yeah, woo! Uh, so that platform is very different, and I feel like that platform is created for businesses more so than creators, and it's a very one-on-one -on -one engagement. So I actually talk to my customers on there that buy my product, and I get to blast news into their faces, and then it disappears. And there's no um, social media aspect where it's like, oh, how many followers do they have? Oh, how many uh, people like s uh, screenshotted it? It's very private, but it's very connected. And there's something psychological happens to people when they touch the phone and hold the button. That's why I think Snapchat is really important and really big right now. Uh, because when you press your button, and you hold it there, you really pay attention to what's happening. You so don't have to hold it anymore, you just tap it now. Damn it, that's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so YouTube videos, I usually watch them in the background. If something catches my attention, I go and I watch them again. Uh, but for Snapchat, I have to be there. I can't just step away, and that, uh, that's why the Snapchat is really successful. You know, and I, I think that points to a, a really interesting challenge with the space right now, which is it is more confusing than ever to be in the digital media landscape. You, like Olga said, you don't know what is going to take off. But also, from a metrics perspective, you don't know what you should be measuring, right? Um, you know, a view doesn't equal a view on every single platform. You know, uh, like everyone's saying, Snapchat, if you're holding down the button, that's a pretty darn engaged view. Whether or not you have to hold it down now, you know, that changes things. But say you're holding down the button, that's an engaged view. On Facebook, you know, they're touting the billions of views that they're getting on Facebook every day. But those views are being accumulated as you auto-scroll through, uh, through the feed on your home page. And all of a sudden, each time you auto-scroll and it plays for a second, that there is a view. On YouTube, if you click the button, then that counts as a view. And autoplay views have a certain view uh, second threshold that you have to cross in order for it to count as a view. So even across platforms, the metrics and the words used to describe those metrics, they may be the same, but they mean completely different things, which is a, a big challenge for brands trying to enter or figure out what is the right place for me in this space. Um, I would actually argue against Olga on, on the fact that brands should be everywhere. I, I don't think you should be. Um, you know, from what I've seen, different brands and, and different influencers work in different mediums. You know, uh, Vine, if you're, if you're s short and snappy and you're able to deliver a funny, catchy message in six seconds, great, that's for you. If you're a video game company, you had better be on YouTube because that's where everyone is, with Twitter probably as your secondary location and maybe a, a third place. But, you know, I recognize and I think a, a lot, you know, it's, to be a company today, you don't have the pipelines and revenue sources and ability to open up all these, okay, now we need to be on Periscope and Vine and Twitch and Ocho, which is eight seconds, not six seconds. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's true. Someone pitched me on the Ocho. It's the new thing. And it's like, is it? Uh, yeah, but, but it is. Everyone, everyone's like, oh, we can be the next big thing. We can be the next big thing. And, it, and it's hard. And, and so speaking from, from the theorist perspective and, and kind of the channels that we run, we are primarily on YouTube with a secondary light focus on, on Twitter. And that's really about it. We're looking at different avenues now just because we've reached that scale. But we've been really focusing on developing a strong audience on this one platform because we specialize in longer form content that viewers on YouTube are interested in. And that's where we're able to deliver the strongest message. You know, should Rocket Jump be on, on Vine? Maybe there's some level of value you can provide there. But for your bread and butter content, I think that you know YouTube or Vimeo or whatever, like that makes the most sense. Yeah. And so I think as you're looking towards what platform your brand should be on, 
you should look at what is the value proposition that our brand can deliver our potential audience off of this platform, and does it make sense? Um, that, I think, is the fundamental distinction of whether or not you should pursue growing in that direction. And to add to that, so I'm going to speak against you just for a second. <laughs> Uh, I think you're right, um, but as a brand, um, just open an account just in case, because you never know when you want to go back to a certain platform and really develop <laughs> it. Um, so get the screen name before somebody okay. else does. That's the only thing I'll say. Oh, absolutely. Cla yeah. Claim, claim yeah. the space. Claim absolutely. the space, but you don't have to really concentrate unless it really brings value. Yeah. And, and to go exactly off what you were saying, it's like <laughs> even within YouTube, it's like, so we have the main channel, again, it's 8 million, it's the most views you can get if you go with us, but at the same time, we have something like the film channel, uh, the, film, the film school, which is more specialized. However, the people who are watching film school, they're heavy users, and they're people who are interested in buying screenwriting software, and so we get great po you know, partnerships and sponsors that go with that, because it's a specialized audience that is more willing to absolutely buy and engage with what we're doing, and so it's, it's even within that same mm -hmm. exact ecosystem. And you know, you're, you're right also, we're talking about, oh, what Rocket Jump does is more long form. However, you know, when we think about Vine, we think on a creative level, oh, this is a three panel comic. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like tell this little ABC story and do it like that. So it's, yeah, we, I, it's going exactly off what you said. I completely agree. So. Can I just say that there is way too many social media platforms out there. Like you have to have a Twitter, a Snapchat, an Instagram, a Facebook, all this. Yeah. It just kind of gets a bit too much to handle. So that's why, like, for me, if I'm on a certain social media platform, I'll decide which is the most important for me, which is the most valuable, and then the others I'll just kind of like leave to one side and just kind of like yeah, no, that, that away. makes 100 percent sense. Um, so you know, kind of what I heard there a lot was was you know engagement, right, in terms mm -hmm. of how you're interacting with your audience and how they're interacting with you within these various platforms. Um, and we've talked a lot about engagement today and you know, there's a lot of ways to quantify that, whether it's likes, shares, comments, and retweets. But you know, I think for you guys in particular, engagement means something else, right? Like I would assume yeah. that that means something entirely different and it's not just, you know, just the numbers or like how many likes. Like, you know, I imagine, Tom, you're not looking at the number of likes you get on a video so much, no. but you're looking at you know, what is your relationship with your audience, right? Um, and I wanted to like bring that to light here. So, you know, is there any sort of story that you guys kind of have? Like, what is what is your relationship with your audience, and how do you sort of? Mine's very, it? mine's very personal because when I started doing this, I was uh, I was 17 years old, living at home with my dad, um, and my dad was like, "Why are you playing video games all the time?" You know, I managed to turn that into a job. But they saw me go from being 17 years old, um, growing up whilst they were at college or school or anything like that, like that as well. And they saw me grow up, develop as a person. I'm now 22 years old through YouTube. I've managed to start my own clothing line. I own a games company with 3BD um, and like build my own house out of it. So it's like I've actually done the whole progression of my life within the past like five years and my audience has shared pretty much every single moment of that with me. Like a, my, a family member passed away and I you know, disappeared off the internet for like three weeks and then when I returned, like the love and support from my audience was absolutely incredible. So it's like you have a genuine connection of feeling like you have something in common with your audience basically. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Bart, you have any? sort of personal anecdotes? Um, I think my channel is a little bit different, obviously. Like, yep. it's their music video parodies. So we used to do it in a way where I never addressed the audience. And that's back when I had like 100,000 subscribers. Um, so a while ago. But when I started doing end slates where I would actually be like, uh, yo, guys, thanks for watching, blah, blah, blah. Like, this is where you can check out more. Or, you know, you can get this song on iTunes, blah, and stuff like that, where they can actually see my personality. That's when all of a sudden we went from like, I went from 100,000 to like a million in, in a matter of months. Um, just because people felt like they could connect with the actual person behind the channel, which is a huge thing on YouTube. Uh, and that's also like, uh, goes like, Snapchat, for example, is so personal as well. So that's like, that's why I think it's important for creators who don't have as much of a like outlet to show their actual personality to use other platforms like Snapchat uh, to, to let people know what you're actually like as a person and not when you're dressed up as Miley Cyrus or something. <laughs> so. Uh, we have five seconds. Can I speak? We have five seconds? Yeah. Three, two, one. I, uh, time's up. Let's, what are we going to do? We can rush <laughs> through it. I think the people are OK. Time's up. Oh my god, it tells you that time's up. Um, Oh my it gosh, it's like, red. stop talking. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to dive into a little bit of your relationship yeah, with your so, audience. Yeah, all of that. Um, I think it's the same for all of us. Um, the only thing I would say when I, 
you know, there's lots of companies and there's um, uh, lots of brands that come in and they start a YouTube channel and they do take the idea of traditional marketing and they bring it into YouTube, but it doesn't work. And it, uh, it's the same as there's no connection to the audience because the audience on YouTube and any other social media platform, they're so used to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation. So um, uh, <laughs> if you're a brand, uh, just bring in personalities to introduce, to connect your brand to your social media platforms because that's going to be a lot faster uh, uh, transaction. Yeah, 100 hundred percent with that. It, you know, uh, I I agree. Yes. yes. No, it, it, it's true though. It's it's a it's a mistake that we see brands make a lot of times in this space. Is like, wow, hey, Miss Glamorazzi or Michelle Fan or whoever has this amazing you know, audience, this beauty channel that's making millions of dollars and able to do all this stuff. She has this audience who's eager for everything that she's doing. How can I do that? And so they'll, you know, create the really highly polished sets and, you know, cast the right person who's, you know, feels down home but is still, like, beautiful and, you know, all this stuff that they think makes a really strong beauty channel. And those always fail to get viewers, subscribers, et cetera. And it's because it's lacking that, that authentic or organic connection with the audience, like Olga was saying. You know, it, there, is, there is a passion to it, right? And, and people a lot of times will see PewDiePie, and they're like, why is this guy the number one you know, channel on YouTube? Why, his, his content is garbage. I don't get this. This isn't funny to me. And it's, well, it, it's not supposed to be funny to you. Like, he has, an, he has an engagement with his audience and a language with his audience that, you know, isn't for outsiders, isn't for people who are over a certain age. You know, and it's because he's been able to establish that authentic community around what he's doing that he's been able to become so popular. Yeah. And so there's a lot of questions and a lot of misunderstanding about YouTube and digital talent in general that, like, are they professionals or are they amateurs? And it's like, well, no, PewDiePie's videos may look amateur, but he is a professional at what he does. And, and you know, to you, they may look amateur, but they are super highly polished and, and like the perfection of what digital media stands for and what, what works on this platform and what works specifically for his audience. And so I think overcoming that hurdle and understanding that, you know, the most polished visuals and the highest quality productions may not always result in the highest number of views. That is, that is a, a key hurdle that I think brands need to kind of overcome when, when entering and looking to succeed in the digital space. Yeah, and um, so I come from a traditional media before I started my YouTube channel, I'll build a brand on there. Um, I've, uh, there's a lot of advertising money that goes into marketing on TV. Now, the people that are really paying attention to brands right now are not really, like my audience five years ago, I went to VidCon, which is a, a, the biggest conference for um, um, YouTube personalities. And I asked in the panel of 700 people, I asked, what is the favorite TV show that you guys watch? And nobody raised their hands and they said, well, we don't have TV, we don't do that. So it made me realize that the future generation will be only paying attention to people like PewDiePie and they will grow with him and then over time it's going to become more quality but they're going to be really paying attention to those people mm -hmm. and for the lack of a better word and I hate saying this but when older generation dies off <laughs> <laughs> you're done you're done for this is what Whoa. we think of you I'm people sorry, I hate saying oh, that but it's very true <laughs> I, <laughs> then who are you concentrating <laughs> on <laughs> Yo, basically what you're saying is stop stop putting any money on TV and just give it all the digital, right? Yes. Oh, do both. Really figure out how to do both. Uh, coming from traditional media, I really concentrate on both. I'm not saying, fuck you, traditional media. I'm just going to concentrate on my own brand in digital. I do both. And uh, so slowly but surely, it's all merging together. And <laughs> this is recorded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so next time I'll just play this video. Um, so yeah, viral, it's, it's very important to do both because eventually it's all going to uh, merge together or the millennial is actually going to be dominating and it's good that one foot is there for all the brands that are out there right yeah. now. And, uh, no, and I'll just say is, and it, even with this sort of generational message, it's, is the intent of it always remains the same. And that's the thing that we always try to hold on to. When I was a kid, I saw Jaws, and I'm like, I'm going to make things like that for the rest of my life. That's what I'm going to do. And just because we're in this new space, and just because we're, we're you know, coming out on YouTube and we're getting a chance to do this, 
that's where it came from from us. And it all comes from the same place. And we want to do the same thing. And when we go into these relationships and we start working with brands and we're, we have that same sort of passion that is just like everything that came out of traditional media. And we, we set rules for ourselves and we try to really appreciate it. And then like, mm -hmm. you know, we always talk about our internal mantra when it comes to working with advertisers or everything that we're doing is we have it, and especially with regards to our audiences, we say, don't piss people off. And we don't want to piss off the sponsor. We don't want to piss off everybody internally. We want everybody to be happy. And most importantly, we want our audience to be happy. And we go into it and we communicate everything that we want to do. We let them know what our audience is interested in. And we try to communicate exactly what we're going to be doing, what our tone is. And if we get everybody on the same page, everybody walks away and feels like they win. And that's the most important thing that we try to hold on to. Because, you know, it can go wrong sometimes. Things can, you know, if somebody has an idea of what your video is going to be like, you send them the script, they go through their process, but then at the end they see the video and they're like, oh, we were expecting something more like a commercial. When in the end, like, you know, a, 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 an audience doesn't mind being sponsored to sometimes, but they definitely respond to being marketed at. And if you can get everybody on the same page, and understand that, hey, I got this cool thing. I got to watch a new Rocket Jump video. And oh, hey, you know, this company was a part of it. And that works out. And you know, that's really what we strive for at the end of the day. It's, in, in my eyes, it's got it's to be natural. And I just bring it back to um, one of brand, brand integrations that I did about two years ago. Um, a company, Satch and Satch, came to me with a brand, Matson's, and they said, like, hey, this is what we want to promote. It's a food product, like a snack. It was like a little chicken chunk thing that you could eat. Actually, really tasty. Uh, and they came <laughs> to me and was like, we want to do this natural brand integration. I was like, go for it. Like, this is what I want to do. You know, make it feel natural. Let me be involved in the creative process. I don't want you to come at me and say, this is what you have to do. This is what we need. This is what we want, sort of thing. We were in it together. And it was one of the best brand integrations I've ever done. My audience absolutely loved it. And together with Saatchi and Saatchi, we actually won a, I don't know if it's an American thing, if you know of it, but like a, a Cannes Lion. We actually won one of them in uh, advertising and marketing. So it was like, a, I didn't know. I got a phone call like, hmm. we won one of these. I was like, Cool. That's that's great. <laughs> and obviously now like when I'm in meetings and management team like speak to companies like, oh yeah, he's won one of these before in marketing. I was just like I had no idea how big of an impact that was and to be able to say I was involved in that campaign was absolutely incredible. And it was all down to I think we can all agree having a natural integration with a company and yeah. them coming to us and working with us, not just coming to us telling us what to do. Because right, this right. space works differently from T V, it works differently from everything. We like people here made it is what it is today. So, you know, we've got to be natural with our audience and just yeah. continue that way. We actually, I actually launched a app with a few people last month called Challenged. And it is, in my opinion, the best way for brands to integrate without feeling like it's sponsored at all. So the, the, app, the app itself, we got a million users within two weeks. Um, but you can create challenges, and it's aggregated like platform just to create challenges. So all your audience can respond to you directly uh, doing the challenge. Uh, the way it works with brands uh, so naturally is literally I could do, OK, guys, what's up? Uh, I'm doing a lip sync challenge right now. Show me your best lip sync. Whoever wins is going to get Bose headphones. There you go. All of a sudden, 20 million people are watching that and seeing Bose, and everyone wants Bose headphones. So it feels natural even though it, it's, a, it's a product placement in a way, but people want to win that product, mm -hmm. so they're not like saying, oh, you're a sellout, because it's a brand new platform, so you can't, that's like kind of sure. how it's structured. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's the key, right? And you, you hit it, and, and Tom, you hit it, it's just like, you want to make it feel natural, you want to make it feel authentic to what you guys are doing, and there's a very certain tone that you guys have with your audience, and, um, and, and that's key, right? And that's why we want to work with you guys to, for your guys' expertise. Um, as Olga has reminded us, we are out of time. <laughs> yeah, like so unfortunately, time if you guys want to have questions, uh, these guys will stick around a little bit. As you can tell, they're super bright and super brilliant. So you know, feel free to ask them a couple questions. Um, otherwise, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank thanks for having you. us. Thank you. All right, guys, sit tight just for two minutes. You guys rocked it, by the way. Thank you. Thanks. You guys can stay there if you just want to hang. That's right. We'll bring you stuff. Tom, we're going to Vegas, dude. You're raining money. I want to hang with you. Dude, anything you're doing, and uh, we're doing cocktails, and Olga, I think, spiked it with anyone over the age of 30, so we all can die off. <laughs> thank you on that, Olga. Love it. So do deals now before they go, but thank you, guys. You did an excellent job, and, and make yourselves available. Hang out, guys. I think people want to talk to you, so if you guys can hang out for a little bit and do cocktails uh, outside, that'd be awesome. All right, let's wrap here, guys. Uh, for a 
big note. I'm always impressed. Always impressed by the influencers and how business uh, like they are. You have a head on your shoulders. You understand the brand and the direction um, they're heading in. So bravo to that. I think people don't look beyond uh, the talent of just what you're producing on screen there. It's been a long day. So I want to give a round of applause to you guys for hanging in there the entire time. Thank you. Um, I also would like to acknowledge a few people because this isn't what we do, right? This type of thing, we're trying to make ourselves all better, as I mentioned in the beginning. So I really want to thank, first and foremost, Eric Eisenberg, who's creating the platform for this to happen, as well as Jay and Lowe on the team at A-List, and Bill and the Titleist efforts. So thank you guys for putting this together. Hopefully those that tune in enjoy themselves. Um, last note, so we're doing cocktails now by Curse. Thank you, Curse, for helping us do a little cocktail action. We've got some nice collector edition shirts outside. So if you guys are... Uh, uh, find your size and uh, get a shirt before you leave. Also, the raffle, take advantage because I guess there's some cool goodies on that one. And uh, if there's nothing else, let's go have a drink and have some fun. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.